Um, committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on oversight of the FBI. The chair now uh, recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gooden, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Chair now recognizes himself for an opening statement. Eight days ago, eight days ago on July 4th in the Western District of Louisiana, the court found that the federal government suppressed Americans' First Amendment free speech rights. In his conclusion on page 154, the court said this, the judge said this, plaintiffs are likely to succeed on the merits in establishing that the government has used its power to silence the opposition. Opposition to COVID-19 vaccines, opposition to COVID-19 mask and lockdowns, opposition to the lab leak theory of COVID-19, opposition to the validity of the 2020 election, opposition to President Biden's policies, statements that the Hunter Biden laptop was true, and opposition to policies of the government officials in power. All were suppressed. It is quite telling that each example or category of suppressed speech was conservative in nature, the court further writes, the United States government seems to have assumed a role similar to an Orwellian ministry of truth. Specific to the FBI, the court said this, the FBI's failure to alert social media companies that the Biden laptop story was real and not Russian disinformation is particularly troubling. The FBI had the laptop in their possession since December 2019 and had warned social media companies repeatedly to look out for, quote, hack and dump operation by the Russians prior to the 2020 election. Even after Facebook specifically asked whether the laptop story was Russian disinformation, the FBI refused to comment, resulting in social media companies' suppression of this story, and as a result, millions Millions of our fellow citizens did not hear the story prior to the November 3rd, 2020 election. Additionally, the FBI was included in industry meetings, bilateral meetings, received and forwarded alleged misinformation to social media companies, and actually misled companies in regard to the laptop story. When the court says the FBI misled, that's a nice way of saying they lied. They lied, and as a result, important information was kept from we the people, Days before the most important election we have, election of President of the United States, election of the Commander-in-Chief. In a survey last fall, four out of five Americans said they believe there's a two-tiered system of justice in America today. They said that because there is. They said that because of what they've witnessed. Think about what Americans have seen. The National School Board Association, left-wing political group, writes the White House and asks them to treat parents as, at school board meetings as terrorists. And the Garland Justice Department does just that. They put together a memo, set up a dedicated <laughs> line of threat communication, a snitch line on parents. As a result, <laughs> parents get investigated by our FBI, get a threat tag associated with their name, 25 of them, because the whistleblowers came and told us were investigated by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Americans have seen the FBI's Richmond Field Office put together a memorandum saying pro-life Catholics are extremists. They've seen 20 FBI agents, SWAT team members, show up at the home of Mark Halk and arrest him in front of his wife and seven children, even though he had indicated he'd be happy to turn himself in. And what was he arrested for? Him and his 12-year-old son were praying outside an abortion facility. Some guy starts screaming in his son's face and he, and he did what, what, frankly, any dad would do, defended his child. What's interesting is the National School Board Association apologized for the letter, but the Attorney General refuses to rescind his directive. The FBI did rescind, thank goodness, the Richmond Catholic Memorandum, but they refused to tell Congress who wrote it and who approved it. And Mr. Halk, Mr. Halk, when he got his day in court, he was acquitted by a jury of his peers. 
American speech is censored. Parents are called terrorists. Catholics are called radicals. And I haven't even talked about the spying that took place of a presidential campaign or the raiding of a former president's home. But maybe what's more frightening is what happens if you come forward and tell Congress. If you're a whistleblower, come tell the legislature, come tell the Congress what's going on. Look out. You will be retaliated against. Ask Garrett O'Boyle, who told Congress about these issues. Took his clearance, they took his pay, they took his kids' clothes. Ask Gary Shapley, 14-year veteran at the IRS, handled some of the biggest international tax fraud cases at the agency. He comes forward, and the Justice Department kicks him off the case. But here's what's truly unbelievable. Here's what's amazing. With all that history, with all that, the Justice Department and the FBI want the taxpayers they censored, the parents they labeled, the pro-life Catholics they called radical, they want them to pay for a new FBI headquarters. And they want FISA reauthorization of the 702 program in its current form. It's in, it's in the director's opening statement. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. There are 204,000 reasons why Republicans will oppose FISA reauthorization in its current form. 204,000 times the FBI improperly searched the 702 database. And unlike the FBI censorship in the court's opinion that was focused on conservatives, the FBI's illegal scrutiny wasn't just limited to conservatives. BLM supporters were illegally scrutinized by the FBI as well. And I hope our Democrat friends will join us in opposing reauthorization of Section 702 the way it's currently done. And I think they will. And I hope, and I hope they will work with us in the appropriations process to stop the weaponization of the government against the American people and in this double standard that exists now in our justice system. With that, I yield to the gentleman from New York for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, not that long ago, an oversight hearing of the FBI in this committee would have been a relatively bipartisan exercise. My colleagues on both sides of the aisle would have asked legitimate questions about the functioning and mission of the Bureau. Some of the questions may have been tough. Debate may have gotten a little heated when we discussed important topics like privacy and discrimination. But our questioning would have been grounded in advancing and overseeing the FBI's dual missions of enforcing federal laws and countering national security threats on American soil. In short, despite our disagreements, we would have done our duty as members of the Judiciary Committee. Today, unfortunately, House Republicans will fall well short of that mark. For them, this hearing is little more than performance art. It is an elaborate show designed with only two purposes in mind, to protect Donald Trump from the consequences of his actions and to return him to the White House in the next election. Don't take my word for it. Chairman Jordan announced his plan last August, just days after the FBI searched Mar-a-Lago. He told an audience at CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference, that the investigation into Trump's wrongdoing was, was designed to, quote, help frame up the 2024 race when I hope and I think President Trump is going to run again, and we, make sure, we need to make sure that he wins. Let me repeat that. We need to make sure that he wins. In pursuit of this goal, Chairman Jordan and committee Republicans have claimed for months that the FBI is corrupt rotten, politicized, and their favorite word, weaponized against the American people. Chairman Jordan has launched an array of baseless investigations into the FBI, most premised on absurd conspiracy theories, so, some so absurd that the chairman cannot possibly believe them to be true. But this is where the extreme MAGA leadership of this Congress has brought us today. Today, House Republicans will attack the FBI for having had the audacity to treat Donald Trump like any other citizen. The strategy is simple, really. When in doubt, Chairman Jordan investigates the investigators. The FBI dared to hold Trump accountable, so Republicans must discredit the FBI at all costs. You will hear claims today that the FBI's decision to investigate Donald Trump was somehow unfair. You will hear, that the, Repu you will hear the Republicans attack the indictment of former President Trump on 37 counts related to his gross mishandling of national security information, including information regarding defense and weapons capabilities of both the United States and foreign countries, 
United States nuclear programs, potential vulnerabilities of the United States and its allies to military attack, and plans for possible retaliation in response to a foreign attack. The facts are made clear in the indictment. Quote, the unauthorized disclosure of these classified documents could put at risk the national security of the United States, foreign relations, the safety of the United States military, and human sources, and the continued viability of sensitive intelligence collection methods, close quote. Indeed, the indictment goes on to describe how the former president made such unauthorized disclosures, with him boasting about and showing his classified documents to numerous individuals without proper security clearance. You will hear claims today that this indictment against Trump was unfair, maybe even that it was unlawful. You'll hear that the FBI should have just asked Trump a little more nicely, one more time, to hand over the documents. You'll hear that the case was a political investigation from the start, orient orchestrated by a liberal, liberal loving FBI that ensured Trump would be wrongfully vilified at every turn. These claims, of course, are completely untethered from the evidence. Even if you believe, as Chairman Jordan claims, that President Trump has committed no crime, surely we can agree that it is dangerous and profoundly irresponsible to have taken these documents from the White House and left them unsecured in Mar-a-Lago. Again, don't take just my word for it. Trump's Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, said that the former president's handling of this information put U.S. service members' lives and their national security at risk. <coughs> And Trump's hand-picked Attorney General, Bill Barr, with whom I agree on very little, hit the nail on the head when he described the former president's legal troubles as, quote, entirely of his own making. He had no right to those documents. The government tried for over a year, quietly and with respect, to get them back. And he jerked them around. When he faced a subpoena, he didn't raise any legal arguments. He engaged in a course of deceitful conduct. That was a clear crime, crime if those allegations are true, close quote. The former president could have, at any time, for months, simply returned the documents and avoided prosecution. But House Republicans do not want to talk about any of that. They seem incapable of assigning any agency or responsibility to Donald Trump for problems that are Trump's and Trump's alone. You might hear today about a man named Stephen D'Antuono, the former special agent in charge of the Washington field office during the investigation into the documents. Last month, Committee Republicans brought him in for an interview, and shortly after that, Chairman Jordan released a letter purporting to describe Mr. D'Antuono's testimony. In fact, Chairman Jordan's summary of Mr. D'Antuono's words are a vast mischaracterization of what he actually said. Here's just one example. Chairman Jordan has claimed that Mr. D'Antuono said he had, quote, no idea, unquote, why the Mar-a-Lago investigation was run out of the FBI's Washington field office instead of the Miami field office. What the chairman hides is that just seconds later, Mr. D'Antuono explained that, quote, the venue was here, meaning Washington, D.C., for the classified documents, that it was, quote, not out of the ordinary for Washington to be lead office running the investigation, and said that Washington has, quote, the most experience and knowledge in working public corruption cases and are, quote, the experts in classified document investigations. Mr. Jordan did not share the full record with the American public because it does not fit his chosen narrative. My staff has worked to have a minimally redacted version of Mr. D'Antuono's full testimony released, and I urge you to read the words for yourself in their entirety. When you compare his actual words to Mr. Jordan's characterization, you'll understand why I feel like this hearing room has become a theater. And frankly, it goes for many things that we will hear from the Republicans today. You can expect to hear that the FBI is retaliating against its conservative employees and has a deep-seated conspiracy to support liberal candidates and ideology. These claims are based on the words of several individuals, people Republicans are somewhat laughably calling whistleblowers. In fact, evidence shows that these individuals were suspended for violating serious FBI policies. One provided an unauthorized interview to Russian state-owned media. Another leaked information about an ongoing investigation, placing FBI agents and witnesses at risk. And another said that he wanted to use a senior FBI official as, quote, target practice. Chairman Jordan invited some of these so-called whistleblowers to testify before the Weaponization Subcommittee in May. 
As it turns out, two of the witnesses were ultimately paid $250,000 each for their testimony. Money raised in part by former Trump aide Cash Patel and paid via a check whose memo line reads, quote, for holding the line. And yet Republicans today will try, the, will try to claim that it is the FBI and not these witnesses who are somehow corrupt. Republicans today will also attack President Biden, starting with the IRS investigation into Hunter Biden. They will ignore the fact that U.S. Attorney David Weiss had the authority to bring charges in any district he sought fit and was able to operate fully free of interference. They do not want to acknowledge that despite years of investigations, President Biden has not been found to have engaged in any wrongdoing. Instead, they'll try to convince you that Hunter Biden would have been charged with far more serious crimes had it not been for U.S. Attorney Weiss being blocked by the Biden political machine. Once again, when they do not like the outcome, they investigate the investigators and work to discredit the outcome. And Republicans will make false claims about the FBI's Foreign Influence Task Force, claiming that it is somehow censoring conservatives. In fact, the task force plays a key role in making sure that Russia, China, Iran, and other foreign entities cannot again interfere in our elections. According to committee Republicans, the task force's efforts to track and prevent foreign influence operations amount to attacks on conservative speech, a nonsensical claim considering that the Foreign Influence Task Force has nothing to do with censoring American free speech and, in fact, helps to ensure that American voices are heard by stopping Russian troll farms. Make no mistake, in making these claims, Republicans have all but rolled out the red carpet and begged Russia to once again interfere in our elections because they believe that doing so will get Trump reelected in 2024. And that is the goal of Republicans today. Republican claims that the FBI has been weaponized, their personal attacks on Director Ray, their repeated calls to, quote, to defund the FBI, these are not victimless acts. They are a clarion call to anti-government extremists, and that call is being heard. Last year, Director Ray faced multiple credible death threats. FBI employees faced more threats in the months after the Mar-a-Lago search than they had in the entire prior year. The problem has gotten so bad that FBI has had to stand up an entire new unit dedicated to combating threats to FBI agents and staff. It is far past time that Republicans realize the consequences of their actions. Republicans may want to downplay Trump's behavior and blame the FBI for his downfall. But no matter what they say, Trump risked the safety and security of the United States to remove those documents from the White House, then lied to the government instead of returning them. Donald Trump must be held accountable, and attempts to shield him from the consequences of his own actions are both transparent and despicable. Ultimately, no matter how many times Republicans attack Director Ray, or the FBI, or the investigation at Mar-a-Lago, I trust in the rule of law. Mr. Trump will have his day in court. I believe the system will hold him accountable. And I thank the men and women of the FBI who helped bring the classified information to safety and protect the national security of our nation. Thank you for being here today, Director Ray. I hope your agents will not be disheartened by what they hear today and will continue this kind of work essential to the safety of our nation. I thank the chairman and I yield back. Gentleman yields back, just for the record, the pronunciation of the former assistant director in charge of the Washington field office is Dan Tuano, something that ranking member might have known if he'd actually shown up at the deposition like I did. Uh, with that, we. Uh, Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. We will now introduce today's witnesses. The Honorable Christopher Ray has been the director of the FBI since 2017. He previously served as the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division of the Department of Justice, the Principal Associate Deputy Attorney General, and Associate Deputy Attorney General, and as Assistant U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Georgia. Director Ray has also worked in private practice at King Spalding LLP. We welcome our witness and thank him for appearing today. Uh, we will begin by swearing you in. Director, would you please rise, raise your right hand. You've done this, you've done this before. Do you, swear, do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record show the, the witness answered in the affirmative. Um, 
Please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. We'll give you a few extra minutes if you like, Director. And then you know how this works. We'll be five minutes of questioning, and my guess is every single member is going to have questions for you. So uh, again, thank you for being here. Director Ray, you are recognized for your opening statement. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, members of the committee. Uh, in the time that I have before we get to your questions, I want to talk about the sheer breadth and impact of the work the FBI's 38,000 employees are doing each and every day. Because the work the men and women of the FBI do to protect the American people goes way beyond the one or two investigations that seem to capture all the headlines. Take violent crime. Last year alone, working shoulder to shoulder with our partners in state and local law enforcement, the FBI arrested more than 20,000 violent criminals and child predators. That's an average of almost 60 bad guys taken off the streets per day, every day. Or our work going after the cartels, exploiting our southwest border to traffic fentanyl and other dangerous drugs into communities nationwide. The FBI's running well over 300 investigations targeting the leadership of those cartels. And working with our partners, we've already seized hundreds of kilograms of fentanyl this year alone, stopping deadly drugs from reaching their intended destinations in states all over the country and saving countless American lives. Or the thousands of active investigations we now have into the Chinese government's efforts to steal our most precious secrets, rob our businesses of their ideas and innovation, and repress freedom of speech right here in the United States. And that is just scratching the surface. The men and women of the FBI work tirelessly every day to protect the American people from what is really a staggering array of threats. And we don't do that work alone. The FBI now leads more than 750 task forces nationwide, made up of more than 6,000 state and local task force officers, or TFOs as we call them, from more than 1,800 different state and local agencies. Each of those TFOs represents an officer, a deputy, or an investigator that a local police chief, sheriff, or state superintendent was willing to send our way, certainly not because they didn't have enough work to do in their own department, but because they saw the tremendous value that our FBI-led task forces bring. And we are honored and humbled by their trust in us and grateful for their partnership. But the numbers don't tell the whole story. To truly appreciate the impact the FBI and our partners are having, you gotta look at the cases. Just last month, for instance, the FBI charged 31 members of two drug trafficking organizations responsible for distributing dangerous drugs like fentanyl, cocaine, and methamphetamine throughout the area around Marion, Ohio. In that one investigation run out of the FBI's two-man office in Mansfield, we worked with partners from multiple local police departments and sheriff's offices to take kilos of fentanyl off Marion streets. Enough lethal doses, I should add, to kill the entire population of Columbus, Cleveland, and Cincinnati combined. It's a great example of how even a small office with a small personnel footprint the FBI is working big cases hand in hand with our state and local partners to have an outsized impact in our communities. The FBI has got thousands of employees working scores of investigations like that all over the country to protect the American people. Those men and women who choose to dedicate their careers, their lives really, to this kind of work and fulfilling the FBI mission are inspiring. At a time when so many other law enforcement agencies have had a difficult time with recruiting and retention, the Bureau continues to attract applicants in near record numbers. In fact, after the first couple of years of my tenure, the number of Americans applying to be special agents tripled the pace from when I started, reaching the highest levels in about a decade. At the same time, inside the FBI, our special agent attrition has remained in the low single digits and would be the envy of almost any employer. And even with these bigger numbers, the folks we're continuing to add continue to be top-notch. The percentage 
of both veterans and special agent hires with prior law enforcement experience has remained as steady as ever, between 25 and 30 percent. Add to that, in a job market where applicants have a whole lot of other opportunities, the percentage of those new agent trainees that also have advanced degrees is up and now approaches about 50 percent of every class at Quantico. But the thing that unites them all is a commitment to public service, a willingness to put others above themselves. And that is true from the bottom of the organization to the top. Since becoming director, I have worked hard to assemble and cultivate a leadership team that embodies those values and characteristics. It's a team that I purposefully chose because they walk to the walk out in the field. Just taking our top eight leaders as an example, they all came up through the Bureau as line agents. They've worked in 21 different field offices and have a combined 130 years of field experience. They include a West Point grad, veterans of the Army, Air Force, and Marines, as well as a former police officer and state trooper. And not a single one is a political appointee, not one. Today's FBI leaders reflect the best of our organization, an organization that is made up of 38,000 men and women who are patriots, professionals, and dedicated public servants. And that is the real FBI. I've now visited every single one of our 56 field offices twice, some of them more than twice. I speak constantly with local chiefs and sheriffs from all 50 states who work closely with us every day, with judges coast to coast who see and hear our work up close, with business leaders who turn to us for help with cyber attacks and Chinese economic espionage, with victims and their families, people that we protect from gangs and predators, and the FBI they tell me about consistently, almost resoundingly, is the same FBI that I see, an FBI that is respected, appreciated, trusted, and that is there for them when they need us the most. And that is the FBI that inspires me and that I'm proud to be here today to represent. Thank you. Uh, we, we thank you. Uh, we will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, this is no time to mince words. The American people have lost faith in the FBI. All of our constituents are demanding that we get this situation under control, and we have to do that. That's our responsibility. This is not a political party issue, sir. This is about whether the very system of justice in our country can be trusted anymore. Without that, no republic can survive. See, the American people that we represent are losing count of the scandals that are mounting. The FBI has been involved. They've seen evidence that it's being used as a political tool of the Biden administration. They've seen counterterrorism resources being used against school parents, the homes of conservative political opponents being raided. They've seen conservative states being targeted over their election integrity laws and conservative Catholics and pro-life citizens characterized as violent extremists. Just last month, as you know, special former, uh, former special counsel John Durham sat right in that seat and testified that the Justice Department and the FBI should never have launched the bogus Trump-Russia investigation. And his lengthy report reluctantly concluded that the FBI, quote, failed to uphold its mission of strict fidelity to the law. Just last week, NBC had a poll. Only 37% of registered voters now view the FBI positively. 35% have a negative view. In 2018, by comparison, 52% of the country had a positive view of the FBI. There's a serious decline in the people's faith and it's on your watch, sir. And then, July 4th, we had this explosive, explosive 155-page opinion from a federal court in my home state of Louisiana. It explains in detail that the FBI has been directly involved in what the, con the court says is, quote, arguably the most massive attack against free speech in United States history. The court ordered the White House, DOJ, and FBI, among others, to immediately cease colluding with and coercing social media companies to suppress American speech, of course, conservative speech in particular. Director Ray, I find it stunning. You made no mention of this court opinion, either in your opening statement today or in this lengthy 14-page report that you prepared on July 12th, which is eight days after the court ruling. Have you read the ruling, sir? I am familiar with the ruling, and I've uh, reviewed it with our Office of General Counsel. Are you deeply disturbed by what they've told you about the ruling, if you haven't read it yourself? 
Uh, obviously, we're going to comply with the court's order, the court's preliminary injunction. We sent out guidance to the field and the headquarters uh, about how to do that. Uh, needless to say, the, the injunction itself is a subject of ongoing litigation, uh, and so I'll, I'll decline to comment further well, on it. Well, let me tell you what the court concluded, because it, it should be the first thing you think about every morning and the last thing you think about at night. They said that, quote, the court found, apparently the FBI engaged in a massive effort to suppress disfavored conservative speech and blatantly ignored the First Amendment's right to free speech. The evidence shows the FBI threatened adverse consequences to social media companies that they did not comply with its censorship request. The court found that, quote, this seemingly unrelenting pressure by the FBI and the other defendants had the intended result of suppressing millions of protected free speech postings by American citizens. As a result, the court states, for example, millions of citizens did not hear about the Hunter Biden laptop story prior to the November 3rd, 2020 election. Page four of the court ruling lists some of the important subjects that the Biden administration and the FBI forced the social media uh, platforms to suppress. The evidence shows you, your agency, the people that directly report to you, suppressed conservative-leaning free speech about topics like the laptop, the lab leak theory of COVID-19's origin, the effectiveness of masks and COVID-19 lockdowns and vaccines, speech about election integrity in the 2020 presidential election, security of voting by mail, even parody about the president himself, negative posts about the economy. The FBI made the social media platforms pull that information off the internet if it came from conservative sources. They, they did this under the guise that it was disinformation. Can you, can you define what disinformation is? What I can tell you is that our focus is not on disinformation, broadly speaking. Well, wait a minute, yes line. it is, well, wait a minute. You're, can I you're, answer the question? You can in a minute. Your star witness said in the litigation, Elvis Chan, who's in charge of this, said they do it on the basis of dif disinformation. We need, a, we need a definition of what that is. Our focus is on malign, foreign disinformation, that is foreign hostile actors who engage in covert efforts to <laughs> Mr. abuse Ray, Mr. our social media platforms, which is something that is not seriously in dispute. I have to stop phenomenon. you for time. That's not accurate. You need to read this court opinion because you're in charge of enforcing it. The court f has found that, and Elvis Chan testified under oath in charge of this for you. He said 50%, he had a 50% success rate in having alleged election disinformation taken down or censored. That, that wasn't just for an adversary, sir. That was American citizens. How do you answer for that? Well, first off, I'm not sure that's a correct characterization. Comes of right his out of the testimony. opinion. You should read but it. What I, of, of his testimony. But what I would say is the FBI is not in the business of moderating content or causing any social media company to suppress or censor. That is not what the court has found. What I would also say is among the things that you listed off, I find ironic the reference to the lab leak theory. The idea that the FBI would somehow be involved in suppressing references to the lab leak theory is somewhat absurd when you consider the fact that the FBI was the only, the only agency in the entire intelligence community to reach the assessment that it was more likely than not that that was the explanation but your for the agents, pandemic. But your agents pulled it off the internet, sir. That's what the evidence in the court has found. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from New York is recognized. Director Ray, House Republicans have attacked the execution of the search warrant of Mar-a-Lago last August as a, quote, unprecedented raid. Would you consider the execution of the search warrant at Mar-a-Lago a raid? Uh, I would not call it a raid. I would call it the execution of a lawful search warrant. Can you describe how the search was executed? Well, we had the case team, uh, you know, follow its standard procedure. It has sometimes been described as a SWAT uh, operation. It was not. There was no SWAT involvement. Um, but beyond that, I think I want to be really careful with getting too far into the details now that this case is uh, not only in the hands of a special counsel, but more importantly, in my view, uh, in front of the court. And I learned a long time ago as a line prosecutor and defense lawyer to respect the, uh, the court process is where I think were, we should speak. Were particular steps taken to ensure that the execution of the search warrant did not draw undue attention? Uh, I think there were steps along those lines, yes, sir. Can you name a couple of them? Well, among, among other things, we did not uh, have people uh, coming in so-called raid jackets, uh, you know, which is often okay. something you would see. So in other words, the FBI agents executing the search wore plain clothes so as not to attract undue attention the FBI waited until Trump had left Mar-a-Lago to execute the search. Is that correct? Yes. And Chairman Jordan has attacked the DOJ and the FBI 
for not attempting to get the documents back from Trump consensually before turning to a search warrant. I want to walk through all these, the opportunities Trump had to produce these documents and have a series of yes or no questions. The National Archives, also known as NARA, first asked Trump to return all presidential records to them in May 2021, correct? Well, I don't, I don't remember the date, but I remember there was a request by the okay. National Archives. And then throughout 2021, NARA made repeated follow-up requests, but still Trump replied to comply, correct? Uh, yes, I would refer you to the pleadings that have been filed in court that lay out in, in better detail than I could in hear. Fact, in yeah. fact, it was not until January 2022, after NARA warned Trump that failing to return documents could violate the Presidential Records Act, that Trump finally produced 15 boxes of documents to it, correct? Again, I, I would just refer to our court filings, which go into great detail about all this. And even these six, 15 boxes did not contain all the documents Trump was required to return, correct? Mm -hmm. That's my recollection, but again, I'll refer to So in to May violence. 2022, a grand jury had to actually subpoena Trump for the missing documents, correct? The same answer, yeah. And Trump was then present on June 3rd when his attorneys handed over another folder of documents and a certification that all classified material had been returned, correct? Again, I just want, want to stick with what's in the court filings. That sounds right to me, but okay. I, I really want to be careful to stay within the four corners. But the certification was false, right? Even then, Trump had not returned all classified uh, material, correct? I think that is part of the indictment. He had additional documents hiding in his bathroom, in his storage room, in his storage units, et cetera, yes? Again, I think that's part of the indictment. And so finally, DOJ and FBI were required to obtain a search warrant to obtain the classified documents that had not been retained, correct? Same answer. The documents retrieved during that search included 69 marked confidential, 98 secret and 30 top secret, is that correct? Same answer. So to sum up, President Trump had many, many chances to voluntarily comply with FBI and DOJ's request. Instead, he made the choice to keep these highly classified defense and national security documents, apparently because he wanted a souvenir. I find myself in the strange position of agreeing with former Attorney General Bill Barr's statement that Trump brought this on himself, and I would add that it's absurd that House Republicans are attacking the FBI and DOJ for doing their job and ensuring that no person is above the law. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Kentucky is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman. Uh, Director Ray, in light of information provided to us about the FBI's investigation of the January 6 pipe bombs, in an interview with Assistant Director Stephen Duantuano, Chairman Jordan and I sent you a letter a month ago some of the information that we found in that interview was that phone data that could have helped to identify the pipe bomber was corrupted, was unusable. Uh, he also wasn't sure who found or how the second bomb was found at the DNC. Do you know how the second bomb was found at the DNC? And, and when do you plan on answering our letter? Well, as to the letter, I, I will uh, work with the department to make sure we can figure out what information we can provide. As you know, this is a very active, ongoing investigation, and there are some restrictions on that, but we yes, will Yes, we can handle classified respond. information, it's, and we fund your department, and so you need to provide that. that. I, it's not, respectfully, it's not an issue of classification. It's an issue of commenting on ongoing criminal investigations, which is something that by longstanding department policy we are restricted in doing. And in fact, the last administration actually strengthened those policies partly That's because- That's not our policy though, and we fund you. So let's move on. I could do you know how the second pipe bomb, do you, can you tell us how the second pipe bomb was found at the DNC? I, again, I'm not gonna get into that here. 900 days ago is when this happened. And you said you had total confidence we'd apprehend the subject. We've found video that looks like somebody, a passerby, miraculously found this pipe bomb at the DNC and then notified the police. Miraculously, I say, because it was at specifically the same, the precise time to cause the maximum distraction from the events going on at the Capitol. Can you show this video that we have, please? I'd like to know if the director has seen this. This is somebody with a, with a mask on, wearing a hat. They're walking in front of the DNC, which is out of the view on the right-hand side. You'll see him come into view. He goes to one police car. He goes to another police car. He's holding a backpack. He's got a mask on. He's talking to the police. And within a minute, they start scrambling. You'll see the camera turn. 
to the pipe bomb, the location of the pipe bomb. By the way, that's a, I believe the Metro police are now getting out of their car, and that's uh, Vice President-elect's detail in the black SUV, I believe, parked about 30 feet from the pipe bomb, eating lunch. Okay, now we go over to the location of the pipe bomb. The cameras are scrambling. It, it appears to me that that's not a coincidence, that the person with the backpack who walked by that bench and then went up to the police uh, and the detail didn't, it, didn't do that accidentally. They had a purpose in mind, and that what transpired after that was the result of information that person gave to them. If that person found the pipe bomb, would they be a suspect? Well, again, I don't want to speculate about specific individuals. I will tell you that we have done thousands of interviews, uh, reviewed something like 40,000 video files, of which this is uh, one, uh, assessed 500-something tips. Have you interviewed uh, that person? We, we have conducted all logical investigative steps and interviewed all logical individuals at this well, then point. Then you need, it's 900 days. You need to tell us what you found because we're finding stuff you haven't released into the public. In, well, in my remaining minute, I, w I want to turn to another issue. Uh, George Hill, former FBI supervisory intelligence analyst in the Boston field office, told us that the Bank of America, uh, with no legal process, was, uh, gave to the FBI gun purchase records uh, with, with no geographical boundaries for anybody that was a Bank of America customer. Is that true? Well, what I do know is that the, uh, a number of business community partners all the time, uh, including financial institutions, share information with us about possible criminal activity. And my did understanding is that that's fully lawful. In the did specific, you, did you in the ask specific for that information? Instance, in the specific instance that you're asking about, my understanding is that that information was shared with field offices for information only, but then recalled to avoid even the appearance uh, of any kind of overreach, but my understanding is that that's a fully lawful process. We, was there a warrant involved? A again, my understanding is that the institution in question shared information with us, as happens all the time. Did you request the, the information? I, I can't speak to the specifics. Okay, well, we've got an email where it says the FBI did give the search queries to Bank of America, and Bank of America responded to the FBI and gave over this information without a search warrant. Do you believe there's any limitation on your ability to obtain gun purchase data or purchase information for people that for people who aren't suspects from banks without well, a warrant? Well, now you're now you're asking a legal question, which I would prefer to defer to the lawyers, uh, since I'm not practicing as one right now, including the department. But what I will tell you is that my understanding is that the process by which we receive information from business community partners across a wide variety of industries, including financial institutions, sharing information with us about possible criminal activity is something that is fully lawful uh, under current uh, federal law. It may be lawful, but it's not constitutional. I yield back. The gentleman yields uh, back. The gentlelady from California is recognized for five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Director Ray, for being here. I, you know, I think it's, it's actually sad that the majority is uh, engaging in conspiracy theories and efforts to try and discredit one of the premier law enforcement agencies in the United States <clears throat> in the effort to try and, uh, without really any evidence, um, make the case that the FBI is somehow opposed to conservative views. In my view, actually, I'm concerned that the FBI has been reluctant to do its job when it comes to the former president. Um, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put in the record a, an article from the Washington Post, FBI resisted opening probe into Trump's role in January 6th for more than a year. Without objection. Uh, Director Ray, uh, would you uh, disagree with the premise of this article that the FBI um, delayed in looking at Mr. Trump himself. The January 6th committee, and I was a member, uh, did find that the ex-president was the center of a wide-ranging conspiracy to overturn the election. Uh, did the FBI start looking right after January 6th at the ex-president? Uh, 
I'm sorry, I just lost the last part of your question there. Did the FBI start looking at the ex-president's role in January 6th starting January 7th or closely to that time? Well, let me start with, uh, I'm not in the business of, of kind of commenting or engaging on the, the truth or, or falsity of newspaper articles. Uh, and in this particular instance, as I'm sure you can appreciate, there is an ongoing, very important ongoing special okay. counsel investigation that's now in court. And so not right. only do I not want to talk about respect, the ongoing investigation, I I, respect, the internal deliberations related to it are even more sensitive. I, I respect that you cannot discuss ongoing um, investigations. Let me turn to another item. I mean, there's been criticism, and the ranking member went through the scenario leading up to uh, the warrant uh, for the documents at um, Mar-a-Lago. But I'd like to ask a unanimous consent to put an article from the Washington Post, showdown before the raid, uh -huh. FBI agents and prosecutors argued over Trump. No objection. It's pretty clear from this article um, that there was a resistance on the part of the FBI to actually um, look at the president or pursue that case vigorously, and although you can't comment on it, the article does suggest that FBI agents want to just close the case uh, because the ex-president made an assertion that uh, a search had been made. Now, we had um, Mr. D'Antuano uh, in as a witness, and he testified four times that the Mar-a-Lago uh, search had adequate probable cause. Do you agree with that statement? That the, the search had probable cause? Correct. Yes. Thank you. Um, and so you don't have any dispute that there was probable cause for this warrant. I, you know, I just want to say, before going to my next question, that over and over again, the FBI delayed and showed unprecedented uh, caution before investigating the ex-president, even when there was a potential threat uh, to national security. That is, that's my view. That's very far uh, from the assertion that there was unfair targeting. Can Let I me just, ask can I, on that point, if I just, if I may, uh, while I can't discuss any specific investigation, my expectation for all of our investigations repeatedly communicated to all of our people, and this is especially important in sensitive investigations, is that our folks take great pains to be rigorous, professional, objective, following all our policies and procedures and do the work in the right way. And sometimes okay. that's frustrating to others. My time is almost up. And I, I, I want to ask you another question. In the Senate hearing, in response to Senate, uh, Senator Wyden's question of whether the FBI is currently purchasing Americans' location uh, data, you indicated that it was limited to data derived from Internet advertising. Uh, it's since been um, reported that the FBI has admitted it bought uh, U.S. location data. Is the FBI purchasing location data from commercial so sources without a warrant? Uh, this is an area that requires a little more precision and context for me to be able to answer that fully, so let me have my staff follow back up with you so that I make sure that I don't leave something important out. I'd, I'll just close with uh, the FBI had 3.4 million backdoor searches of the FISA a database without a warrant in 2021. Can you say whether the FBI is continuing to search the FISA database without a warrant for American uh, Americans? Well, if you're asking about our use of 702 queries, um, I am. those are, uh, there is no warrant requirement under the Fourth Amendment for those queries. Uh, it's fairly well settled. The 3.4 uh, million figure that you're talking about, I guess I would say a couple things. One, that's not 3.4 million people. That's 3.4 million search terms or query what? terms. Second, second, that's not a, those are not uh, queries in violation of rules. Those are just queries my, my, under my the My time has expired, but the committee will look into the warrant requirement later. You sure in will. The you sure will. The gentleman from Florida is recognized. The American people need to understand what just happened. My, col my Democrat colleague just asked the director of the FBI whether or not they are buying information about our fellow Americans. And the answer is, well, we'll just have to get back to you on that. It sounds really complicated. But I have other questions. 
I'm sitting here with my father. I will make certain that between the man sitting next to me and every person he knows and my ability to forever hold a grudge, that you will regret not following my direction. I am sitting here waiting for the call with my father. Sounds like a shakedown, doesn't it, director? I'm not going to get into commenting on that. You, you, you seem deeply uncurious about it, don't you? Almost suspiciously uncurious. Are you protecting the Bidens? A absolutely not. The FBI well, does not the has no oh, hold interest on. in protecting You won't answer the question about politically. whether or not that's a shakedown, and everybody knows why you won't answer it. Because to, ev to the millions of people who will see this, they know it is. And your inability to acknowledge that is deeply revealing about you. But let's go from the uncurious to the downright nosy. How many illegal FISA queries have occurred under your leadership of the FBI? Well, there are reports that have come out with different numbers about uh, compliance incidents. More than a million illegal ones? Because that's what the Inspector General said. The Inspector General said that in the 3.4 million of these queries, more than a million were in error. Do you have any basis to disagree with that, that assessment by the Inspector General? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, actually, that's a a correct characterization of the Inspector General's uh, oh, well, findings on well, that. The internet but, will remind you of I, that in moments. But, but let, let's now go to uh, what the, the court said. The court said it was over 200,000 that have occurred on your watch. W would, do you have any basis to disagree with that assessment? Again, I don't have the numbers I sit here right now. What I can Seems tell Seems like you a number you should know. How many times the FBI is breaking the law under your watch, especially if it's like over a million to not know that number, and I'm worried about your veracity on the subject as well. Play, this, play the video. Letters for investigation the of court? the Capitol. I don't believe FISA is remotely implicated in our investigation. You, you so, so there, Senator Lee's asking you whether or not FISA was in any way involved in your January 6th investigation, and you say no. It, was that truthful? I said that I did not believe it was. Okay, so now let's pull up what the court said, which was something a little different than what you said. So, so here, no, nope, that's not the right one. Yeah, here we go, right there. It says, the government has reported additional significant violations of the querying standard, including several relating to the January 6, 2021 breach of the Capitol. So I guess the question, Director Ray, is, did, did you not know when you were answering these questions that the FBI was engaging in these illegal searches, or did you perjure yourself to Senator Lee? I certainly didn't perjure myself. At the time that I testified in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, I didn't have that piece of information. I will well, add... Well, that was a court order. You didn't have that piece of information because the court hadn't yet rendered a judgment. Did you not know when you gave the untruthful answer before Senator Lee that this was going on? It was a, it was a truthful answer. I did not believe FISA had been involved in the January 6th But it was. So you didn't... The answer is the FBI has broken so bad that people can go and engage in queries that when you come before the Congress to answer questions, you're like blissfully ignorant. You're blissfully ignorant as to the unlawful queries. You're blissfully ignorant as to the Biden shakedown regime. And it just seems like it gets into a kind of a creepy place as well. Go to our, our next image on what the court said. Like, just so the American people realize, the, the court has smacked you down alleging or ruling FBI personnel apparently conducted queries for improper personal reasons. People were looking themselves up. They were looking their ex-lovers up. Who has been held accountable or fired as a consequence of the FBI using the FISA process as their, like, creepy personal snoop machine? There have been instances in which individuals uh, have had disciplinary action uh, and Amen. who are no longer with it. I, I can't get into it here, but we can follow back up but with don't you. But you yeah. don't you see that that's kind of the thing, Director Ray, that you preside over the FBI that has the lowest level of trust in the FBI's history? People trusted the FBI more when J. Edgar Hoover was running the place than when you are. And the reason is because you don't give straight answers. You give answers that, that later a court deems aren't true. And then at the end of the day, you won't criticize an obvious shakedown when it's directly in front of us. And it appears as though you're whitewashing the conduct of corrupt people. Respectfully, Congressman, in your home state of Florida, the number of people applying to come work for us and devote their lives working for us is over up over 100%. We're deeply proud of them, and they deserve better than you. 
Time of the gentleman has expired. The, the gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Director Ray. I thank you for continuing to serve with all of these uh, attempts to sully your name, suggest you've committed crimes when you've done an excellent job as FBI director. I don't agree with everything you've done, but mostly I do, and I think the FBI is a premier law enforcement agency, and I support law enforcement. To attack the FBI is to attack law enforcement in general. A few days after Mar-a-Lago, there was some individual went after the Cincinnati headquarters of the FBI. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you think that came about? Uh, so the incident that you're asking about uh, was obviously deeply disturbing. We had an individual uh, wearing a tactical vest armed with an AR-style rifle and a nail gun who attempted to forcibly enter and attack uh, our Cincinnati field office. Um, a subsequent review of the subject's devices and online postings uh, identified a, a pretty striking anti FBI anti-federal law enforcement hostility. Uh, he was calling on others to kill federal law enforcement, claiming that he felt he was fighting a, uh, in his words, a civil war. And it's unfortunately part of a broader phenomenon uh, that we have seen, not just against the FBI, and this is important to add, but against law enforcement uh, all across the country. Uh, not just against law enforcement professionals themselves, which is uh, appalling enough, but calling for attacks against their families, which is uh, truly despicable. And, and that man eventually was, was captured and, and eliminated, was he not? Yes. A few days later, was the Arizona FBI Department the subject of armed uh, in violence, or not violence, but armed uh, protesters? Well, I know that our uh, Phoenix um, field office has had a number of, of very concerning security incidents where people uh, attempted to attack or, or breach the, the facility. I can't remember the dates of when that happened. but All of this has happened kind of in the same sphere. It's been information that's been put out on social media and in just in general and been by members of the Congress. Uh, questioning the FBI, questioning law enforcement in general, and this has had a deleterious effect on the safety of FBI officials, and you said others like justice. There was a story the other day, I believe, about uh, people involved in the prosecution of, of the former president and threats to them, uh, the D DOJ personnel as well as FBI. Is that something that's going on presently? Is there efforts to have a unit at the FBI maybe look into how to protect and defend uh, law enforcement personnel who are threatened with violence? We did uh, stand up a whole dedicated unit to focus uh, on threats to FBI uh, uh, individuals, FBI employees, and FBI facilities because of the uptick that we saw uh, over that time period. The uh, January 6th I mean, was a, beyond a weaponization of government. It was a nuclearization of government against the government. Uh, I, I believe I, I heard that you said that you didn't have any prior notice or reason to believe that there would be such an event on January 6th. Is that correct? Uh, we did not, to my knowledge at least, uh, have prior knowledge of, a, of an attempt a violent overthrow of, and breach of the Capitol building itself. Certainly we were concerned about and, and put out a number of uh, products, intelligence products, to partners and others warning of the potential for violence more generally uh, on that date. So there have been, I think Tucker Carlson and some of the members, colleagues on the other side of the aisle have said that Ray Epps was a secret government agent in helping uh, encourage uh, this, this crime so as to make the president look bad. Uh, do you have any knowledge of Ray Epps being a secret government agent? Uh, no. Uh, I will say this notion that somehow the violence at the Capitol on January 6th was part of some operation orchestrated by FBI sources and agents uh, is ludicrous and is a disservice to our brave, hardworking, dedicated men and women. Director, I agree with you. I think the FBI has some of the most talented law enforcement people in our nation and in the world, and they are concerned about safety. They tend to, as I understand it, lean Republican, but they do their job down the line, and that's what they're supposed to do. 
I'm happy we have the FBI operating in Memphis and other places to work with our police departments and joint units to protect our citizens, and I thank you for your service to the United States. And I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you. Director, I'm going to follow up on my colleague from uh, Memphis. Uh, how many individuals were either FBI uh, employees or people that the FBI had made contact with were in the January 6th uh, entry of the Capitol and surrounding area? So I, I really need to be careful here talking about uh, where we have or have not used confidential human sources. Was there, one or, more, was there or one or more individuals that would fit that description on January 6th that were in or around the Capitol? I, I believe there is a, uh, a filing in one of the January 6th cases that can provide a little more information about this, and I'm happy to see if we can follow back up with you. I, I just want that. an yeah. answer. Was there one or more? I mean, you would know if there was at least one individual who worked for the FBI who, who entered the Capitol on that day. Uh, I can't, again, I just can't speak to that here, but I'm happy to get the court filing well, that- Look, it's that been two years, and you're now, you're now come before us. The gentleman asks these questions, makes all kinds of insinuations, and you, you nod your head yes, and then I ask you simply, was there one or more? And you won't answer that. So I'm going to make the assumption that there was more than one, more than five, more than 10, and that you're ducking uh, the, the question because you don't want to answer for the fact that you had at least one and somehow missed understanding that some of the individuals were very dangerous and that there were others inciting individuals to enter the Capitol after others broke windows. So I'm just going to move on because I think it is time to move on past January 6th. I just, uh, seems that the other side won't. Um, you're a, a near cabinet, cabinet level individual. You enjoy a term in Senate confirmation. Do you feel comfortable speaking to other members, uh, either cabinet level or sub cabinet level, when appropriate uh, to resolve problems be within the government? Absolutely. Okay. And so uh, when the FBI uh, censored the United States government, you, would, uh, you, you wouldn't have to just take it down by uh, calling Meta or Google, would you? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following the question. Are you familiar with the official verified Russian language account of the United States uh, uh, Department of State that was taken down at your agency's request? That, that doesn't ring a bell as I sit here right now, no. Okay, well, now you have something to take back and, and look at. Okay. Because, in fact, in this bundle uh, that SBU uh, constantly was submitting to uh, various uh, agencies was, in fact, a Russian language uh, you know, statement of, of a government. Literally, you took down the free speech of the Department of State. So... Yes, go ahead. You mentioned SBU. I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing, but I, I will endeavor to, to provide a little more context, at least as to SBU. Yes. Um, so uh, I believe what you may be referring to, but I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing, is that when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, the Security Service of Ukraine, the SBU, which is a longstanding good partner of the FBI, uh, asked us for help on a whole range of things. Uh, and one of those things was to contact U.S. companies on their behalf because the Russians, the invasion, had cut off the Ukrainians' communications. And so we did pass through information from uh, the SBU to okay. social media. Are you also familiar with the fact that President Zelensky has had to clean house at the SBU? I, I know there have been a number of personnel changes. Okay. Well, we'll follow up in, in, uh, with this in more detail. The, uh, the, the question I have for you is, uh, you're the premier law enforcement operation, and you're a former Department of Justice, high-ranking executive at all levels. So would you agree that the job of the FBI is criminal investigation? Is criminal investigation uh, and to protect the country from national security threats, those two things. Okay. So... The, the idea that you take information and you have it taken down, use your authority and the, the leverage you have to have Meta, Google, uh, Facebook, or Facebook being Meta, or uh, Twitter, take down people's information uh, on things like 
where, where COVID came from, where do you find the national security interest in that? Where, where do you find the interest in free speech of American citizens being taken down? And I repeat, free speech of American citizens, where, where do you have that authority? So we don't uh, ask social media companies uh, to censor information or suppress information uh, when it comes to national security threats, certainly. Uh, so what we do do is alert them when some other intelligence agency gives us information about a foreign intelligence service being behind some account, we will call social media companies' attention to that. But at the end of the day, we're very clear that it's up to the social media companies to decide whether to do something about it The suggestion it or not, of the most powerful law it. enforcement operation is not a suggestion. It is, in fact, effectively an order. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are here today because MAGA Republicans will do anything to protect Donald Trump, their savior, no matter how unfounded or dangerous it may be to do so. Welcome to the legislative arm of the Trump re-election campaign. A grand jury found probable cause that, among other crimes, Trump illegally kept highly sensitive national security documents, which could put our country and, others and our sources in danger if they got out, and which photographs show Trump kept those records in bathrooms, showers, closets, and in the Mar-a-Lago ballroom. MAGA Republicans are afraid that the justice system might hold Trump accountable for his actions. So to protect him, Republicans are trying to intimidate FBI officials. And in case that does not work, Republicans are trying their hardest to di discredit the FBI in the eyes of the American public. When Trump lost in 2020, they tried to make Americans distrust their election systems. And now that the FBI and the Justice Department have sought to hold Trump to the same standard any other American citizen would be held to, MAGA Republicans are telling Americans not to trust the FBI. To protect Trump, Republicans are trying to distract us from the real work that the FBI does every day, which is fighting violent criminals, child predators, and fighting domestic terrorists and extremists so as to protect our democracy and our national security. And even worse, MAGA Republicans are stirring up threats that pose a danger to the safety of FBI employees. It's past time that Republicans realize the consequences of their words and put the good of this country over politics. Now, uh, Director Ray, I want to thank you for your service. Uh, during a time of unprecedented um, travail. Um, uh, Director Ray, um, you were a partner at an international law firm before you took a, a drastic pay cut to accept the job of FBI director. Isn't that correct? Uh, yes, that's something my wife <laughs> reminds me of from time to time. <laughs> and, uh, but let me ask you this, sir. Uh, and you took this office after uh, Trump fired the former FBI director, Jim Comey, correct? Yes, sir. And um, did you uh, contact the Trump administration to offer yourself uh, for this job, or did the administration recruit you for the job? Uh, they contacted me and asked me if I would be willing to consider taking on the role. So Trump handpicked you to be the FBI director. Yes. And he expected you to do what he wanted you to do, correct? Well, that I can't speak to. I, I can tell you the same well, thing I told I'll him, which like is this. that I'm going to do this job by the book. He's unhappy with you now, isn't he? Uh, I'll, I'll let him speak for himself. Well, I think a lot of uh, his uh, acolytes uh, here reflect his, uh, his intent at this particular time. Director Ray, are you aware that MAGA Republicans have repeatedly called for the FBI to be uh, defunded? I have heard some of that language. In fact, Republicans on this very committee have said that your institution should be dismantled. Isn't that correct? Uh, well, I think certain members have. And one member even tweeted, quote, Dis defund and dismantle 
the FBI, end quote. Another told Fox News that, quote, Republicans should defund the bureaucracy, end quote. And a third told the press that he thinks the FBI, quote, needs to be split up and moved out into pieces, end quote. Those are direct quotes and only a small sample of what's out there. Can you briefly describe for us what the effect would be on our national security and on our domestic tranquility if the FBI were to be defunded or dismantled? Well, certainly it would be disastrous for 38,000 hardworking career law enforcement professionals and their families, but more importantly, in many ways, uh, it would hurt our great state and local law enforcement partners who depend on us every day to work with them on a whole slew of challenging threats. It would hurt the American people, neighborhoods and communities all across this country, uh, the people we're protecting from cartels, violent criminals, gang members, predators, uh, foreign and domestic terrorists, cyber attacks, I could go on and on. The people it would help would be those same violent gangs and cartels, uh, foreign terrorists, Chinese spies, hackers, and so forth. A member time, of the, time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Colorado for five minutes. I thank the chairman. Director Ray, thank you. Thank you for your work uh, with the FBI, and, and uh, thank you for your uh, history uh, of work in, in law enforcement. Uh, you started out as a, an AUSA, and I'm getting this information from Wikipedia, the great font of knowledge in the digital age, and so I'm assuming that it's true, but you started out as an AUSA. You uh, were nominated by Republican President Bush for the position of Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division at the Department of Justice, and you were confirmed by a Republican Senate, if I uh, am, am correct in that. Uh, yes, by uh, unanimous voice vote. And, and you were then nominated by Republican President Donald Trump uh, to be the FBI director, and again, confirmed by the Republican Senate uh, uh, for that position. Uh, yes, I think there were only five votes against me, and they were all uh, from Democrats. Um, according to Wikipedia, uh, you're still a registered Republican, and I hope you don't change your party affiliation after this hearing is over. Um, but I want to thank you. Um, I want to thank you for leading an agency, as you mentioned in your opening statement, that protects Americans from foreign terrorists, that uh, an agency that protects Americans from fries from China uh, and Russia, uh, and cybercrime, and public corruption, and organized crime, and drug cartels, and human traffickers, and white collar criminals. And I want to thank you and the FBI for protecting law abiding Americans from the evil that exists all around us. Director Ray, you know this, but it's worth mentioning again anyway. The FBI doesn't protect America because this is a beautiful uh, country. It doesn't protect America just because of the citizens who live in this country. You and the FBI protect America because of the values that we hold, because of our constitutional republic, because this is a special place. And the rest of the world knows just how special this place is. Director Ray, I'm concerned about FISA. I'm not concerned about FISA in a partisan way, and frankly, I am not in favor of defunding the FBI, nor am I in favor of splitting up the FBI, nor am I in favor of using the home and rule for the FBI director. Um, I'm concerned about FISA because I'm concerned about what makes this place special and the threats to us. And I would, I would love to work with the FBI on how we can protect Americans at the same time protecting the civil liberties of Americans. And that area of FISA is what really concerns me. And I know you have gone to great lengths to try to um, work with FBI agents on how they access uh, information under 702. And I know that at times it has been successful and at times it has not been successful. But the, the spirit of FISA in the spirit of our constitutional republic really demands that the FBI culture shift. And it shifts to a place where FBI agents understand that protecting American civil liberties, that protecting the, the privacy that we all enjoy in this country, even though we screw up, we still en enjoy this, this privacy. And in court, we have the highest burden of proof the world has ever known to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt. And that has to be uh, that information has to be gathered by the government in a, legal, uh, in a legal way. And so I fear that we are going to overcorrect on FISA 
in Congress, that we are going to take away some tools that are necessary because there is a trust factor here that's missing. And uh, I'd love to know how we can draw that line in a way that assures the civil liberties. I agree with my colleague from California, and I don't often agree with folks from California, but I agree with my colleague from California that uh, it is essential that we not get geolocation information from the, the what I consider criminals at big tech um, and that we protect that, that uh, information for Americans. Um, you as a law enforcement official should not know where I am necessarily unless you have probable cause to, to get that information. Um, I'm also concerned about the ability of law enforcement and particularly the FBI to access information. When I go on the internet and I search for a gun vault or I search for a holster, I don't want the government to know that I own a gun. And I think I have that privacy right to make sure the government doesn't know that I own a gun or any other uh, information that I search for on the internet unless you've got probable cause to make that search. And so I wanna ask you a, a question in the last few seconds and that is how can you work on the culture in the FBI and help us reach that, that sweet spot on FISA? Well, I thank you for that. Uh, certainly, we, starting with first principles, try to drive home every day to our entire workforce that our mission is to both protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. Uh, and we have, on the issue of FISA, clearly had failures in the past. I've been very plain about that. And we've implemented a whole series of reforms. And if you look, if you look at the reports that have started to come out now from the FISA court, from ODNI, from the Justice Department, from others who have looked at the effect of our reforms, over and over again, they are showing significant improvement in compliance. We're talking about the most recent Fisk, uh, FISA court opinion finding 98% compliance and commending us for moving in the right direction. Uh, DOJ report found 99% compliance. Uh, our internal audit found a 14% jump up to 96%. These are all separate reports looking at the impact of our reforms. A lot of the uh, public commentary about our failures, and let's be clear, we have had problems, and those problems are unacceptable, and I'm determined with my leadership team to fix them, but those problems almost entirely predate those reforms, even though some of them have just come out recently. And so we're gonna keep working at this. That is not a one and done from my perspective. I recognize that we need to work with the Congress on this issue, uh, but this is an incredibly important tool. As you know from your own public service uh, I'm the as a prosecutor as well, this is an incredibly important tool to protect the American people from very serious foreign threats. Time of the gentleman's expired. The gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Director. Um, I want to pick up where Mr. Buck began as well by thanking you for your service, and I'm glad that we have an opportunity for one Democrat, one Republican in close succession to thank you for your service to the country. Um, you are being attacked and vilified by some of the members of this committee and others outside this committee because the Justice Department and the FBI has had the audacity to investigate serious allegations of criminal conduct by a former president. Uh, and I just want a chance to recap uh, how we got to where we are. Uh, during the last administration, and for four years, the Justice Department took the position, uh, not unprecedented for the department, uh, that a former president could not be, a current president could not be indicted. Now, I think that's a flawed matter as a constitutional principle, but nonetheless, that was the view of the Office of Legal Counsel and the Justice Department during the Trump years, that the President of the United States could not be indicted. My Republican colleagues seem to believe that a former president similarly cannot be indicted, uh, that would effectively make a president above the law, beyond the reach of the law. Uh, and in my view, there would probably be only one thing the founders would find more politically uh, precarious and dangerous to our Constitution than the indictment of a president or former president, and that is the failure to indict a president or former president when they have engaged in criminal conduct. Um, the Justice Department, uh, I believe, as uh, Representative Lofgren, uh, my fellow member of the January 6th committee, asserted, took a very long time to begin the investigation of Donald Trump and his involvement in January 6th. I believe it began with urgency when it came to the foot soldiers who broke into the Capitol and assaulted police officers that day. 
But at least what I can tell from the public record, the activities of the president himself, some of which were a matter of very much a public record, uh, such as his tape-recorded conversation with the Secretary of State in Georgia, in which he badgered the secretary to, quote, find 11,780 votes that don't exist. Uh, while that was the subject of investigation by the local district attorney in Fulton County, did not appear to be the subject of investigation for more than a year by the Justice Department. Uh, to me, that is inexplicable. Uh, this was never a ki the kind of case in which you could roll up the foot soldiers on the higher ups because there were multiple lines of effort in this plot to overturn the election. Uh, I do think that the appointment of the special counsel has accelerated the investigation of the former president's misconduct, and I think that is a positive step for the department and for the country so we can get resolution to this. But likewise, with Mar-a-Lago, notwithstanding the protests of my colleagues, there were repeated, repeated requests by the archives to get those documents back uh, from the former president. Uh, and then when those were unsuccessful, there was a grand jury subpoena that was administered. And when that was unsuccessful, and only when that was unsuccessful, and there was evidence that the former president was still withholding highly classified materials, did the FBI go to the step of a search warrant? That was more than a year and a half after those initial requests. This was anything but a rush to judgment in the Mar-a-Lago case. Uh, so I believe the department, if anything, has, has uh, exercised enormous caution, I would say too much caution, in the January 6th commission, uh, committee as work and oversight uh, to proceed uh, against a former president when there are serious and credible allegations of criminal conduct. Um, but I want to thank you for your stewardship during this incredibly difficult time. I don't think there's been a more difficult time for an FBI director. Uh, and notwithstanding concerns I have expressed, None of them go to your integrity uh, or your commitment to the country, and I want to thank you for that. Let me ask you about a different topic, um, although related to January 6th as well. But let me talk, ask you broadly about domestic violent extremism. I uh, offered an amendment in this committee voted down by the Republicans that we should oversee the increasingly dire threat of domestic violent extremism. Um, one of your recent reports underscored the, the rise of this prevalent threat, and I'd ask you if you would address it today. So the rise of domestic violent extremism uh, is something that uh, I and we have been uh, identifying for quite some time. It goes back well before January 6th. In fact, a lot of people don't know this, but the Joint Terrorism Task Forces that we hear about so often at the FBI were largely created in response to domestic terrorism, not foreign terrorism. Uh, but in my first few years uh, as director, we were identifying this issue more and more, and that's why we elevated in the summer of 2019 uh, racially motivated violent extremism to a national threat priority level. Uh, and we saw, I think, about a 40% increase uh, in the number of domestic violent extremism investigations uh, all before anything to do with January 6th. Obviously, since then, it is, has continued. But domestic violent extremism uh, cuts across the spectrum from the racially motivated violent extremism, militia violent extremism, anarchist violent extremism, uh, environmental violent extremism. Uh, and of course, recently, uh, we've had a lot of uh, violent extremism uh, attacks against uh, pro-life facilities, and we're investigating those. So it, it really covers a wide spectrum, and what they all have in common is three things, uh, violence or threats of violence, motivated by some ideology, and it varies, uh, in violation of federal criminal law. And that's the domestic violent extremism, violent extremism that I'm talking about when I've I identified this phenomenon. Mr. Chairman, could I request unanimous consent to enter into the record? Uh, two letters, uh, both from David Weiss, the Trump-appointed U.S. attorney in Delaware, uh, rebutting allegations concerning, impar concern partiality, concerning partiality in the investigation of the Hunter Biden case. Uh, would uh, thank you. Thank you, Director. Without objection. Director, what's the difference between a traditional Catholic and a radical traditional Catholic? Uh, I'm not a, an expert on the, the Catholic uh, orders. 
Well, your FBI wrote a memo talking about radical traditional Catholics. I'm just wondering if you can define it for us. Well, what I can tell you is you're referring to the Richmond product, which was a single product by a single field office, which as soon as I found out about it, I was aghast and ordered it withdrawn and removed from FBI systems. You were aghast, then why won't you let us talk to the people who put it together? We are working on finishing an internal review into what happened We have there. to wait. The, we, the Congress, and the American people have to wait until you do an internal review. It's not a criminal investigation going on here. An internal review before we can talk to the people who wrote this? We, when we finish our internal review, which will be very soon, we will come, come back idea before the Catholics committee in America? and provide a briefing on what we found. Well, we appreciate and the we briefing, can, but we want to talk to the people who wrote it. Any idea how can, many Catholics there are in America, Director? Uh, no, sir. There's a lot, over 60 million. What percentage of those are radical traditional Catholics according to the Richmond field office of the FBI? Again, that product is not something that I will defend or excuse. It's something that I thought was appalling read, and removed it. Let's read from that product, page four of that product. By the way, the copy you gave us, when can we get a copy that didn't have all these redactions on it? So we can actually see what the American taxpayers were paying for to see their rights, their First Amendment religious liberty rights attacked. Let me just read from page four. Provide new opportunities to mitigate extremist threat through outreach to traditional Catholic parishes and the development of sources with the placement and access to report on places of worship. That's pretty fancy language for they're trying to put informants in the parish, in the church. That's what this memorandum said, Director, from one of your field offices. And you won't let us talk to the people who did it. Any response to that? I didn't know. I was waiting for the question. No, priest, do you think priests priest should be informants inside the church, Director? We do not recruit, open, or operate confidential human sources to infiltrate, target, report. But that's not, uh, what, this, that's not what this said. It sounds like you were trying to do it in no, Richmond, Virginia. No, sir. No, sir. No, you sir. weren't? This, this didn't happen? You can assure us that this that, didn't happen? That product did not, to as best as we can tell, result in any investigative action as a result of it. None. You know what the motivation for this was? Why, why would they even think about doing this? You know what the motivation was? Well, again, I think that's what our internal review will find, and I'd rather wait until I hear what the results of that internal review Well, I don't need an are. internal review. I can read the document. I assume you can do the same, because it says right there on the same page. Richmond assesses extremist interest in radical traditional Catholics is like to in likely to increase over the next 12 to 24 months in the run-up to the next general election. Same paragraph, events in which extremists and radical traditional Catholics might have common cause include legislation, judicial decisions in such areas as abortion rights, immigration, affirmative action, and LGBTQ protections. It's politics, that's the motivation. In the run up to the next election and they talk about the border, affirmative action, and, and, and abortion rights, it's total politics. I mean, I, I think it's interesting that affirmative, we just got a decision from a bunch of Catholics who sit on the United States Supreme Court relative to affirmative action. Politics was the total motivation here, and that's what's scary. That's what's, I think, so frightening and why we, why we, how this happens, I don't know. And five people signed off on it. Five people, including the chief division counsel at the Richmond Field Office. I'd like to talk to this lawyer. In, a lot of people in this room went to law school, get a, con, a course on the Constitution, talks about the First Amendment. I find that really scary. Again, when do you think we're gonna have a chance? How soon are you gonna complete this internal investigation so we can talk to these folks who put this together? I expect us to be able to brief uh, the committee on our internal review later this summer. Will that briefing include the names of the individuals who put this document together attacking Americans' First Amendment liberty? I'm not sure yet what it'll include because it's not done yet, but when it is, we'll provide you with an appropriate briefing. What are you doing to fix it so this doesn't happen again? Well, we've already started putting in place a number of fixes, and those will be further informed by the results of the review. What are those fixes? More training, more things, more, you know, it's that same thing you told us on FISA. And while you may have some improvement, you still got 204,000 times the database was illegally searched. So what are the training and procedures you're putting in place? Well, I'll put the FISA stuff to the side. Oh, I'm just using that as an example of where you've that. told us the same thing, you fixed something and you haven't. I do not believe the number that you just invoked on the FISA side is since the reforms, the fixes, as you called them. Can we get uh, an unredacted? Those uh, post-date the numbers that you're referring Director, to. Director, can we get an unredacted copy while you're still doing this internal vest? Can we at least get an unredacted copy of this memorandum? 
I, I will find out if there's more of the, of the document that can be shared with you. We've tried to be very careful in what we redact, and there's always a, a basis for it. So let me go back and see if there's more that we can provide. But I, I know my instructions are to be as sparing as possible in the redactions that we provide. The gentleman from California is recognized. Director, I think it's quite rich that the guy that has accused you of lawlessness and weaponization is 400 days into violation of his own congressional subpoena over January 6th. Quite rich to me that you're hearing all of these allegations from somebody who won't even respond to a lawful subpoena. But I want to talk more about your workforce because that's where you started. A couple weeks ago at the Bureau, you had Family Day. Can you tell us what Family Day is? Uh, Family Day is an opportunity for employees from really all over the FBI. Um, it tends to be primarily from the nearby geographies because of the trip that they have to make to employees to bring their families into FBI headquarters so that they can see a little bit about the place their loved ones work and why mom or dad is spending so much time away from home. You and see any a, little kids at Family Day? Many, many, many. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to say thank you to the families. I mean, we talk a lot uh, in law enforcement about sacrifice, but the reality is that law enforcement officers and professionals are sacrificing to do what they love. Our families are sacrificing because of who they love. And what would you say in your experience is the number one worry of a little kid about a mom or dad who is a special agent out in the field? Obviously, they're worried that their mom or dad won't come home at night because they've been killed. And that, in fact, has happened, unfortunately, all happened too often. Happened in Fort Lauderdale a couple years ago, is that right? Uh, Laura Schwarzenberger and Dan Alfin, uh, two of our agents killed uh, in a connection with a child exploitation case down there. It was the single uh, darkest day I've had in this job. I want to turn your attention to an organization called Marco Polo. It's run by a former Trump aide named Garrett Ziegler. Over the past couple weeks, he has doxxed the addresses of a former special agent connected to the Hunter Biden case. He has put up the dates of birth and pictures of two current special agents who work for you. He has said the name, which I will not say, of an assistant U.S. attorney who worked in the Hunter Biden case, that she will answer for her crimes. He will focus everything on her. Justice will be done. It's out of my hands, but she will answer. Do, do these types of threats and doxing concern you about threats to your workforce and what it could mean? Well, obviously, what we're most concerned about are the actual acts of violence, which themselves have happened, and as we just discussed. But this kind of phenomenon, doxing, um, is itself hugely problematic because the more information, personal information, about uh, law enforcement professionals that are out in the Internet, the more people who may be unstable or inclined to violence there are out there who can choose to act on it. And we're seeing that all too often. The number of officers across law enforcement uh, killed in the line of duty uh, has been up alarmingly over the last few years. And I know that because one of the things I committed to doing uh, early in my tenure was every time an officer anywhere in the country is shot and killed in the line of duty, I was going to personally call that sheriff or that chief and on behalf of the FBI, express our support and condolences uh, and relay that to the family. Um, and I have done that now close to 400 times since I've been in this job. Thank you for doing that. And you don't only do that, you, you send your sacks, your, your special agents in charge to their funerals as well. And I've, I've seen that. Chairman, I've counted in this hearing, and we're only about an hour and a half in, the use of the word laptop about 20 times. In fact, in the chairman's opening statement, he said that he's upset that he believes the FBI prevented more Americans from learning about a private citizen's laptop. That is bananas to me. You all are bringing up FISA every single question. You're essentially saying to the American people that you're guardians of personal security and privacy, but the 2020 election was determined Gentleman, you because the FBI, no, because the FBI didn't let more Americans see a private citizen's non-consensual nudes? Is that what we're saying here? 
that you lost the election not because of your ideas, but because a private citizen's laptop. Do you want an answer? Will was you it yield? out there? Will you that's, yield? That's bananas. Like you, you should be a party of ideas, not a party of non-consensual nudes to help you win an election. Will you and yield it for seems an answer? Like that is what the objection is here today. Didn't we should be talking about the mass shootings that occurred over the last 10 uh, days. Time, Instead, time of the, this yeah. hearing has turned into absolute chaos. Uh, and I yield back. Time of the gentleman's expired. We bring up FISA because it's up for reauthorization, if the gentleman didn't know, at the end of this year. And it was in, the, it was in our witnesses' opening statement. I didn't bring up the laptop. Who's, the whose time are you last, speaking? Whose time are you speaking to, Chairman? The judge last point of order. week on whose July time 4th. Are you speaking? Chairman, point of order. Whose time are you speaking on? Uh, I'm speaking on, I'm not, not a point of order, and I recognize the gentleman from Arizona. Thank, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, thanks for being here. Who is Matthew Graves? Who is Matthew Graves? I, I believe Matthew Graves, at least the, the person I'm thinking of is, the, I think, the U.S. Attorney in the District of Columbia. That's the person I'm thinking of, too. Are you aware that he has promised more than 1,000 more individuals will be charged or indicted related to January 6th? I had not heard that he had said that. Well, it seems arbitrary, and there's reports that it's kind of a quasi-quota system that he's put together for January 6th prosecutions. Do you approve of targets, goals, quotas in prosecuting alleged criminal conduct? Uh, well, certainly not quotas. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, goals is a little bit more of an ambiguous term, but... but certainly not quotas. Certainly not quotas. Uh, it, do you know if any of your personnel at the FBI is involved in the, on the investigations promised uh, that will lead to indictments by um, the January 6th quota established by U.S. Attorney Graves? Uh, that doesn't sound familiar to me. Okay. In June 2021, you told this committee that a small group of people at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th had, quote, all sorts of weapons. Do you remember being here for that committee hearing and testifying that way? Uh, in general, yes. It has been reported that more than 40 FBI personnel agents or contractors were in the crowd on January 6th. Is that number accurate? Uh, I don't know if that number is accurate. Former Capitol Police Chief Stephen Sun reported, uh, uh, reportedly has asserted that the protest crowd was filled with federal agents. Um, are you aware of his assertion? I am not. Um, would you agree with him that it was filled with federal agents on January 6th? I, I would really have to see more closely exactly what he said and get the full context to be able to evaluate it. How many agents were actually, uh, agents or uh, human resources were present in the Capitol complex and vicinity on January 6th? Well, again, it's going to get confusing because it depends on when we, we deployed and responded to the breach uh, that occurred. How, how, Obviously, how many, there were, how many there were, were under federal agents. Sure. Uh, you know, yeah, you're talking, you, 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 and you and I both know what we're talking different things here. And, and I, please don't, don't distract here because we're focusing on the, those who were there in an undercover capacity on January 6th. How many were there? Uh, again, I, I'm not sure that I can give you that number as I sit here. I'm not sure there were undercover agents uh, on scene. You, I'm, I find that kind of a remarkable statement, Director. At this point, you don't know whether there were un undercover federal agents, FBI agents, in the crowd or in the Capitol on January 6th. I say that because I want to be very careful. There have been a number of court filings related to some of these topics, and I want to make sure that I stick with him what's in the I, I understand that. But I, I just, I thought I heard you say you didn't know whether there were FBI agents or informants or human sources in the Capitol or in the in vicinity on January 6th. Did I misunderstand you? I thought that's what you said. I, well, I referred very specifically to undercover agents. Yeah. And so are you acknowledging then there were undercover agents? I, I, as I sit here right now, I do not believe there were undercover agents uh, on scene. Were any FBI assets? Agents. Did you have any uh, assets present that day uh, in the crowd? When it comes to what you're calling assets or what we would call confidential human sources, sure. uh, that's a place where, again, I want to be careful, much as I said in response to an earlier question, uh, there are court filings that I think speak to this that I'm happy to make sure we get uh, to you, assuming they're not under seal. Um, and that can better answer the question than I can as I sit here right now. In the same January, or excuse me, June 2021 committee hearing, you told us that the FISA court, quote, approved FBI procedures, 
minimization procedures, collection and procedures, querying procedures, did not find misconduct, close quote. That's what you said. Um, specifically, you said the FISC found no misconduct. Yet three months later, the Inspector General found widespread problems in FBI's FISA applications, raising serious questions about the FBI review process of applications, including hundreds of examples of noncompliance with Woods procedures, for example. And we know that from December 2020 to November 2021, the FBI conducted 3.4 million warrantless searches of U.S. data under FISA. 3.4 million. Up nearly triple the amount of the previous year, and it got worse as you were telling us there was nothing to worry about. But now your reforms have produced about 100, uh, reduced it down to 119,000, over 200,000 total, but 119,000 discrete Americans. That just doesn't seem like you've accomplished much there if you have 119,000 illegal searches and queries under FISA. I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The House Judiciary Committee is responsible for helping to ensure the rule of law. Unfortunately, this chairman ignored a bipartisan congressional subpoena served upon him. The actions of this chairman have undermined the credibility of all congressional committees in seeking information from witnesses and have undermined the rule of law. Now, Director Ray, thank you for your public service and for the service of the brave FBI agents. I'm gonna ask you a series of basic questions to get facts out to the American people about our system of justice. Trump advisor Roger Stone was convicted in a federal court, correct? Uh, that's my recollection. Trump donor Elliot Brady was convicted in a federal court, correct? Uh, also my recollection. The attorney general at the time for those two convictions was Bill Barr. Which president nominated Bill Barr for attorney general? Uh, president Trump. Trump's former lawyer, Michael Cohen, was convicted on two separate occasions in a federal court, correct? I believe that's correct. The attorney general at the time for Cohen's second conviction was Matthew Whitaker. Which president appointed Matthew Whitaker as acting attorney general? Uh, president Trump. Okay. Trump's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, was convicted in a federal court, correct? Yes. Trump's former deputy campaign manager, Mr. Gates was convicted in a federal court, correct? That's my recollection. Trump's campaign foreign policy advisor, George Papadopoulos, was convicted in a federal court, correct? Uh, yes, I think he, yeah, he pled guilty, yes. The attorney general at the time of those three cases was Jeff Sessions. Which president nominated Jeff Sessions for attorney general? President Trump. You were the FBI director for all of those cases at the time. Which president nominated you? President Trump. What these facts show is we don't have a two-tiered system of justice. We have one Department of Justice that goes after criminals regardless of party ideology. All of these folks were convicted under the administrations of three separate Republican attorneys general. It is not the fault of the FBI that Donald Trump surrounded himself with criminals. Donald Trump brought that upon himself. Thank you to the FBI for exposing the cesspool of corruption of these Trump associates. Now, I'd like to talk about efforts by MAGA Republicans to defund the FBI. I think it'd be useful for the FBI to explain to American people what your missions are and how critical they are. So again, a series of basic questions. The FBI's mission includes counterterrorism, correct? Yes. And that means the FBI works to stop terrorist attacks on American soil, right? Yes. Okay. The FBI's mission also includes counterintelligence, correct? Yes. And that means the FBI works to stop espionage of American companies and organizations, is that right? Yes. Okay. The FBI's mission includes stopping cybercrime, right? Correct. The FBI's mission includes stopping public corruption, right? Correct. The FBI's mission includes stopping weapons of mass destruction from being detonated on American soil, right? Oh, yes, we work with others on it, but yes. The FBI, FBI's mission includes going after organized crime, right? Yes. You go after violent crime, correct? Yes. You also go after white collar crime, right? Yes. The FBI's mission also includes going after child sex trafficking, correct? Yes. Okay. Republican members of their caucus, including members on this committee, have asked to defund the FBI. One member of this committee from Arizona wrote that the FBI, quote, 
should be defunded and dismantled. What would happen if the FBI was defunded and dismantled? We would have hundreds more violent criminals out on the street, dozens more violent gangs terrorizing communities, uh, hundreds more child predators on the loose, uh, hundreds more kids left at those predators' mercy instead of being rescued, uh, scores of threats from the Chinese Communist Party being left unaddressed, uh, hundreds of ransomware attacks uh, left unmitigated, uh, terrorist attacks both jihadist-inspired and domestic violent extremists um, not prevented that would succeed against Americans. Uh, single seizures of fentanyl, it is not uncommon right now for a single FBI office in a single operation to seize enough fentanyl to wipe out an entire state. So many, 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 many more of those lethal doses would be sweeping the country. Uh, we have close to 400, I think it is somewhere between 300 and 400 investigations into the leadership of the cartels trafficking that fentanyl. So you would have a significantly greater threat from the southwest border from the cartels. So those are just a few things that would happen. Ultimately, the people most hurt by some um, ill-conceived effort to defund our agency, the people most hurt are the American people uh, that live in every district represented on this committee. Thank you, Director Ray, FBI agents for gentleman protecting Americans. Gentleman from um, California, Mr. Kiley is recognized. Good morning, Director Ray. I'd like to take you back to 2021. Uh, in many parts of the country, schools remain closed month after month for no good reason. Uh, once schools did nominally open, Many instituted draconian testing and quarantine regimes, uh, such as one student is possibly exposed to COVID, everyone goes home for the week. Children as young as toddlers were subjected to harmful mask mandates that defied international norms. The way some students were treated truly shocks the conscience. Just consider a few examples from my own state of California. A school district in Davis sent an email to parents announcing that their children will be required to eat outside in the rain to reduce exposure to COVID. A school in Sonoma County made young children chew with their masks on, explaining this was to minimize the time spent unmasked. Some schools in Los Angeles limited students to one bathroom break per day and barred them from drinking water outside of the lunch period. A school in the San Ramon Valley made students eat lunch on the ground. In October of that year, the American Academy of Pediatrics would declare a national state of emergency in children's mental health citing dramatic increases in emergency department visits for all mental health emergencies, included, including suspected suicide attempts. In the face of this, Director, the Biden administration decided to take action. It mobilized the sweeping powers of federal law enforcement. But it wasn't to spare kids from such cruelty. Rather, it was to target the parents who were speaking out against it. The administration coordinated with the National School Board Association on a letter that began with the alarming claim, America's public schools and its education leaders are under an immediate threat. The letter cited a handful of news stories, almost all of which involved purely expressive activity by parents at school board meetings, and called such activity a form of domestic terrorism. The letter called for the full counterterrorism and law enforcement powers of the federal government, including authority granted under the Patriot Act, to be mobilized to investigate, intercept, and prevent such activity. The Biden administration was ready to take this letter and run with it the moment it was received. After all, administration officials had participated in its drafting. Within five days of receiving it, Attorney General Merrick Garland fired off his infamous memo directing federal action in response to a, quote, disturbing spike in harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence against school administrators, board members, teachers, and staff. In response, the FBI opened 25 assessments against parents and even created a new threat tag. Director Ray, did uh, Attorney General Garland consult with you or the FBI before issuing that memorandum? Uh, I, I can't get into discussions that did or maybe more importantly did not happen between the FBI and the department in advance of the... Why do you say more importantly did not? Well, because I will say to you the same thing that I said to all 56 of our field offices as soon as I read the memo, which is that the FBI is not in the business of investigating or policing speech at school board meetings or anywhere else for that matter, and we're not going to start now. Uh, now, violence, threats of violence, that's a different matter. We're going to work with our Correct. state. So that's what the memo was that. predicated on. And what I'm asking you, was there any evidence that you provided 
to Attorney General Garland that supported that predicate, that premise that there was an increase in harassment and threats of violence? I'm not aware of any such evidence, but I know that we've had a number of, uh, of our folks who have been up here for transcribed interviews. Mm -hmm. um, so unless some of them shared it, I'm not aware of any of that. Well, actually, what they've shared with us points to just the, the opposite. Uh, you had, uh, for example, uh, a letter from uh, Christopher uh, Dunham, acting assistant director in March of this year, where the FBI acknowledged that it has not observed an uptick of threats directed at school officials <coughs> since it began tracking, tracking the data. Does that sound accurate to you? Yes, sir. And is it also true that according to the FBI itself, none of the school board related investigations have resulted in federal arrests or charges? I think that's correct. I think uh, of the 25, uh, and for context, you know, that's 25 um, tips. I'm sorry, I have limited guardians. time, so yeah. if that's but, correct, I'd like to move on. This committee's investigation concluded that the Justice Department's own documents demonstrate that there was no compelling nationwide law enforcement justification for the Attorney General's directive. Do you have any reason to dispute that conclusion? Uh, no. So we had an investigation of parents. We had a sweeping mobilization of federal power against the most protected core First Amendment activity, the right of citizens to speak and petition their government on the most important of issues, the education of their children. And you are telling me that the entire basis for that, there was no evidence to support it. Well, I, I want to be clear. We, the FBI, as I said, were not and did not investigate people for exercising. Should Attorney General Garland rights. rescind the memo? I'm sorry? Should Attorney General Garland rescind that memo? Oh, that's a question for the Attorney General. Do you believe he should? Again, I'm, that's a question for the Attorney General. Do you, would you, do you believe that the Attorney General should apologize to parents who are the subject of that memo? I'm not going to speak to that. Will you apologize for the FBI's own role? I think the FBI conducted itself uh, the way it should here, which is that we've considered to continued to follow our longstanding rules and have not changed anything in response to that memo. Time um, the gentleman has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for your service to the country. Um, I do want to focus on some areas of concern around American civil liberties that I have, lo have had longstanding concerns about. In testimony to Senate Intelligence in March, you stated that the FBI had previously purchased commercial database information that includes location data derived from internet advertising, but that to your knowledge, the FBI does not currently purchase data. But just last month, the ODNI declassified a report revealing that the FBI and other agencies do purchase significant amounts of commercially available information about Americans from data brokers. And the report notes that commercially available information, quote, has increasingly important risks and implications for U.S. persons' privacy and civil liberties as commercially available information can reveal sensitive and intimate information about individuals. It is public information that the FBI uses Babel Street and Vent, uh, Ventel and has a Lexus account. All of these companies provide data for purchase. Can you tell me how the FBI uses that data? Uh, respectfully, this is a topic that gets very involved to explain. Uh, and so I, what I would prefer to do is have our subject matter experts come back up and brief you and they can answer your questions in detail about it because there's a lot of confusion uh, that can be unintentionally caused about this topic. Um, but, but does the I, FBI my testimony, purchase data? My testimony that you referred to before remains the same, and the, uh, the story about the ODNI report doesn't change that. But again, there's, there's a lot of precision and technical dimensions to this. Well, I, I do um, appreciate that, but I, I'm looking at a report that is from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence saying that. that the FBI purchases data. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent uh, to objection. enter this into the record. Objection. Um, do you know if the contracts with data brokers, like the ones I described, uh, provide location data? My testimony about purchasing commercial database information that includes location data derived from internet advertising remains the same, which is that we currently do not do that. But the, but the information that you have that has already been purchased, does it contain location Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be obtuse or difficult here. I just know from experience that the more you drill into this whole issue of commercial data, 
geolocation data, et cetera, that it, it gets very involved. In some I, cases, it involves uh, pilot projects that are in the past. In some cases, it involves uh, national Director security Ray, information, I, I, et cetera. I do understand so I just want to make that sure that we get you the information okay, you need. That's great. I, I will take that, but I do want to say that this is just an extremely important issue for the American people to understand how their data is being used. That is location data. That is uh, biometric information. It's medical and mental health information. It's information related to individuals' communications. It's information about people's internet activity. And while I understand that that's complicated, that is the reason that you come before us so that the American people can hear this. Let me ask you this, does the FBI have a written policy outlining how it can purchase and use commercially available information? Uh, there are a number of policies that bear on this topic. Again, that could be part of the same briefing that we're happy to provide. I don't dispute at all that this is an important topic. I'm simply saying that precisely because it's such an important topic that uh, a minute and 12 seconds counting down is not the no, best way I, to I understand to that, but, but I'm asking whether there is a policy. It sounds like there is a policy. When yeah. was that policy last updated? Uh, that I can't, as I sit here right now, I don't have the answer for you on that. But again, there are a number of policies that are relevant to this, and so that may affect the... And you'll commit to providing those to us so that we can, we can explore them too. I, I would commit to providing you a briefing that will provide uh, hopefully very helpful information to help you understand better this whole topic. What about a written policy governing how commercially available information can be used in criminal investigations? I think it's all wrapped up in the same answer I just gave. I mean, the reason that this is so important is because uh, the question is whether the FBI uses that data to generate leads for investigations only or further along in the investigative process. There's public reporting on DHS contracts with the same data brokers that I mentioned earlier toting, totaling millions of taxpayer dollars. And as you know, in the 2018 Supreme Court decision in Carpenter versus the United States, the court held that it is a violation of the Fourth Amendment for the government to access historical location data without a warrant. Does the FBI have a written policy interpreting the Supreme Court's decision in Carpenter? Uh, I, if I recall correctly, there was guidance, I can't remember if it's a policy or, or what, that came out after the Carpenter decision. Uh, but again, I think that'll be encompassed in the briefing that we're talking well, about. Well, I'm going to follow up with you. I want to thank you again for your service. This is a critically important issue for the American people to understand. We have bipartisan support. Uh, around FISA reauthorization and the concerns we have around FISA reauthorization. And unless we really understand what measures the FBI is taking to ensure that people's privacy is protected, uh, I think it's going to be a very difficult uh, reauthorization process. I'm sure you know that. Thank you, Director Ray. I yield back. General Lady yields back, and uh, I would just say, well said. Uh, appreciate your work with colleagues, bipartisan area in, 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 in a bipartisan approach in this area, and you have friends over here who want to help you on that. We now go to the gentleman from, uh, I know, Director, we, if we can go just a couple more, then we'll take a little break, if that works for the director. A couple more on each side, then we can take a break. Okay. I think. Okay. All right, we'll go. I think it's Mr. Morris is up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, thank you for being here today. In 2022, you testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee and stated, quote, I condemn in the strongest possible terms any prospect of retaliation against whistleblowers, end quote. Do you still agree with that statement? Yes. Do you feel that your actions as the FBI leadership during your tenure live up to that sentiment? Yes. Director Ray, a few months ago, we heard from, uh, are, you, are you familiar with a special agent, uh, Garrett O'Boyle? I'm familiar with the name. After Mr. O'Boyle came to Congress and, and blew the whistle on the misconduct at the Bureau, his clearance was unsurprisingly suspended. Does, did that surprise you? Do you find that suspicious? Uh, I, I can't discuss a specific security clearance matter, uh, partly because the, uh, the security clearance determinations uh, are made by, by ODI directed by the security clearance manager, which is not the FBI director. Um, and I don't want to insert myself into the process while appeals are pending, for example. Well, as a leader, I think it's important. You, you, we need to have the opportunity, and you know by law, they, they have the opportunity to be whistleblowers and talk to Congress and inform us on issues. And I think to restore trust in the FBI, it's imperative on you to allow whistleblowers to come forward. And for us to have the oversight we need to have to make sure, I mean, we're seeing the polling numbers. The FBI is tanking, and, and it's, it's under your watch, sir. And, and, and it concerns me for the American people. When I'm in the district, the number one concern, and I come from a fairly rural district, 
is weaponization of the FBI and the DOJ coming after conservative American citizens who just simply want to have a voice in the process. And so I would encourage you, uh, Mr. O'Boyle, I understand he has been suspended since September of 23, almost 10 months now, 2022. He was suspended in 2022. So almost a year now, the man's trying to go without a paycheck. I don't know. Could you make it 10 months without a paycheck, Mr. Ray? <laughs> I prefer not According to have to. What, yeah, well, you, you're talking about your wife not being real happy, but yeah, taking a pay cut. Well, can you imagine 10 months later, and, and you're still going through a process for just a whistleblower coming to, the, coming to the Congress and trying to inform us on issues he sees within the FBI. I think we could help you in the process if you would allow us. But in some ways, we have to look at this whistleblower and other whistleblowers and encourage them to come forward and be truthful with the American people. Two real quick questions. Why would the FBI offer Christopher Steele a million dollars to verify a dossier about Trump Russian collusion. And then the same FBI offered three million dollars to Twitter to squash a story on the Hunter Biden laptop. Do you have any idea why a law enforcement agency would be planning into elections? Well, I, you raised a number of different issues there. So first, uh, as to the Steele dossier, that, of course, is a subject treated at great length uh, in the Durham report, which we, and again, predates my time as director. I understand that, but it was the we, same agency uh, paying a million dollars to push one story out or try to col collaborate one story and three million dollars to quiet another story for political opponents. I so, don't quite understand. And, and then I would, uh, as to the second part related to Twitter, I would, I would disagree with your characterization respectfully. When there are payments to social media companies, that is by longstanding federal law going back, I think, about four decades, where we have to pay companies for uh, their costs in responding to legal process. And it's not just social media companies, it's other kinds of businesses as well. Well, when those stories get out, and you understand, and certainly the dossier story, and I know that wasn't under your watch, but also the, the, the Hunter Biden laptop story, that to me looks political. To the American people, it looks political. And I'm just an everyday guy. I'm not an attorney, Mr. Ray, just an everyday guy. But to me, it looks extremely political, and that is why you're having trouble keeping the FBI's reputation afloat. And so with that, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield the balance of my time, but I do I want to enter one thing to the record, Mr. Well, Chairman. Can you do that after we just yield, then we'll enter it in the record after. Sure, sure. Uh, Director Ray, did the FBI ask financial institutions to turn over their customers? You yield the time to me. Did the FBI ask financial institutions to turn over their customers' debit and credit card purchase history in the Washington, D.C. area for January 5th and 6th, 2021? Uh, I don't know the answer to that as I sit here right now. Well, we do, because Bank of America gave us this email from the FBI to Bank of America. Well, I am aware that Bank of America provided information to the FBI, but what communications occurred between the FBI and Bank of America about it? Well, let's read it. To recap our morning call, are you, we are prepared to action the following threshold. Customers transacting debit card, credit card, Washington, D.C. purchases between 1521 1621. That's scary enough. But then the next bullet point's even more scary. Any, any historical, capital letters, all capitals, any historical purchase of a firearm. You guys asked financial, it's at least Bank of America, we think more. Did you guys ask him? Again, I don't have the full sequence of the back and forth. You've got one, looks like you've got one email that I haven't seen before here. Um, so I don't know that I have the full exchange that this well, is. Well, does this email trouble of... you as much as it does members of the Judiciary Committee that the FBI is asking for every single, I mean, we had members of Congress here that week, first time they're getting sworn in as a new member of Congress, their family in town, and you're sweeping, and they may happen to be a customer of Bank of America, and you're sweeping up every debit and credit card purchase of their family who were in town that week because they're, their husband or their dad or their mom is getting sworn as a new member of Congress? And then you're also saying, overlaying that information with, did, you, did this person buy a firearm? And the question is? I'm just nervous about that. Are you nervous about that? As, as I think I've testified before, my understanding is that our engagement with Bank of America uh, was fully lawful, but that we recalled the leads that were cut to field well, If it's offices. lawful, that's, that was my next point. If it's yeah. lawful, why did you say we're not going to use these leads? That's what Mr. Jensen testified to when we deposed him, the director of the terrorism unit at, at, at the FBI. That's what he testified to. Why did, you, why did you not use the leads if it was lawful to get the information? Well, there are Chairman, plenty of... Chairman, it's one minute and 18 seconds over time. There, there are... 
Sir, there are plenty of times where there are things that we lawfully can do, but that we decide is better that we not do. And yeah. I think that's what the happened. The idea there. that Mr. Massey said earlier, that, I, that this is lawful, that you can ask this is scary. This is something else we're gonna have to change. Uh, with that, I would yield to the gentlelady from, recognize the gentlelady from, excuse me, for, uh, well, we got a unanimous consent request from Mr. Moore. Mr. Chairman, yes, the Wall Street Journal article I'd like to enter into the record says, Republicans eye sweet home for new FBI headquarters in Alabama. All right, uh, without objection, uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady for Texas for five minutes and then we'll take a break, uh, break uh, direct. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, thank you very much, Director Ray, for your presence here. Thank you to the men and women of the FBI in particular for the work that you've done on gun violence uh, and as well uh, the work that you've done in keeping Americans safe. Let me very quickly uh, move on some issues that have been made a chief part of the work of our friends on the other side of the aisle, Republican members of this committee have spent much time uh, of this Congress claiming that various aspects of the U.S. government have been weaponized against the American people. Director Ray, are you or your staff or auxiliaries weaponizing the FBI against the American people? Absolutely not. Thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, thank you as well for your civil rights work and uh, emphasize that in addition there have been representations that the FBI exaggerates domestic terrorism reports or data. Uh, certainly, uh, January 6th had its many different storytellers, but that was an act of domestic terrorism. I don't know how you could have exaggerated that as evidenced by the special congressional committee we had. But let's just think of domestic terrorism as it relates to the good men and women of our law enforcement. Take an example in February 2020 in Texas, uh, where a uh, white supremacist uh, was uh, engaged in conspiracy involving swatting, a harassment tactic, and all of the emergency services showed up over and over again. Does domestic terrorism impact negatively and dangerously on America's law enforcement and first responders? Uh, absolutely, and sometimes law enforcement are themselves the uh, intended victims uh, or targets of domestic violent extremism. Though you have uh, good, uh, committed individuals, does the uh, critique is legitimate? That's our job. But does the constant condemnation uh, impact on morale of FBI personnel or those trying to um, join the FBI? Well, look, our people are human beings, and nobody likes to see the organization they've dedicated their careers, really their lives to, unfairly criticized. But I will tell you, as I said in my opening statement, that the good news is our people are also tough and resilient. Uh, our attrition is in the low single digits and would be the envy of almost any employer, and our recruiting, unlike what's happening in law enforcement more Great generally, news. is actually up very significantly. Thank you, and I look forward to it being diverse. Let me start with our whistleblower uh, journey here. Are you familiar with FBI Special Agents Kyle um, Serpin? Uh, I'm familiar with the name. Is that yes? I'm familiar with the name. Yeah. The committee heard testimony that Mr. Serpin was suspended after he mishandled his service weapon and then said he wanted to use two female FBI executives as shooting or targets. Uh, that was testimony of Jennifer Moore, HR, uh, under human resources, under oath from the FBI. Mr. Serapin describes himself as a congressional whistleblower, but committee Republicans will not tell us whether he has been in contact with them. Are you familiar with former FBI agents uh, Garrett O'Boyle and Marcus Allen? Again, I'm familiar with the names. Thank you. O'Boyle was suspended for assessing information about an ongoing case and then leaking to the press, and Allen was suspended for interfering in the investigation of a January 6th suspect. Both Allen and O'Boyle testified before the Weaponization Committee in May. Were you aware of that? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I think uh, they are clearly there for all friends and family to see. I assume they wanted to be seen. Um, do you know who Cash Patel is, if you know? Uh, yes, I know who he is. He's an aide to President Trump, isn't he? Or was an aide? Or is an aide to President Trump? Well, uh, he, he was uh, an individual who served in a number of different roles, both up here on Thank the Hill you. and in the executive branch. Thank you. Here's another picture. It's the checks that Serapin sent to both O'Boyle and Allen. Each check was for $255,194. Let me say that again. These men were paid $255,194 after they testified as so-called whistleblowers. And it should be noted 
uh, that it says here, as it says, for holding the line. Director, at the time that Serpin and Patel gave Garrett O'Boyle and Marcus Allen these checks, do you happen to know if they were still employees of the FBI? I can't speak to that. I don't know the answer. If they were, 5 CFR 22635, and I'd appreciate if we could get an answer in writing after you go back, whether they were or not, prohibits FBI employees from accepting cash gifts, doesn't it? Well, there are a whole number of rules that would apply to this. Uh, again, I don't want to weigh in on a specific person. But if they were, uh, that rule applies about cash gifts. I'm not aware of a situation in which they could no, appropriately just, accept just cash generally, gifts. Just generally, if, oh. if that applies to FBI agents about not taking cash gifts, is that correct? There are, there are definitely rules that apply to special thank, agents thank accepting you, cash gifts. Let me just finish this. Can you explain why an FBI agent should not receive cash? But let me uh, move to uh, one that I think is ex extremely important. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, just a moment. And here is what I think is most interesting piece of this whole puzzle. O'Boyle and Allen are represented by an outfit called Empower Oversight. Time's Empower expired. Oversight is run by former Republican staffers. Do you know who else Empower Oversight might represent? I in any not. way, Mr. Chairman, I have a unanimous consent request. Uh, let me just. Uh, General time expired. Uh, thank you so very much. Respond. Thank you. Um, the so-called IRS uh, whistleblower who Jim Jordan had uh, relied upon. But does anyone need any further proof that these allegations are ginned up, corrupt political stunts advanced by those who don't want to see us follow the law? Finally, Mr. Chairman, here's another person who wants to join you on the 702, but the FBI has begun major reforms, and I think we should recognize that. You've been very kind. I yield back my time. Gentlelady yields back. Uh, I would just point out my guess is they, they, they got the money because they wanted the money because they had to try to, they were trying to feed their family. They actually uh, haven't received the money. I have unanimous consent request, Mr. Chairman, of a tweet Matthew Foldy uh, put out here during this hearing. Right off the bat, Jerry Nadler lies about whistleblower getting 250000 He says here, Marcus Allen has not received $250,000. He has not received or cashed the check that Kyle Serafin posted online. Enter that in the record. Into the record. We, the committee will take a five-minute recess. Five minutes. Five minutes. Then we'll come back.
pretty sure I have to stay here the entire year. Like, yeah, I know. That's why I'm like, I think I'm getting lunch. Yeah.
you tell. I'm oh, Klein, that's right. Then Klein, then, then McClintock. Committee will come back to order. The um, uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, uh, thank you for being here. Since we last spoke in appropriations on April 27th, uh, Special Counsel John Durham delivered his report de detailing in intelligence activities and investigations arising out of the 26 pres 2016 presidential campaign. Uh, when Mr. Durham presented here at the committee, I asked him these questions. He was able to answer me in yes or no answers. I'd ask you to do the same. Did the FBI have an adequate basis on which to launch Crossfire Hurricane? Uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, Mr. Durham found that it did not have a proper basis to uh, elevate it to a full investigation, but that he thought it was a, an assessment or a preliminary inquiry was appropriate. Did the FBI fail to examine all available exculpatory evidence? Uh, I think, well, do you say to examine it? Um, certainly, I think there were failures, significant failures, with respect to exculpatory information. Did the FBI interview all key witnesses in Crossfire Hurricane? Uh, uh, I think Mr. Durham, I think, found uh, that they did not. Did the FBI abuse its authority under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act? Well, certainly there were violations that were totally unacceptable uh, and, in my view, uh, cannot be allowed to happen again. As noted in the report, Crossfire Hurricane investigators had hoped the returns on the Carter Page FISA application would, quote, self-corroborate. Do FBI or DOJ guidelines permit investigators to submit uncorroborated allegations in a FISA application in the hopes that the returns will self-corroborate? I've never heard of that concept. Okay. Is, Cro is Crossfire Hurricane the only time the FBI has violated the procedures for the F FISA process? Uh, well, there are a lot of different pr procedures, but, but that's certainly not the only compliance incidents that we've had with respect to FISA. Uh, Director, as, as I expressed to you upstairs, the American people are outraged, and just this week I had at a town hall uh, constituents expressing outrage uh, about the actions of those within your agency uh, who have damaged the FBI's reputation and uh, undermined the work, the good work, of uh, the vast majority of hardworking men and women within your agency. But going down the list, uh, you have the Biden family investigations, you have the anti-Catholic memo. By the way, you mentioned five individuals who contributed to the anti-Catholic memo in the Richmond field office. Are they still employed by the FBI? I don't think I mentioned any specific individuals. I did say that this was a product by a single field office um, mm -hmm. that we took action on immediately and we have a, an inspection uh, that's underway right now that's looking at how this happened and how we make sure it doesn't happen again. So it's still possible that uh, individuals will uh, be fired as a result of your review? Well, I don't want to, I don't want to pre predetermine or forecast where the in review will go. We're going to look at everything from exactly how it happened and what went wrong, and then but if it's there possible. are appropriate steps to be taken, we will take whatever the appropriate steps are. Okay. You have the violence against pro-life clinics. You have the investigation of parents speaking at school board meetings. You have the collusion with big tech. The FISA abuses of Section 702 is where I want to focus right now. Uh, as you know, Section 702 authorizes warrantless surveillance. It's supposed to be targeted toward foreigners abroad, but the surveillance sweeps in a large amount of Americans' communications, and the FBI routinely runs searches of Section 702 data looking for phone calls, emails, text messages of Americans, so-called backdoor searches. Uh, depending on the year, FBI has conducted anywhere from 3.4 million in 2021 to 200,000 in 2022. Uh, given this fact, do you honestly think it's fair to continue describing Section 702 as an authority targeted only at foreigners abroad? I do. It looks like a framework that enables the FBI to spy on countless Americans. Would you agree with that assessment? Well, I, I can't speak to what it looks like to certain people. I can tell you that it is an authority focused on foreigners overseas in the context of national security investigations. I would add to that that the FBI's piece of that, the FBI only accesses, so everything we're talking about FBI related only goes to about 3% of the entire 702 collection. And then within that 3%, this is important. Okay, I have it's important that people so. understand this. The FBI ends up only accessing content in like one and a half percent of that. So it, I understand. a little context is appropriate. Well, if you're conducting hundreds of thousands or even just hundreds of warrantless searches of Section 702 data for Americans' communications, it's clearly a domestic surveillance <laughs> tool. 
and I would argue that uh, I believe it, it, it does uh, pose a real problem within the FBI's conduct toward Americans, and, and I speak for many when I say I think it poses a real problem for the reauthorization of FISA authority for your organization. So with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Director Ray, for being here. Uh, I am troubled by many of the statements and questions we've heard today that embrace conspiracy theories and disinformation. And with these comments, it appears that some of my colleagues are trying to sow division and score political points rather than conduct legitimate oversight of the actual actions and policies of the FBI. I, like many Americans, would rather Congress focus on doing the people's business and ensuring that the FBI is able to do its job and do it well within the bounds of our Constitution and laws. Now, one of the most serious issues facing American communities now is drug abuse, particularly opioids and fentanyl. And in your opening remarks, you mentioned the arrest of 31 U.S. citizens in Northeast Ohio just a couple weeks ago, most hailing from Marion, for drug trafficking. Um, can you just take a minute, because I have some other questions, to describe what the FBI is doing to end the scourge of fentanyl and what additional tools you might need from Congress? So the FBI is attacking the scourge uh, of fentanyl coming from the southwest border uh, in particular uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, one, we are uh, t using our organized crime task forces to target the supply, the cartels in particular. Uh, Two, we're using our Safe Streets Task Forces to go after the gangs uh, that are principally responsible, violent gangs, for distributing a lot of this all over our streets. Uh, third, we're targeting uh, provider abuse, prescription, uh, you know, pill mills and things like that through our healthcare fraud authorities. Uh, fourth, uh, we have something called J-Code, which focuses on the trafficking of fentanyl on the dark web, which is a real problem, and we've had a number of very significant takedowns there. Uh, we're also doing things like engaging in outreach, raising awareness. Uh, we put out a video called Chasing the Dragon with DEA that uh, has been shown at a lot of schools around the country. Uh, we're trying to work with uh, the, the uh, health community. So there's a lot of things that we're doing, but this is a, you know, it's an epidemic. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's an overstatement, and it's something that requires all hands on deck. Okay, and if there are things you think Congress can help you with, please submit that to us afterwards. Um, another major threat to our nation is domestic terrorism, and that's something you've spoken about repeatedly. Um, like many Americans, I find it unpatriotic and dangerous when members of Congress embrace dangerous conspiracy theories that undermine our federal law enforcement and ultimately our democracy. And I find it disingenuous for members of Congress to harangue the head of the FBI about people losing faith in the FBI when those same members have been trumpeting lies and conspiracy theories about the agency for months. Words matter, they have consequences. And when leaders lie or embrace disinformation, that's dangerous. In recent years, we've seen increasing threats and violence levied against public servants at all levels, including journalists, elected officials, election workers, doctors, nurses, school officials, teachers, librarians, and more. And what these public servants have in common is they became targets for threats and violence when they had the guts to stand up to lies and conspiracy theories promulgated by the former president and his allies. We've seen MAGA extremists, Fox News pundits, Russian internet trolls, and elected officials parrot conspiracy theories and use heated language to convince the American public without facts that dedicated public servants are dangerous enemies who should be feared. Most Americans understand that this is not legitimate political discourse and that this kind of overheated and fact-free rhetoric can in fact encourage political violence. It's not normal and it should not be part of American public life. So, Director Ray, you've repeatedly testified about the serious threat that domestic violence extremists present to Americans. And these are people who commit violent and criminal acts in furtherance of social or political goals, whether racial and ethnic motivation or anti-government motivation. Um, can you talk about the role that mistrust in government and disinformation and conspiracy theories play in the radicalization and recruitment of extremists? Well, uh, certainly there's a whole host uh, of um, misconceptions that are out there about any number of institutions, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's the Supreme Court, whether it's any number of other institutions, 
uh, that uh, in the environment that we're in, where there are people who increasingly uh, channel their rage into violence, uh, that causes a problem. You know, the, there is a right way under the First Amendment to express what you're angry about and who you're angry with, and we take that very seriously uh, and view as part of our mission, not just to protect the American people, but to uphold the Constitution. But when those uh, views are then turned into violence and threats of violence, then we got a problem, and then I think the FBI has to act. Thank you. I see my time has expired, but I would seek unanimous consent to introduce into the record a press release from the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Northern District of Ohio entitled 31 Individuals Involved in a Drug Trafficking Organization in Marion County and Lorain County Indicted. No objection. Chair Thank recognizes you. the gentleman from California. Uh, th thank you. Mr. Director, when we uh, abandoned um, uh, Afghanistan, uh, uh, we released about 5,000 uh, terrorists from the Parowan Detention Facility. Uh, one of those terrorists showed up at Abbey Gate 10 days later and killed 13 U.S. Marines. Where are the other 5,000? Uh, I don't know that I can tell you where all 5,000 are. Well, let me are. put it sim more simply. Have you encountered any here in the United States? Uh, we have a, quite a few ongoing investigations uh, into um, uh, foreign terrorist-related subjects, um, whether they're al-Qaeda-related or ISIS-related, uh, that we're conducting as, as you and I are having this conversation. And certainly... So have you encountered any from Parowan here in the United States? Specifically, I'm not sure I can say that. Let me, let me follow up and make sure if there's anything more I can provide you on that. Well, meanwhile, we've had about one and a half million known gotaways cross the border as this crisis has unfolded. Uh, uh, any estimate of how many among, uh, of, of those 5,000 among the one and a half million known gotaways uh, may be uh, terrorists? I know that we have seen an uptick, uh, which is obviously concerning to me, and I can tell from your question, concerning to you, uh, in uh, KSTs, as we call them, known or suspected terrorists uh, coming across uh, the southwest border. Um, and our folks are working very hard uh, to try to do our part to try to, to keep tabs on those individuals. Speaking of upticks, have we seen an uptick in criminal cartel or cartel-related gang activity in the United States over the last several years? Uh, yes, the the uh, the cartels working uh, in kind of an unholy alliance with dangerous, violent gangs here in the U.S. are responsible not just for the uh, abominable distribution of fentanyl all over the country, but um, but also an awful lot of the violence that comes. And that's along coming with it. principally across our southern border. Uh, that's a huge driver of it, certainly. Huge driver. Um, it's reported we've lost contact with the Guardians of more than 85,000 unaccompanied minors who've been brought here by the cartels through the southern border. How many of these children are still unaccounted for? Uh, that I'm not sure we have the answer to that. That may be a question for uh, DHS. Um, what's the Woods procedure? The Woods procedure uh, is a procedure for, has nothing to do with 702. It has to do with traditional FISA, um, uh, Title I FISA as we call it. Uh, and involves having uh, files that have all the underlying documents to support each of the factual assertions. Is, is in that the important uh, to the integrity of FISA applications? Yes, sir. In, in February 2020, you assured the committee that uh, you took these FISA abuses seriously, that you were working to address them. A year and a half later, the Office of the Inspector General reported that you weren't. Um, they reported systemic noncompliance and essentially that some FBI field personnel took the Woods procedure as a joke. If we can't trust your past reforms, how seriously should we take your promises of future reform? I appreciate the opportunity to address this one. So that OIG finding actually applies to, number one, that applies to compliance problems that occurred before all the fixes that I was testifying to you all about before. Uh, even though the report came out later, it was covering a time period that predated all of the fixes and reforms well, your, we put your in place. Your general counsel assured Mr. Durham that the abuses would not have happened because of the new procedures for supervisorial review, yet some of the worst abuses in Crossfire Hurricane were committed by supervisory agents. So, so why should we have any great confidence that's not going to happen again? I, 
I, there are a couple different let's, sets of reforms here. So the first is on the reforms that we put in place uh, in response to the Inspector General's crossfire hurricane report. But we can't trust your supervisors is the problem. The, 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 the problem seems to be that this power exists at all, and human beings, uh, being what they are, will tend to abuse them. Could you describe the term parallel construction as it relates to evidence produced in FISA searches? Parallel construction? I'm yeah. not sure I've used Doesn't that Doesn't that refer before. to the FBI using forbidden information from a 702 search to, to alert local law enforcement to search for and then produce the same material without revealing that it came from an improper search? I'm just not sure about the use of the term. Well, has the FBI ever employed that particular tactic in prosecuting American citizens? Uh, I, not to my knowledge, but again, I can look into that and get back to you. What percentage of FISA warrant applications are rejected by the FISA court? I don't know that we have that number. Uh, there's, a, there's usually a back and forth with the court. Uh, it's not unusual for the court to... Uh, it's a fraction of percentage, isn't it? A fraction of a percentage? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's right, but it's definitely a small number. Uh, well, and I think we, that's we, partly makes, because well, we, we are which, folks learn over which time makes what that the court sound expects. an awful lot like a rubber stamp. I see my time's expired. I yield back. Uh, uh, the gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, Director Ray. Um, thank you for coming before the Judiciary Committee this afternoon. And I have read your testimony. I want to redirect this questioning for a moment, and I want to focus on the important work that the FBI uh, is tasked with when it continues to do its work with gun violence prevention and keeping our community safe. As of today, there have been over 300 mass shootings. That's more than the number of days that we have in this year. And statistics will continue to show us over and over again that during the summer, these numbers continue to rise. Extremist protection orders play an important role in law enforcement's response to preventing mass shootings from happening. And what are also known as red flag laws or orders, uh, they empower law enforcement, uh, along with family members and household members, to petition a court to actually have an individual that appears to be in crisis have those firearms just temporarily taken away or removed from them with a court order uh, to be um, returned during expiration of that order. Um, I have a few questions for you, so if you can answer as directly as you can, I appreciate it. Family members and members of law enforcement can often identify individuals who would pose a risk to themselves or to others within the community um, when they actually possess a gun. As the head of the United States Federal Law Enforcement Agency, do you believe that these red flag laws uh, and these programs enhance public safety? I don't want to uh, speak on behalf of any specific legislative proposal, but I, I will say that I know um, from experience that a number of states have had uh, good experiences with those laws. Thank you. And in the past several years, several states have actually in, um, enacted those extremist protection orders. In total, we actually have 21 states, and the District of Columbia have enacted their own forms of red flag laws. Um, if a person who is subject to such an order tries to buy a gun, from a federally licensed uh, firearm dealer, would the FBI approve or deny the sale? Well, I believe if the uh, order is uh, required by state law, making it a state prohibitor, uh, and therefore is uh, loaded into the NICS system, uh, then when the uh, background check is run, uh, when the uh, the FFL, the firearms, Federal Firearms Licensee, contacts NICS to, to proceed with the sale. Uh, that would pick up the, um, the so-called protected the order that you're talking about. Uh, and if that's a prohibitor, then that would block the transaction, is my understanding. So in the absence of an application or applicable state law, is there a way for the FBI agent to seek an order under federal law? I, I'm not aware of any federal law to that effect? Exactly. If an FBI agent has information that someone has been violent many times in the past, but is not able to seek a criminal conviction, is there a way for the FBI to deny the sale of a gun to that person? We only deny sales for people who are prohibited by law from possessing firearms. My bill, the Federal Extreme uh, Risk Protection Order Act, which was passed by the House last Congress, would provide 
Americans in all states access to these truly life-saving measures, I have reintroduced this, this bill again this term. Last summer, Congress also passed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, uh, among other critical gun um, violence pro uh, provisions in that, the legislation begins to address the problem of gun trafficking. What steps has the FBI taken to implement or utilize this new law that actually helps to stop gun trafficking? Well, we're, uh, we're, of course, working closely with the Justice Department to implement all the provisions of the law that relate to NICS in particular. Uh, the place that's had, that it has, the, has had the biggest impact on us uh, is certainly on the additional checks that now uh, would be run for the 18 to 20 year olds. Um, and we started implementing that last October. It was fully implemented starting in, in January. Uh, and it's a big change uh, for us and for the state agencies that are on the receiving end uh, of the request for information, uh, as well as for the FFLs, both the big stores and the mom and pops. It's a, it's a big change in the system. I think we've done about 100,000 or so uh, checks of this 18 to 20, in other words, U21, uh, group that we're talking about since the implementation of the of the act. Those are not all denials, to be clear. Those, most, in fact, the vast, vast, vast majority of them were were sales that appropriately proceeded. Um, but there were some that were, of course, denials based on the on the statute. Time of the, Thank you so much. I'm out of time. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Texas recognized. Thank the chairman. Uh, thank you, Director Ray, for appearing. Uh, Brian Auten was one of the FBI intelligence analysts who interviewed. Igor Danchenko, the principal source of the Steele dossier in January 2017, correct? Uh, I, I believe that's in the Durham report. Uh, and, and Danchenko explained that the dossier allegations were BS, yet the FBI did not reveal that to the FISA court. Instead, the FBI continued to use those allegations in two more sworn FISA applications about President Trump and Putin, correct? Well, again, I want to let Mr. Durham's report speak for itself. Okay, but as director of the FBI, that's, those are the facts of the FBI under your watch. The FBI well, conducted... Well, no, no, sir, I'm sorry. Just, it's important. Not under my watch. Those are the facts well, I'm getting, I'm getting to the part. Here. I'm getting to the part under your watch. Okay. The FBI conducted an internal investigation of Auten and sought to suspend him, but Auten appealed, correct? I, I can't discuss a specific pending personnel matter. Okay, well, according to recent reports, those are the facts. Nevertheless, in 2020, after Senators Grassley and Johnson highlighted evidence of potential financial crimes and corruption against the Biden family, the FBI assigned Auten to compile an assessment which was used to characterize the Biden revelations as Russian disinformation. The evidence Grassley and Johnson had collected were mostly financial records and could easily have been corroborated as authentic. And by then, the FBI had the Hunter laptop in its possession for over a year, so it knew the lucrative payments of the Bidens from corrupt and anti-American regimes were authentic. How on earth did the FBI empower an agent under investigation for potentially corrupt performance and abuse of FISA in one politically fraught investigation, a Democrat operative driven case against President Trump, to play a key role and to undermine a second politically fraught investigation, a case against the Bidens? How's that possible? How can you allow that to occur in the Federal Bureau of Investigation, as my colleagues on the other side of the aisle say the elite law enforcement agency of the United States. How does that occur? I can't, at the moment, discuss a pending personnel matter. Uh, I can tell you that every employee who in any way touched uh, the Crossfire Hurricane matter uh, has been referred to our Office of Professional Responsibility, our discipline. Are you concerned arm. about this, this activity by the FBI and what was communicated to the FISA court? Does that concern you as the director of the FBI? I consider the conduct that was described in the Durham report as totally unacceptable and unrepresentative of what I see from the FBI every day and must never be allowed to happen again. And have there been consequences as a result? Is Mr. Auten, uh, had, has he had consequences? Well, again, I can't speak to pending personnel matters. As you would perhaps remember from your own time in law enforcement, because we were working closely with Mr. Durham and I assigned agents to help him, at his request, we slowed down the administrative process to allow his investigation to complete itself. Now that it is complete, 
our personnel processes are very much ongoing. Well, I think it is more than troubling that under your watch, we see that this continued to occur and you have Auten being continued to be empowered after there was an investigation and after there was an effort by the FBI to look into why he would go to the FISA court and give wrong information. I mean, the issue here has been wrapped up in a cloud of politics, but the fact is the American people deserve to know how the FISA court is being abused and how it's being abused against the former president and against them in light of the reports that we saw Mr. Johnson from Louisiana put forward that was in a court filing and a court report. I want to move on to another topic. On September 23rd, 2022, 20 heavily armed agents stormed the home of Mark Houck. You're familiar with this? I'm familiar with the Houck case a little bit, yes. And uh, this was after Mr. Houck's lawyer reached out and said he would appear voluntarily because the incident in question occurred almost in a year earlier in October of 2021, so a year earlier. And the question here I have, local authorities investigated the incident but concluded there was no case. After the jury met for roughly an hour, Houck was acquitted. How on earth did Mark Houck end up having the FBI send several armed agents along with local authorities to arrest him at gunpoint? And do you approve it? Did you approve of that? Well, let me start where you ended. Decisions about the manner uh, of an arrest are not something that the FBI director approves. I defer to and rely on the judgment of the experienced career agents on the ground who have both the most intimate understanding of the facts and of the training experience to decide how best to effectuate an arrest. Do you know who, who did order it? Uh, and my understanding is that that arrest was conducted in our Philadelphia division uh, by career agents with a combined 40 years of do, FBI Do you experience. approve of the raid now in retrospect? Well, do you think it was appropriate? First, it, do you think it was appropriate for a father to have armed FBI agents along with local agents go to his home, arrest him at gunpoint for alleged violation of the FACE Act a year after the alleged incident, after the father had said through his lawyer that he would appear voluntarily. Do you believe that FBI agents should go to the home of a father in Philadelphia suburbs? I'm not going to second guess the judgment of the career agents on the ground who made the determination. But your, your, your job is to second guess and look at, at what they are doing. Your job is to review what they do. Your job is to protect the American people from a tyrannical FBI storming the home of an American family. I, I could not disagree more with your description of the FBI as tyrannical. Uh, and you I don't think believe you're it's just, tyrannical you're, that, that, that FBI agents were a part of storming a father's home in, the in suburban Philadelphia? I'm the gentleman. Mr. Chairman. Time of the gentleman's expired. The witness may respond, and then we'll move to our next witness. Sir, our next, respectfully. Uh, member. They did not storm his house. They came to his door. They knocked on his door and identified themselves. They asked him to exit. He did without incident. Whenever our agents, well, not at gunpoint, whenever our agents conduct an arrest, they are armed. Our agents are armed virtually all the time, as you may remember from your own experience as a prosecutor. Uh, the gentleman yields back. The ranking member has the unanimous consent. Request. I'd ask unanimous consent that this document uh, be placed in the record. That's pretty, that's not, not too I'd specific. I'd ask unanimous consent to enter the full January 15, 2021 email thread between Bank of America and the FBI that is about threats to inauguration day instead of the edited version that was shown on the I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy to have that into the record. Uh, we, without objection, we champion that. We're going to bring that up again here if we get a, get a chance. Uh, the gentlelady from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, uh, good to see you. I thank you for being here today. Uh, and I just want to remind those who are watching at home or here in the room uh, that we are here as an oversight function. Uh, we are not here as a political tool uh, to hammer you or your 38,000 uh, public servants, uh, law enforcement men and women, uh, and to try to use you politically. Uh, but it surely doesn't feel that way all the time during this. So I thank you for your service. Uh, I thank the men and women for their service. I have a, a first cousin, technically I guess a first cousin-in-law, who for a very long time in the Philadelphia suburbs served as an FBI agent with integrity and honor. Uh, so I think of him, I think of Jack today as I'm doing this. I read your testimony often, over and over, you state the mission uh, of FBI to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution of the United States. Twofold. 
protect the American people, uphold the Constitution. Do it by the rule of law. That's what we should be asking about. Are we doing that to the best of our ability? I want to use and examine the case of the Mar-a-Lago documents, because it's been used uh, by the former president as a pitying moment, uh, as though he has somehow been victimized. Uh, but none of that is normal. Um, these are serious times, and your people have serious missions about the safety of the American people and doing it lawfully. Uh, Director Ray, a ballroom, a bathroom, a bedroom, are those appropriate places to store classified confidential information? Well, again, I don't want to be commenting on the pending case, but I will say that there are specific rules about where to store classified information and that those need to be stored in a SCIF, a secure compartmentalized information facility. And uh, in my experience, ballrooms, bathrooms, and bedrooms are not SCIFs. Mine too. Uh, and yet that is where the former president chose to put vital information about our national security. He exacerbated the risk, as alleged in the damning 37 count uh, indictment uh, by evading law enforcement and allegedly even showing some of these classified documents to others who were not either in a skiff or up to having this document these informations uh, sent to him it was January 20th having lost the election 2021 when at noon mr. Trump had to leave the White House and of course uh, it's shown in the affidavit and in um, the um, uh, indictment that he left with quite a few boxes. May of 2021, the National Archives emailed requesting the missing documents from Mr. Trump. His lawyer said uh, that he would provide them and then never did. January 18 of 2022, so we're talking a full year later, Mr. Trump finally turned over 15 boxes, 14 of them contained documents with classified markings, 30 documents top secret. June 2022, this is now a year and a half later, DOJ and FBI recover an additional 38 classified documents from Mar-a-Lago, your FBI, our FBI. Uh, a lawyer for Mr. Trump signed a statement at that point. To the best of her knowledge, she said, all classified materials had been returned. But surveillance footage, of course, showed that wasn't the case. And in August of 2022, a federal judge approved a warrant uh, to search Mar-a-Lago. This was not a raid, as some on the other side would like to have a pity party for Mr. Trump. This was not a raid. They then retrieved another 102 documents with classified markings. 300 and some documents taken by the president, improperly stored, uh, and then tried to evade and obstruct justice, as is alleged. Do you think that the FBI went over the top or was out of line in, their, in your participation in retrieving these documents? Well, again, I, I don't want to discuss the, the specifics of a pending case, but from everything I've seen, our folks in this case uh, have proceeded honorably and in strict compliance with our policies, our rules, and our best practices. And it seems from what overview we can do, I'm taking a look here at the affidavit to get this, the search warrant. Uh, to go on in. It was uh, one of your special agents uh, assigned from the Washington field office. Obviously, we don't know who, uh, but pointed out and made the case for probable cause to go in and to collect these documents. So let's take a look at the flip side. What's the harm? What's the danger to either human assets, um, your employees, uh, national security for Mr. Trump holding on to, moving around, showing uh, top secret documents. Where's the harm? 18 months of this going on. Well, again, I'm I, respectfully, I'm not going to comment or weigh in on a case that's now pending in front of federal judges. But, but speaking more generally, uh, the rules governing the handling of classified information uh, are there for a reason, and people need to be very mindful of those rules. And unfortunately, the FBI has, as a steady part of its docket, a number of investigations involving mishandling. And the reason those rules are there is because classified information, if it gets into the wrong hands, uh, can put human sources in jeopardy. It can put uh, other kinds of intelligence collection at jeopardy. It can jeopardize our partnerships with foreign liaison services, which are really the lifeblood of the intelligence community in many ways. 
Um, so it's serious business, and it needs to be taken seriously. But again, I'm not speaking about a particular case, I'm I, just speaking generally. I very much appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it, but I do want to just point out to the world, none of this is normal. It was not normal what took place here. And I yield back. Generally, it yields back. Bedroom, bathroom, ballroom. How about a box in a, in a, in a Mr. garage? Chairman, Mr. Beach Chairman. Beach House in Delaware and the Biden Center. I don't think those are skips Mr. Chairman, either. point of order. The gentleman from Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to talk about China, but before I do, I want to just uh, comment, you know, in the last exchange with Mr. Roy, I heard you say um, certain practices were outrageous to you, and I appreciated that. Uh, and I think maybe we would have liked to have heard more of that this hearing about things, um, acknowledging failures. I realize there are a lot of positives to talk about, um, but we do as a committee want to work with you. When Chairman Jordan um, asks why so much is redacted in a document, could we perhaps sit down with you, uh, even if it's privately, and you tell us why that needs to be the case? Um, if we ask for the names of these employees that were behind the Catholic, um, the Catholic issue in Virginia, can we get a commitment that we'll eventually get those names? I, I didn't hear that in that exchange with Mr. Jordan. Well, you certainly have my commitment that we will work collaboratively with the committee. Uh, we obviously have rules that govern uh, what we can share, and we have to be mindful of those too. But in my experience, that's what the longstanding accommodation process between the executive branch, especially law enforcement agencies and Congress, is there for. Uh, and we absolutely will pursue that in good faith. I know we've been providing an enormous amount of information, and if there are places that we can uh, do better on that. We want to try to do better on that. If again, consistent with our rules, I'm very mindful of the fact that the whole reason I'm in this job is because my predecessor was fired. And in a fairly scathing inspector general report, one of the things he was criticized for was uh, sharing more information, both with the public and frankly with Congress than was consistent with federal rules. Thank you, Thank you for that pledge. Uh, now to China. Most Americans don't realize, I don't think, that U.S. companies doing business in China are required to have joint venture agreements. That's been around since 2017 or 18, I believe. And it requires the uh, Chinese Communist Party to have political cells within these uh, enterprises, American enterprises in China. In the last few weeks, it has come to my attention that they've taken that up a notch and actually gone further, the Chinese have, and said that not only uh, must they be present and have access, but they now control um, these American businesses. So they're, in essence, nationalizing American enterprises in China. And the CEOs I've talked to are afraid to say something. They say they've come to the FBI. The FBI, I think, um, is aware of this. I'm, I'm about to turn it over to you. Um, my question is, is this happening? And what can be done about it? What do we need to do about it? Well, I think you've, you've put your finger on a very important issue and, frankly, one that does not get the attention that it really deserves. So I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, I will say that, in my view, there is no country, none, that presents a broader, more comprehensive threat to our ideas, our innovation, our economic security than the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party. And in many ways, it represents, I think, the defining threat of our era. And when it comes specifically to the business community, while there's no law against joint ventures, uh, the problem that we have is that the Chinese government uh, all too often has exploited those joint ventures to then use them as ways to uh, get uh, improper access to companies' uh, secrets and information. Do you find that they have stepped it up, though, to where they are, in essence, nationalizing U.S. companies quietly? In a variety of ways, I hadn't really thought of using that term, but I think you're on to a very important point. I'll give you an example that's, that I think a lot of people in America still don't know about and would be shocked to hear, which is that really any company of any size in China uh, is required, required by Chinese law to have what they uh, quaintly call a committee, which is essentially a cell inside the company whose sole function is to ensure that company's compliance with Chinese Communist Party orthodoxy. If we tried to install something like that in American companies, or if the British tried to do it in British companies, or any number of other places, people would go out of their minds, and rightly so. Uh, agreed. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to work with you more on that, and I'd uh, yield the balance of my time to the chairman. Thank you. But that's exactly what you did. And the judge said it last week. 
Every week you were meeting with big tech companies saying, hey, look at this, this violates your policy, take this speech of Americans down. You were doing the same darn thing you just described the Chinese about. And can we put up the email that Mr. Nadler entered into the uh, unanimous consent request? Can we put this up from the FBI to Bank of America? Because I want to know something. This is the full email. Go to the bullet point where it says, any historical purchase going back six months generally for weapons, weapons-related vendor purchase. You see that, Director? You see that bullet point? The one that says any in all caps, that bullet point? This is the email. How did you know? How would you know if it's a firearm purchase? How is the FBI going to know this? Would you put your mic on, please? I'm sorry. I'm not going to start engaging on specific correspondence. I don't have the whole string here. As I've said before, my understanding is that our engagement with Bank of America was lawful, but that we also took steps, as we discussed in our earlier exchange. Well, if it's lawful, why would you take steps not to use the material? You can't have it both ways. I, I disagree with that, actually. Even, really? There are, plenty of there are plenty of things that we lawfully can do that we decide are better not to do, and that, that's my understanding is what happened here. Wow. Wow. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentlelady from Texas for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, thank you for your testimony, and thank you for your public service. Last week in my district and my hometown of El Paso, Texas, a um, domestic violent extremist was sentenced to 90 consecutive life terms for a horrific attack he carried out on my community on August 3rd, 2019. On that day, he confessed that he drove uh, over 10 hours from his community in East Texas to mine in order to slaughter Mexicans and immigrants. And before he walked into that Walmart, he published his screed online, uh, and he used some of the same uh, ugly xenophobic rhetoric that I hear my colleagues on the other side of the aisle use. And then he walked into that Walmart with an automatic uh, style weapon and began shooting indiscriminately. He killed 23 people injured dozens more, and my community remains profoundly impacted by that attack. And the victims and the survivors and the loved ones still live with profound pain and trauma. What is the FBI doing, Director Ray, in response to racially motivated domestic terrorism? Well, first, let me say, uh, I. Uh, feel your pain. Uh, I actually visited the Walmart uh, crime scene shortly after the attack and spent time with our folks on the ground who were uh, processing the crime scene uh, in blistering heat uh, on the, in the parking lot there, uh, and obviously got briefed by the investigative team and met with our local partners, uh, and obviously it was a horrific, tragic event, um, and the, the individual stories about uh, some of the individual victims um, stick with me to this day. Uh, as to the broader phenomenon of uh, racially motivated violent extremism, uh, we have done a number of things. We elevated it to a national threat priority uh, back in the summer of 2019, I believe it was, uh, which means that uh, it is squarely in scope of all of our joint terrorism task forces uh, and treated as a priority at the top level. That's our highest level of priority. Uh, we also uh, have uh, engaged, we created a domestic terrorism hate crimes fusion cell, and you might wonder what's the point of that. Well, what we found was that sometimes the same acts of violence could either be called a hate crime or could be called an act of domestic uh, violent extremism, and in the way the FBI is structured, the first is treated by our criminal investigative division, the second is created by, is, is focused on by our counterterrorism division. And by bringing the two subject matter experts together, we could make sure that we are not letting anything slip through the cracks, and more importantly, we can be proactive in thinking ahead. And that same fusion cell, uh, for example, was then very important in us identifying and preventing uh, a potentially devastating attack against a synagogue outside of Colorado. It was really one of the first times uh, in recent memory that 
a hate crimes prosecution was, was, uh, was able to be preventative all too often, unfortunately, those cases are brought after there's a horrific attack. So we were very proud of, of disrupting that plot. Thank you so much, uh, Director Ray. I'm also very curious about what steps you've taken to improve coordination between the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security in terms of reporting the domestic terrorism data. Well, there's, uh, there were a number of um, places, this gets a little bit technical, but the, uh, the reports that, the, uh, that Congress called for uh, I've had a number of engagements with, uh, with Senator Peters uh, in, on the Senate side about this, uh, where data about how many domestic terrorism attacks there had been and which cases there were, uh, I think there were different ways in which the two agencies were count, what they were counting and so forth. Uh, so in order to kind of get better at providing that information as required by Congress, we've worked more and more closely with DHS on ensuring a common uh, set of metrics and so forth to, to make sure that the reports are getting in on time uh, and that they're complete. We still have some work to do to make them better, but I think we've made significant progress. I appreciate it. That data is critically important, as you know. Uh, I'm just about out of time. Thanks again for your service. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General, uh, excuse me. General Lady yields back. The General Lady from Florida is recognized. Good afternoon, Director Ray. Director, how many sworn special agents are there currently in the United States? You mean outside the FBI? Oh, no, in the FBI. Just in the FBI? Uh, I think we have about 14,000 or so uh, FBI special agents. And they are spread across field offices and resident agencies in the U.S. and, and in some cases around the world. Is that right? Uh, yes. All right. Now, as a former federal prosecutor and judge, I've had the opportunity to work with a number of men and women of the FBI from my home state. And one thing that I know and that we've heard in your testimony today is that you all have very broad responsibilities. Uh, would, is it correct to say that the FBI, among other things, investigates counterterrorism, counterintelligence, cybercrime, public corruption, civil rights offenses, transnational organized crime, violent crime, and domestic terrorism? Uh, and then other things as well, yes. but yes. Yes. And in addition to that, would you agree with the statement that the Bureau provides important support to local law enforcement agencies around the country on those subjects and others? I would say indispensable support and something I hear about. I'm talking with chiefs and sheriffs probably every week in this job since I've started. And if there's one refrain I hear from them consistently is keep it coming. We need it. Can you give us even more help? Um, that's what I hear from them. I'd like to focus on the subject of domestic terrorism today. And when we talk about domestic terrorism, the Bureau's work includes investigating and bringing to justice those who would do profound harm to the homeland, given the opportunity. And the Bureau has, has been involved in uh, cases involving hate crimes, violent extremists, and, and even some of our country's most notorious criminals, like Timothy McVeigh and Ted Kaczynski. Is that right? Yes. Okay, and of course there are many such individuals who have plans to do harm to our homeland uh, that America never hears about because you successfully intercept and prevent before those incidents occur. Yes, in fact, one of the things that I think people would be surprised to know because terrorism is, is not as much in the news as it was during the era when I was serving in the Bush administration in the 9-11 era, but we have, just since I've been director, disrupted attacks against uh, a July 4th parade uh, in Ohio, uh, a, a, any number of attacks against churches and other houses of worship, uh, an attack, an attempted attack, a plot to attack a hospital during COVID, uh, the pier in San Francisco in sort of a peak tourism moment, uh, a crowded beach during you know, Memorial Holiday, and these are not all domestic terrorism. Some of them are, and that's important for people to know, some of these are jihadist-inspired uh, terrorist attacks, too. And, and that has not gone away, even though a lot of the public discussion has been about domestic terrorism. And so here's what I'm hoping you can help us reconcile today. So we know that there are a limited number of agents, a limited number of resources, and a vast responsibility to prevent uh, a broad array of very serious offenses. And what I'd like to do with that in mind is turn your attention to the decision within the Bureau to use investigative resources to investigate and surveil parents 
who attended school board meetings for the purpose of sharing their concerns about the nature of their children's education and the efficacy of the policies that were being implemented by school boards around the country. Is it correct that in 2021, the FBI created a threat tag specifically designed to identify parents attending school board meetings? Uh, yes, but I think it's important for people to understand what a threat tag is and is not. It is not what we base investigations on. It's not an investigative tool. It's an administrative function in our system, and it doesn't change anything, anything about how we investigate, tools we use, any of our longstanding standards for predication. But in uh, those and you circumstances, mentioned the whole resource allocation question. It is correct, is it not, however, that agents surveilled, that agents did in fact surveil and investigate certain parents who were attending school board meetings? No, ma'am, that's actually not correct. We, we opened 25 assessments into reports that were tagged but none of those involved incidents at school board meetings. And to my knowledge, the FBI has not opened investigations on any parent for exercising speech at school board meetings. Would you be concerned that to do so would be an infringement or perhaps a chilling on the First Amendment rights of parents to participate freely and openly in those meetings? Do you believe that would be an appropriate function of the Bureau? I, I believe that our mission is to protect the American people and uphold the Constitution. Uh, and the uphold the Constitution part is very important to me and to our people. Uh, and I will say to you the same thing I said to all 56 of our field offices as soon as I read that memo, which is the FBI is not and has never been in the business of policing or investigating speech by parents at school board meetings. Uh, and we're not about to start now. We're going to keep doing what we've been doing, and that includes when there's violence, threats of violence, we're going to work with our state and local partners, uh, as we always have uh, on that, and following our normal procedures and our normal uh, investigative steps and our normal standards for predication. Thank you, Director Wright. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The lady yields back. The gentleman from Colorado is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony, and thank you for your service to our country uh, under some pretty difficult circumstances, and we're certainly grateful. I'm certainly grateful that people of the state that I represent, Colorado, are grateful to uh, the 38,000 members of the FBI team, as you have articulated, uh, that are working every day to keep the American people safe and to keep the people of my state and my community safe. So we're grateful for you being here. Uh, this committee obviously has a legitimate role in terms of conducting oversight. Generally, that oversight has extended to uh, the, the policy areas, the areas of law enforcement that, of course, uh, you are responsible for. Unfortunately, much of the conversation today, uh, and it's disappointing, I think, for those Americans who have been watching, uh, has not been focused on those legitimate areas of inquiry, but instead conspiracy theories and the like. Uh, obviously, as you have been given an opportunity to respond to uh, some of the attacks that have been made against uh, the law enforcement agency uh, that you direct. Uh, and the dangerous calls, or at least in my view, the dangerous calls that have been made by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, in terms of defunding federal law enforcement, which is deeply dangerous, and, and you've uh, articulated the many reasons why. I'd like to focus in on two areas that are important to my constituents in Colorado and that I believe are relevant to the work that you do, uh, and that is the fentanyl epidemic and gun violence prevention. With respect to uh, the latter, uh, you may recall you testified in front of the committee previously. I had an opportunity to ask you about an incident that occurred back in 2020 in my state in Colorado. Uh, in 2021, the GAO issued a report in response to this particular incident. Just by way of background, a gun dealer in Colorado transferred a firearm to an 18-year-old resident of Florida without first verifying the purchaser's age eligibility in her state of residence. The gun buyer then threatened to commit a school shooting akin to the mass tragedy that occurred at Columbine High, uh, causing the lockdown and closure of multiple schools in my district back in Colorado. The report recommended, the GAO report, that the FBI strengthen its system for the sale of firearms to out-of-state purchasers. Specifically, it recommended that the FBI update the NICS system to verify the age requirements of an out-of-state firearm purchaser in both the purchaser's state of residence and the state of sale to ensure basic age eligibility. And we've introduced legislation um, that I believe the Department of Justice is aware of to make that requirement statutory. Wonder if you have, if you could expound a bit on whether the 
I'm sure you're aware of the report, whether the FBI has implemented the recommendation uh, that the GAO has made, and if not, uh, the FBI's plans to do so. Well, uh, I think the specific legislation that would require that is something, as you said, that I think the department is studying, um, and so I can't weigh in on a specific legislative proposal. Uh, when it comes to the specific issue of uh, 18 to 20 year olds in particular uh, and gun purchases, um, that is of course the subject of the, the bipartisan Safer Communities Act that was passed. Um, and there are a number of significant checks that now occur. Uh, we started implementing that last October, fully implemented it starting in January. Uh, and that provides for enhanced checks for that, that critical population, the 18 to 20 year old uh, range, uh, juvenile uh, criminal records, mental health records for that population and contact, in some ways, most importantly, contact with local law enforcement in that person's community. And I've actually been out to NICS, met with and sat with the operators who, who process those checks um, so I've seen kind of firsthand how it works and, and, the, and the important work it, it represents. And I think if you were to talk, I, I'm talking to chiefs and sheriffs all over this country every week, and uh, you will hear, most of them, if you talk to them for very long, you will hear about their concern and our concern about juveniles and violence. Uh, I almost guarantee you within the first 10 minutes of any conversation, it's a real problem in this country. Well, I thank you for your answer, and I think it underscores the importance of the NICS program, and uh, would look forward to uh, perhaps following up with your team on this particular administrative issue of trying to just make sure that the database is, is working efficiently. Limited time left, but I just want to give you an opportunity. I know we've talked a bit about the fentanyl epidemic devastating communities across the, the country, certainly in Colorado. It's one of the reasons why we created a fentanyl prevention caucus here in the Congress. It's bipartisan. Uh, Representative Issa is one of our co-chairs. Wonder if you just might be able to, you know, for those Americans who are watching, kind of provide us with your sense of some of the trends, the most dangerous and disturbing trends that you think the American people and policymakers should be aware of. Well, I will say there are a whole bunch of trends, but in the limited time, but because of the importance of this topic, I'll hit a couple. One is, uh, and we were just discussing this recently internally, we are finding uh, over the course of the last year that uh, maybe even a little less than a year that almost every gang takedown we have now, and we're doing them all over the country all the time, almost every single one now seems to involve, as well, a seizure of fentanyl. Uh, and we've been doing gang takedowns since uh, Congresswoman Lee was a prosecutor as well. Uh, and so that's not new, but what is new is that over and over and over again, it seems consistently we're finding fentanyl in these, again, these are violent crime takedowns. Uh, the second phenomenon, which is deeply disturbing, and I know the DEA administrator is very concerned about as well, is that we're seeing more and more adulteration or lacing of fentanyl into all sorts of different kinds of prescription drugs that lots of Americans take all the time. Uh, and if you think about the phenomenon of the youth of this country, which is itself a problem of getting prescription drugs from their friends or their friends' parents or whatever it happens to be, they may not know that there's potentially a lethal dose of fentanyl in some prescription drug that they're taking. So it just underscores the importance of only getting your prescriptions from an appropriate medical provider. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized. Is the southern border secure? Uh, I think the southern border represents a um, massive security threat. So what we've heard from you today is that um, uh, fentanyl has become a really big problem and that you're having to put more resources to it. Is that correct? Towards fentanyl, yes. Uh, yes, we are. And the related gangs. I mean, you just retailed uh, some of the story. Right. So this all happened over the last couple years as the border has become unsecure. Um, is the southern border secure? Well, again, we're not I want to defer to the Homeland Security, which has responsible for the physical security of the building. I will just tell you from the FBI's perspective that we are seeing all sorts of very serious, very serious criminal threats that, that come from across the border. And getting worse, correct? You're uh, putting more assets towards it? We certainly do. We have, as so I said... So it's becoming more of a priority for you? It is becoming more and more and more of a priority for us, um, yes. 
so in the Durham report, and we heard from Mr. Durham just a couple weeks ago, he said the FBI failed to uphold the important mission of strict fidelity to the law, and that predates you. Uh, do you agree with that statement that Mr. Durham uh, made? Uh, yes, I do. Was Russia collusion a hoax? So in light of the Durham report well, and that, was Russia collusion a hoax? What I would say is this. Uh, one as to the Durham report itself, and one as to the issue of Russia malign influence. As to the Durham report itself, be quick. The, I will try. The conduct it describes is conduct that I consider unacceptable and unrepresentative of who I see the FBI is every day and must not ever be allowed to happen again. And on the other side. Second, on the other one, it is not seriously disputed that the Russians, among other foreign adversaries, have attempted to interfere in our elections. Uh, and so, and there have been any number of findings to that. In fact, President Trump himself uh, rightly declared a national emergency about foreign interference in our elections in 2018. So as a result of the actions of James Comey, the disgraced James Comey, and the FBI, they've interfered with the elections in both 2016 and 2020. Will that interference happen again in 2024 by the FBI? The FBI is not going to be interfering in elections. They did in 2016. Well, I, I don't know that that's what Mr. Durham found. What I would tell you again is that it was conduct that I consider unacceptable and unrepresentative. You can be in denial if you want to. I'm not in uh, denial, Mr. Dr sir. You can be in denial on this. That's exactly what happened. Last year, the FBI gave a defensive briefing to my home state Senator Johnson, and you can see the slide up there now. And then that defensive briefing was leaked to the Washington Post. Who ordered that briefing? So defensive briefings when it comes to election matters, uh, including in the last administration, uh, under a procedure set up by the last administration, are an interagency process coordinated by the Office of Director of National Intelligence. And the way that works is the interagency concludes that a defensive briefing is appropriate, and the FBI is given information from whatever intelligence community agency supplies it, and then we provide it. Defensive briefings, it's important to understand. Sen Senator Johnson, that's his quote. He's up there with you and Hunter Biden. I knew it was a setup. And he asked you this question back in November of last year, and he said, I knew it was a setup. And, here's, and that goes back to the point about interfering in elections. Senator Johnson was the, one of the most vulnerable Republican incumbents, if not the most vulnerable Republican incumbent, that was a target of the Democrats in the 2022 election. And then you see this briefing happen, and he knew what was happening, that there was someone or some people within the FBI and the intelligence arena that were going after him. Did Joe Biden take pay, uh, payments from Burisma or any other foreign companies as vice president, president, or private citizen Biden? Uh, as you may know, there is an ongoing investigation being led by the U.S. attorney in Delaware, Mr. Weiss, appointed uh, by President Trump in the last administration that our Baltimore field office is working with, and I would refer you to, to him as to what, if anything, can be shared. So the president is under, um, he is under um, investigation. I'm not going to confirm or speak to who is or isn't under investigation for what. I'm simply going so to tell So he's not you, under investigation? I didn't say that either. Uh, by longstanding department policy and practice, I'm okay. not going to be confirming or denying I'll who is it. or isn't under investigation thank, or for what. Thank you. I, I'll close with this. Russia collusion started it, Mr. Chairman, and the targeting and the suppression and the censorship has continued until this point. We need to thoroughly review what the FBI is doing, and at a minimum, I will be allowing FISA to sunset if we're not going to see significant reforms in the agency. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from North Carolina is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Director Ray, for your service and your patience. Um, in 2018, 10 leaders of Temple Beth Or, a synagogue in my district, received threats mailed to their homes. These threats led to the cancellation of programming and continued a disturbing trend of rising anti-Semitism in North Carolina. In the years since, my state has confronted new threats from domestic terrorists at minority institutions. 
This past April, a man was arrested on the campus of North Carolina A&T State University, the largest HBCU in the country, with multiple firearms and hundreds of rounds of ammunition, as well as a makeshift explosive, brass knuckles, crossbow, knives, and other weapons. Thankfully, this man was arrested before he could cause any harm, but the threat he posed to the campus mirrors threats we've seen to HBCUs around the country. In North Carolina and across the United States, we've also seen increased threats against reproductive care providers in the wake of the Dobbs decision last summer. And North Carolina recently enacted a 12-week abortion ban that has severely restricted access to reproductive health care in my state and there, people often have to go through threatening crowds to be able to access the care that they need. While some in North Carolina have highlighted vandalism of crisis pregnancy centers since the overturn of Roe, they failed to acknowledge or respond to the increase in violence at abortion providers. Does the FBI currently provide anti-terrorism training to civilians, to HBCUs, places of worship, religious centers, individuals providing abortion services, LGBTQ groups, and does that training include a domestic terrorism component um, so that they can help you and law enforcement? Well, we, uh, we do a whole bunch of things to engage with the community, um, uh, institutions that are targeted with violence. Um, that include a number of the kinds of institutions you uh, mentioned. I know in particular we work very, very closely with the Jewish community, which uh, uh, has the unfortunate distinction uh, of, despite the, the percentage that they represent of the American population, of being way disproportionately targeted. So we spend a lot of time engaging with them around the country and nationally. Um, we also uh, spent a lot of time engaging with campus uh, law enforcement, including at HBCUs. We spent a lot of time on that, uh, especially last year with the bomb threats that were, that were coming in. Uh, I was just recently with all of uh, the campus law enforcement leaders from around the country just uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, and we certainly try to provide uh, awareness to different kinds of institutions about how to deal with potential mass casualty events and things like that. We also provide information about uh, things to be on the lookout for in, in people's communities. Uh, I should say, though, when you mention um, on the abortion side, reproductive facilities, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't also point out that there has been uh, a pretty significant uptick in violence going the other way mm -hmm. uh, since the Dobb decision. And in fact, most of the investigations that we've opened uh, since the Dobb decision, probably about 70% of them have been violence against pro-life facilities. We recently had a, a, a significant charge uh, in the Madison, Wisconsin area of a guy who was trying to firebomb a pro-life facility there. So it, we're, we're out there with communities across the spectrum. Okay. And how would an investigation differ if it's domestic terrorism uh, as opposed to just an ordinary criminal case? Well, our investigation focuses on the violence, first and mm -hmm. foremost. I think there is no domestic terrorism statute. Uh, there's no offense of domestic mm -hmm. terrorism. But uh, we define domestic terrorism for purposes of, of opening an investigation as having three things, violence or threat of violence, uh, in furtherance of an ideology. In other words, that's what's driving the, the violence in that particular instance, and in violation of federal criminal law. If we have those three things, uh, enough evidence to indicate that that might be what's going on, then we would treat that as a domestic terrorism investigation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Lady yields back. Uh, we got votes, Director. We're going to do one more on our side, then we'll take a break and come back for the remainder, uh, remaining members. Uh, the gentlelady from Wyoming is recognized. Um, yes, uh, Director Ray, we have established that the FBI and other federal agencies met weekly with executives from major social media companies, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Google, Microsoft, LinkedIn, and Yahoo and Verizon. 
Were you involved in any of those meetings, yes or no? Uh, I, I wasn't involved in the kind of meetings that you're talking about, or, or I didn't participate, I guess, in, in meetings like that. Okay. Are these meetings still occurring, and if so, how frequently? Well, right now, uh, as you may know, there is a preliminary injunction that's been entered. Prior uh, to the preliminary injunction, were these weekly meetings taking place? I don't know if weekly meetings uh, occurred, again, before the injunction, but certainly we've been and we've been very open about this, engaged with does, social media does the, does the FBI intend to continue to have such meetings leading up to the 2024 election to police election-related speech? Well, we're not going to be policing election-related That's, what you, related that's what you previously did. Uh, that's not, I do not agree with that description. Okay, well, what here's we what I would say. This committee has learned that the FBI acted to, quote, discredit leaked information about Hunter Biden before and after it was published, that, quote, Twitter's contact with the FBI was constant and pervasive and as if it were a subsidiary, and that, quote, a surprisingly high number are requests by the FBI for Twitter to take down on action, take action on election misinformation, even involving joke tweets from low follower accounts. Are you aware that that has been reported? I am aware of some of what the committee has found in its report, okay. but I, I will add that I'm not sure I agree with the findings. But that's what we found. Uh, Director Way, you and I both know that the federal government is forbidden from doing indirectly what it cannot do directly. In other words, neither you nor the FBI have any legal authority to circumvent the First Amendment by using a surrogate to do your dirty work. Yet that is exactly what you have been doing. The Bureau, under your watch, has been using proxies to violate the First Amendment. Were you the person who gave the orders to use these social media companies to violate, the First Amer the, the, violate Americans' First Amendment rights? Again, I don't agree with your description of our engagement with so social who, media companies. So, so who made the decision to use social media companies as a proxy to suppress the First Amendment rights of American citizens. Because I don't believe that's what we did, I'm not sure there's anyone that would have made such a decision. Do you really expect the American public to believe that you were not involved in the decisions related to using social media companies to suppress the First Amendment rights of, of, of American citizens? I, I can't help what people will believe or not. I can only speak to what the facts are. Was anyone ever fired or otherwise reprimanded? for uh, pursuing mass censorship? In other words, has anybody been held accountable for taking the actions that were described in the decision by the district court out of Louisiana? Well, the district court's decision just came out on July 4th. Has anybody been reprimanded or held accountable for what is- And at the moment, is... we have issued guidance to everyone in the organization who could be affected as has to how to been, follow that. Has and anyone so been reprimanded? I'm not going to speak to personnel matters because we have not made any such determination at this stage. Um, Mr. Ray, I have some letters from Lindsey Graham and Rand Paul that were sent to you on April 20th and June 20th requesting a meeting uh, to discuss the Weapons of Mass Destruction Directorate's work investigating the origins of SARS uh, uh, COVID-19. Your office has never responded to these letters. Do you intend to respond to Senators Lindsey Graham and Rand Paul to uh, find out more information about the origin of COVID-19? Well, I, I, we try hard to respond to all correspondence we get from the Hill. We get a lot. So uh, I I'll assume have to you'll check. be responding so to My this. intention is that we would have an appropriate response. Sometimes our responses, uh, by longstanding procedure, our, uh, our responses have to go through the department before they go out. So it could be that it's held up there. But I don't know that that's, so, so I don't know Sen if that's the case in these particular Senators ones. Senators Graham and, and Paul should be receiving a response from your office of pretty soon. Some kind of response. As, as you may know, we were the only agency in the intelligence community until more recently when the Department of Energy uh, did as well to reach the assessment that in our folks' view, we thought I, I understand, was more likely Mr. to be Ray. a lab leak. Okay, um, Mr. Ray from the Twitter files, Missouri versus Biden disclosures, the Durham investigation and report and exposure and collapse of the Russian collusion hoax. The American people fully understand that there is a two-tier justice system that has been weaponized to persecute people based on their political beliefs, and that you have personally been weapon that you have personally worked to weaponize the FBI against conservatives. 
I asked Mr. Durham about this, to which he answered, I don't think that things can go too much further with the view that law enforcement, particularly the FBI or Department of Justice, runs a two-tiered system of justice. The nation can't stand under those circumstances. Director Ray, what are you prepared to do to reform federal law enforcement in a manner which earns back the trust of the American people? Well, first off, I would disagree with your characterization of the FBI and certainly your description of my own approach. Uh, the idea that I'm biased against conservatives uh, seems somewhat insane to me, uh, given my own personal background. As to how we are approaching our work of protecting the American people and upholding the Constitution, it starts with me having emphasized to all of our folks over and over and over again in everything we do that we need to do the right thing in the right way, and that means following the facts wherever they lead, no matter who likes it. It starts, then goes on from there uh, to all kinds of enhanced procedures, safeguards, approvals, double checks, triple checks, record keeping requirement, accountability policies, funding of new functions like an office of internal audit that didn't exist before, the installation of an entirely new leadership team uh, from my It'll predecessor, uh, and, and where I can take action, where we can take action to hold people accountable by removing people from the chain of Gentlemen, command. Gentlemen, ladies, time has expired, people. Director. We will, uh, we, we're going to take a 30-minute um, break for votes. We will, we will be back. We'll, I'm going to try to start right at 2.15. Unanimous we'll, consent to, to introduce without the to the record. Without objection, we'll, so be entered. Uh, we'll start with Ms. Bush and then Mr. Bishop on our side when we return. Uh, we'll stand in recess for approximately 30 minutes.
I took it out of time. I should have, I should have bought you lunch. This is the first time in five years that I've done that. I've been on Twitter for four years. And this is the first time I've actually tweeted any news of my Because I don't want to get hooked on it again, you know? Because it's a fucking addiction. Are you joking that you took it out of context? No, no, no. I don't, I don't remember that being. He, did, he said somewhat insane. <laughs> so every time I hear the thing, I just hear him uh, reacting to his <laughs>
just a matter of it's annoying because there's no ass if the whole thing was set. I mean, I always I think the ass was the functionality. Like now you have like more room to do do your own. Well, you can. The best thing to do is download uh, the Chrome. The Chrome works better. And then just open Chrome. the thing in your Chrome browser. Mm-hmm. And then it it is set up at least the mobile version is kind of similar to a Pat kind of setup the way you do things so that but position is you have that up and then you save it anytime and then pop it up with your iPad to set up your phone. You don't have to wait for the thing. You just trust me it's gonna log out. You can't log out if you don't have the phone or the desktop. I guess to like save all the time too. Yeah. But that's for you, though. Like some, yeah, I'm thinking stuff. No, well, because I actually did do a whole. That's what Ray was telling me. He's like, like it, he said it was old, like Windows 95. Well, it was years. a Git, like one thing that Git had, like a coffee book kind of thing. It's like the old school shit. And I was like, are you kidding me? You know what I'm saying? Was it trying to be retro or was it trying to design? <laughs> like, I, the fact that it is upgrade that to even make a Git dump in there. Yeah, we're gonna have like some weird chairs. Oh, it's cool. Just Washington capital W. But then it officially is there. Capital W, lowercase a, lowercase s, capital A, exclamation point. Like they gave me a laptop and there's nothing on it. There's no Adobe, no Flash, no. What is it? Does it just go blank? Is it a D or G? It's a D and G. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they no. he adds the stuff. You have to add. He yeah. Well, I had to take it to the back. They gave it to me. It's already a new one. This is. Um, I definitely have like a refurbished this old is, one. Yeah, yeah this somebody is old else. Old um, one. Because mine was lost to me. Bodger's. I had Bodger's one. Oh really? Wow, well, that's pretty cool. Uh, the one they had, the one I had John on was Bodger's old one. Oh. So you have the Bod the the Bodger before that. Well, <laughs> they, they were they were made it seem like that, and then um. Yeah, and he handed it to me just like this. He said, "No accessories, no nothing, just no box." Did or they even put plastic on it? Like mine has the plastic. Too. No, I had no. It, this is literally this is it, and it is. It is new. I mean, yeah, it's fine, but, but they, um, how do you get stuff installed? Do you have to, like, call them, or? Yeah, so when I signed in, it was just blank, and it was, like, I didn't even get Docs or anything. Are you getting that? Yeah, I had that, but it's, it's, I, it, it's, it's nothing oh, useful. So when like, you, it's just, like, honestly, Safari. Honestly, what I can't about your D&D services? Did you go in there? No, I don't even know if that's on there. Well, I, I can't install anything. Oh, so I did, nothing was coming up, so it seemed like it was that, and I was like, oh, yeah. Bash, they have no clue because they're not a geek. You, you know, you can't turn it on too severe to do it. And so they had to reset my whole profile, like everything all over. So they, they kept it for like two days. And you then had to I, give it to them? Like you mm-hmm. put in a ticket for it and leave it on the shelf? I did, yeah, because I was like, nothing's working. So I did put in a ticket. The guy called me and he, I was like, well, I'm here. Do you want to just look at it? couldn't figure it out. He was just like, can we, let's just, we're going to let it go through. We're going to 
crazy. I was like, I don't think so, dude. But have at it. I mean, I've been without a computer for like three weeks now. I don't think I need it. Well, go that night. That's what I said. That me is your oh, yeah, work. Yeah. yeah. So I should. I'm gonna do that. Phone. I'm gonna do it tomorrow. I mean, you can do it on your phone. Yeah, yeah. But like, who did you just? Did you go on like keep scan the QR code yeah. and put the ticket like that? Yeah. It said pay my computer check like when they gave me a new one, and then I had to put in another request. So when you put the ticket in, did you leave the computer there, or did you bring it to them and they like pick you up and drop it? They actually you? called me and I just happened to be in the room when they when that all went off. And then we couldn't figure it out. Three in this kit I had really? that I think I went through. One of them was the Quest Three, but then you could fetch the Steam sources mm-hmm. and like he doesn't have them in the normal. Uh, he doesn't have either Steam sources, does he? No, he has like the regular ones. But they're always good. I think they're like they have like a different dial than like everyone else has them. Like I think there are fewer people that have like the. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like the dial, like some of them are like raised, but this one's like an indent. It turns. I don't know how to explain it. Like Jason the button. Has yeah, well, he, he, he went told out. me that, and I was like, what? I need to look at mine, because I don't want that. He went crazy. He bought those, he bought those ammo. Oh, yeah. Those oh, he did? Yeah, I think he bought two of them for Isn't 200. Isn't that just for free shit? Well, for a tool. Yeah, yeah. I think they're like 250 each, though. He, um, did he get the one by ones or he got the two by ones the rectangle ones? No, he got the, the two by ones. It isn't complicated. Follow the law as articulated by the United States Supreme Court in the area of the First Amendment. Um, and, uh, and that was it, uh, as far as it was concerned. The, the foreign, in, foreign Influence Task Force is not a predecessor's decision. You set that up, right? Yes. Okay. And you, you've known about the continuous interaction with social media companies. Uh, you've known about, I mean, I'm sure you know about the testimony of Elvis, Agent Elvis Chan. Correct? I mean, I, I don't know everything he's testified to, but I'm, I'm aware that he was... Uh, you read his testimony? I've read parts of it, yes. Okay. Um, and, and there were 
thousands of posts that were flagged to the social media companies. These meetings with social media continued uh, across time on a periodic basis. And this court has found, and I understand where the point of disagreement is, I guess, at this stage is, and I, but I believe it's fairly common sense, that if you've got a constant expectant suggestions from the FBI to social media companies with respect to social media posts, at some point in time it becomes a government decision or it becomes coercive in nature. That's what the courts preliminarily found. You all, that apparently is the line you decided to walk in setting this up. I, today it's sort of striking that you come in and you sort of casually acknowledge that among other things that we did pass through, I think you said, information from the Ukrainian SBU to social media, as if it's normal uh, for the FBI to serve effectively as the agent of a foreign power, to help pull information out of circulation to which Americans otherwise would have access because the Foreign Intel Service doesn't like it. Now, those are my characterizations. I have tried to be a little bit more neutral in my language, and you can differ with them, but here's what I'm wondering. <clears throat> Why would you walk that fine a line with respect to Americans' fundamental constitutional rights at scale, especially with knowledge of past abuses by the FBI like COINTELPRO. You said earlier that the FBI wasn't even concerned about disinformation per se, but the foreign origins of the information. Assuming so, how does that comport with Lamont versus Postmaster General? Well, I'm not going to try to engage on uh Supreme Court jurisprudence, but what I can tell you is that the... Well, well I mean, that's, that's the point, though, Director no, Ray. And, I'm, and, I'm, and let me just ask you, do you know about that case? Do you know that case? I've heard of the case. All right. It, it, right in the heart of the Cold War, at, at the behest of an American plaintiff, a communist, by the way, <clears throat> Supreme Court said that Americans have a First Amendment right of access to information, even if it is propaganda originating abroad. And in that case, the United States Postal Service could not interdict it. Do you know that, in essence? Uh, again, I'm not familiar with the, the holding of the case. I'd have to review it to be sure that that's that, a correct That, that seems to me the trouble. I keep wondering, as I read all these revelations, how that could be. That, or, or then, let me go to this. You know uh, that the FBI engaged with the social media companies, continuously warning them of hack and leak, op leak operations in 2020. Not 2018, by the way, but before the 2020 election. Lots of warnings about hack and leak. You're aware of that? I'm aware that we gave them lots of information about intelligence that we were receiving from some of at, our intelligence. At the time partners. you were giving them those warnings, the FBI had had the Hunter Biden laptop for more than nine months. <clears throat> and, uh, but of course, COINTELPRO itself was the mother of all hack and leak, leak operations. Active leftist activists at the time broke into the FBI's headquarters uh, office in Media, Pennsylvania, stole the files, gave them to the media, and newspapers published them. And you're you're bound to be aware of New York Times Company versus the United States, the Pentagon Papers case. Yes. That says that it, even if information has been stolen or or inappropriately taken, that you can't get a prior restraint restraint in almost any circumstance to prevent their being distributed. So how how is it? that your foreign influence task force is out warning of hack and leak operations to innocent, not involved in the hack, that would be criminal, but news organ or social media organizations where information may be circulated. Well, first off, we're not engaging in any prior restraint. Second, second. Wow. Second, well, let me, if I could finish, please. Second, there is no serious dispute that foreign adversaries have and continue to attempt to interfere in our elections and that they use social media to do it. President Trump himself in 2018 declared a national emergency to that very effect. And the Senate Intelligence Committee in a bipartisan, overwhelmingly bipartisan way, by the way, not only found the same thing, but called for more information this, sharing director, between us and the social I, media. Company. I hear you, but it doesn't justify trampling the established First Amendment rights of Americans as the Supreme Court has declared them. Whether or not, frankly, I agree with them or you agree with them. And I just don't, that's what I don't get. You come here and, and, the, and the comments are sort of blasé answers. Accountability is always down the road. We never, never arrives. And I, I'm not trying, I guess I'm joining the gang up. But what I'm concerned about, and I think Americans are concerned about, is they just never see it. I don't know of an answer other than to take an appropriation from you that's very significant or to do something to take your intel powers away and put them in another agency. I honestly want to know. Mr. Chairman. And I think Americans want to know. I yield. I sure do. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland who keeps us on time is recognized. 
<laughs> Until it's my turn, then I'm going to run over to Wait till it gets to this five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen's time is about ready to start. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, I appreciate you coming in today. I saw a characterization of this hearing as um, a GOP FBI grudge match, but I must say that the only grudge that's been seen here is from the Republican side. I think you've done an outstanding job with your testimony today, even when you've been, um, you know, uh, admitting that there are shortcomings by your office, that mistakes have been made. I appreciate the fact that you are willing to do that because it's not easy for um, agency heads to do that. And also, more importantly, to point out the changes that you've made to try and address those concerns. Um, I, I, I want to say this, too. I, there, there's a couple points that have been made here about you were just talking about the Foreign Influence Task Force. Um, and I know there's a lot of talk about this as being some kind of prior restraint or First Amendment violation, but I, I want to say that I'm on the side that thinks this is a very important tool for the FBI and uh, the United States government to have, especially with respect to um, potential intervention or interference, uh, especially by Russian state actors with respect to American uh, elections. There's some people who think, and I'm kind of starting to agree, that one of the reasons uh, some of my colleagues are pushing so hard against this and other aspects of uh, uh, information uh, protection within the United States is because they want to have Russian interference in the 2024 election. Oh, please. I certainly don't. So uh, I, I certainly thank you for continuing your efforts on that front. I did. You know, there was a, an issue that was raised about whistleblowers um, earlier in the in the hearing, and and uh, I, I wanted to, to to bring this up. I know you can't speak to this, uh, Mr. Director, but. Um, these are, these are two checks that were written to uh, some of these witnesses, two of the witnesses that uh, uh, testified here. Um, and they are for over $250,000. Now, they came after they gave their testimony, I think by a few days. But from my perspective, this is something that the American public should know when they evaluate the testimony of these individuals. And hopefully the... I don't know if the majority knew about this but didn't disclose it at the time or what was going on with it, but um, in my book, this really brings the credibility of these witnesses' testimony into question, and I think we should, have, we should keep this in mind when we evaluate the allegations that they've made. I also want to say this, too. Um, my, my, my Republican colleagues have um, come a long ways from the law and order days of the, the Republican Party back when I was a kid. Now we're at defund the FBI. I think one of them selling T-shirts to try and raise money using that slogan. Another colleague is uh, talking about abolish the ATF. Another one wants to fit, say defund the Department of Justice. Um, but as you mentioned in your testimony earlier, um, the FBI is doing a lot of great work protecting the country from terrorism, foreign intelligence threats, international cartels. There's weapons of mass destruction that you, you mentioned in your testimony. I appreciate that. And also, there's been a great deal of talk about the domestic terror threats. Uh, I, you know, for me, the, the uh, uh, planned attempt to kidnap uh, the governor of Michigan and apparently kill her uh, was chilling to the, to, the, to the extreme. And I appreciate the fact that you all were able to intervene on that. I want to say this quickly, too. I'm running short on time. But the misinformation and uh, weaponization claims that have been made by my Republican colleagues, I want to offer these Two articles. One is called um, it's by Aaron Blake of the Washington Post. All the ways Trump, not his foes, sought to weaponize the government. Um, and then another one. This is uh, Philip Bump. Uh, this is on the Missouri v. Biden case, which was quoted extensively at the beginning of the hearing. A deeply ironic reinforcement of right-wing information. The point of this article is that the Missouri v. Biden decision which, and I know you can't comment on it because it's pending litigation, but I also think it's being challenged by the Department of Justice, um, and rightly so, because it's riddled with factual inaccuracies and uh, legal inaccuracies as well. One other article for the record, this is by Lee Littman and Lawrence Tribe. Uh, Restricting the government for speaking to tech will, sp will spread disinformation and harm democracy. I'd like all of those admitted. And then lastly, with respect to the Hunter Biden issue, um, there's a, there's a letter from Abby Lowell, who represents uh, Mr. Biden. Uh, this is to Representative Jason Smith, but I think also to Chairman Jordan uh, as well, um, that raises um, the pushback on the allegations. You know, that points out that, that uh, 
Uh, the investigation began during the Republican Trump administration, was super supervised by two Republican attorneys general, uh, was carried over by a holdover Republican U.S. attorney. Last point I want to make, uh, I promise I won't run over my time much, um, I happen to represent the district where uh, we contain two of the sites where the FBI headquarters could be moved to. Uh, the chairman made a reference to maybe not wanting to fund the move, but I must say, uh, I think I've, I had an office near your building. They've got nets around it to keep parts of the building from falling down and hurting pedestrians. It, the move is important and also would give you a chance to consolidate. Hopefully you'll bring it to Prince George's County. We'll save $1 billion for the taxpayers. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Indiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, uh, FBI's mission is to protect the American people and uphold the U.S. Constitution, correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so we had a couple years ago, it was a hearing, and I actually, looking on all of the concerns that I've seen was really warrantless surveillance and uh, abuses of uh, Section 702 of FISA, I compare your agency to KGB, and spending two years in this committee, reading a lot of reports now, doing a lot of hearings, I am really shocked that your agency is involved not just unlawful surveillance of American citizens, intimidation of American citizens, censorship of American citizens, potential cover-ups of convenient political figures, and potential setups of inconvenient political figures. And a lot of my colleagues ask a lot of questions, but I think when we look at that, and unfortunately we haven't been doing our job authorizing spending, which was not authorized by our committee already for probably for over a decade, we're going to have this serious conversation and including reauthorization of Section 702. But I want to talk about follow-up on some other issues that you mentioned about that my colleagues I was talking about, and you mentioned that you focus on malign foreign actors. So in Durham report, which describes 2020, he states, and this is a quote, steel subsources could have been compromised by the Russians. FBI never gave appropriate consideration to the possibility that the steel reports was Russian disinformation. No vetting happened, you have some falsified FISA court application, you have some very shady, you know, confidential human sources that you kept paying for them, nothing was vetted. Some of your head of counterintelligence division was accused of taking money from Russian oligarchs just recently this year. So you said it all was bad. Now we go to 2022. Your agency is involved with SBU, Security Service of Ukraine, you know, to actually provide information to big tech to censor just use of American people. No wedding seems as happening. You know, this is information. Actually, a lot of this information was pro-Russian against Ukraine and pro-Putin. Your agents just pass it along. It seems like nothing happened. And it's interesting for me that, you know, when I raised some issue, actually, beginning of July, and what's happening in Ukraine, I don't have any confidential human sources. Just use and come summon sense and intelligence that something is wrong happening in Ukraine. It seems like there is a lot of infiltration. I was attacked. Oh, my gosh, how can you question? Well, strangely enough, you know, after me raising this question, in the middle of July, President Zelensky fired his SBU top guy, opens over 600 investigation is potential you know, infiltration by Russians, and then fire a lot of other people for corruption, and anti-corruption prosecutor was suddenly installed. But what is really interesting for me, you know, how could you have these processes, and are you doing actually any investigation to look because it seems to me, as I understand, you still have our agencies working with SBU with, you know, coming from KGB time and FSB time has a lot of potential to have this infiltration. Are you doing any investigations on these issues? Uh, doing investigations on... Yeah, to which? look at that, why we're doing on bad information we're taking from SBU, which actually was infiltrated and given to sense Americans to our big tech companies. Are you looking into that as an agency? Uh, I'm not sure there's an investigation that is directly on point to what you're saying. I mean, certainly the SBU is an agency that we so we're not doing with for a long time. So did yeah. we change the processes now since we know your guys work with SBU, SBU was infiltrated by Russian, and, you know, big tech was censoring American citizens with this unbearing information that actually was provided by Russians. Do you change any processes? 
Oh, it's still happening. You have still the same processes that happen. Is it still happening now? Well, the, the engagement that we had with SBU was during the But I'm talking right now. Yeah. Because in, in recently, some of your agents had actually a you know, joint meeting, and they were bragging how they had top corporations with SBU. Did you change processes? I, I'm, I'm not sure what processes you're talking to about. To information. Yeah. What's happening? Again, during the period at the beginning of the invasion, no, no, I'm when talking right now. Yeah. Do you change, do you vet information that you get from agencies like SBU? I mean, I don't know if we're trying to, are we being like stupid? I understand. Are we being infiltrated by Russians or corrupt? I don't understand why we're not vet information with such a really challenging agency. So are you changing anything of that? I would like to have a briefing or something on this because if you're not looking at that, I have a huge problem with that. I'm happy to try to see if we can arrange to get you a better briefing on the subject. Because this is a serious national security issue. Are you back? The gentlelady yields back the gentleman you, from uh, uh, South Carolina. Oh, you know, I'm sorry. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman. The, the lone uh, ranger on this side. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, we, we appreciate you for a moment and all of my members. Let me just quickly. Um, indicate that I have a document uh, that is a tweet uh, that is um, wanting to submit into the record. Two of the Republican witnesses were gifted 255,000 checks, 255,000 in checks, immediately after they testified before this committee. Um, it seems to be quid pro quo, but the fact of the tweet that I'm submitting from Mr. Kyle Serapin says the fact that Mr. Allen has not yet cast a check um, is uh, not that he did not receive the check. So I uh, submit in the record the tweet from Mr. Serapin who indicated that yeah. uh, two gentlemen, Garrett and Marcus, were receiving a check of... Um, continuing your, continue your attack on whistleblowers uh, without objection. Those are... Those are uh, uh, just a submitted. clarification, Mr. Chairman. And then finally, um, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Department of Homeland Security, Strategic Intelligence Assessment and Data on Domestic Terrorism, dated October 2022, Appendix A, I mean, the document itself, Appendix A, Appendix B, and the categories of domestic violent without, extremism. Without objection. Your kindness is appreciated. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, the gentleman from South Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A few weeks ago, Special Counsel Durham confirmed the FBI had bias against President Trump and took unprecedented steps to go after him during the 2016 presidential presidential election, the Durham report showed, one, the FBI did not have an adequate basis to launch the investigation, two, uh, it didn't verify or examine all of the evidence, and three, the FBI was politically charged against then-candidate Trump. This, of course, was before your time, but here we go again. In August of 22, the FBI raided the personal residence of President Trump. This unprecedented raid was a shocking escalation in what we talk about with the weaponization of, of the federal government against political opponents. You know, our country is almost 250 years old. We've had 46 presidents. This is unprecedented. When we say it's unprecedented, we mean it. This, is, this has never been seen before in our country's history. Just like we saw in the Durham report, the FBI did not follow traditional protocols and this investigation was chock full of abnormality. So I kind of want to go into those a little bit. Director Ray, as you know, the committee recently conducted a transcribed interview with Stephen D'Antuano, uh, the former assistant director in charge of the FBI's Washington field office. He has over 20 years of FBI experience, and he expressed some, some strong concerns with your department's handling of the case, the DOG's, DOJ's handling of the case. The first abnormality deals with the FBI office uh, that they conducted the raid themselves. Director Ray, generally speaking, which FBI office oversees Palm Beach, Florida? The Miami office has, a, has an office in Palm Beach, uh, but to the question you're asking, it's not unusual for uh, a field office that is investigating the case to send the case team down to be involved in conducting a search. And, and President Trump's residence is in Palm Beach, Florida, is that correct? Uh, yes. Director Ray, did the Miami field office conduct the investigation and search at Mar-a-Lago? Uh, the Washington field office conducted the search, although I think there was some assistance by people from the Miami office. But it was pri primarily run out of Washington and not the Miami field office. Which was the case team that had opened the investigation. Did the FBI Based on a referral from the National Archives, which is in D.C. Did the FBI headquarters in Washington instruct the Washington field office to start that investigation and that raid at Mar-a-Lago? Well, the... the Investigation was opened in the field 
by the Washington field office. Right. So it was not it was not Miami. It was Washington. Which is and the Washington field office opened the investigation based on a referral from the National Archives, which is also in D.C. So that makes who, sense. Who made the decision to have the Washington field office execute that search warrant rather than the Miami field office? Uh, that I, I can't speak to the specific individual. As you know, this is an ongoing case uh, and internal deliberations. Well, about I'm not an asking case. about. I'm not asking about the facts of the case. I'm asking about who. Who made the call to go to Washington and use the Washington field office as opposed to Miami? Would that have been you? Well, no, the, the Washington field office opened the investigation because they're the office where the National Archives is, which is what referred the investigation and kicked off the whole investigation. Director, on May 15, 2023, the FBI, your special counsel, uh, or excuse me, not your special counsel, your general counsel sent a letter to Special Counsel Durham in response to his report. In that letter, the FBI wrote, quote, FBI executive management has instructed investigations to be run out of the field and not from headquarters. So despite the location of the search occurring in a territory, in the territory of the FBI's field office, the Washington field office instructed the raid. This is inconsistent with the FBI statement from two months ago. I want to move on to a second. Sir, I'm sorry, it's quick. actually not. I've got, I've got one minute left. No, well, I've got one minute left, Director. Now. Uh, is it normal for a U.S. attorney to be assigned to an investigation, a high-profile investigation? Well, that's a, that's a decision that's made over at the Justice Department as to how they allocate responsibility. But that's normal protocol, is that correct? I mean, there are investigations, uh, prosecutions, and cases that are handled by Maine Justice. There are trial attorneys there. But, uh, but again, I only speak to the FBI's decision-making, not to the Justice Department. And a U.S. attorney was not initially assigned to this investigation, were they? I think that's correct, but again, I would refer you to the Justice Department for any questions about what U.S. attorneys versus Maine Justice. And, the, and the, third, the third abnormality that I find really troubling, probably the most troubling, quite frankly, is the FBI did not first seek consent to search the residents, did they? Well, there is a, a very detailed filing in court that goes through in fairly excruciating detail the process that was uh, followed that led up to the execution of the search. And it goes through in great detail the efforts that were made to secure documents. Um, and I, because this case is now pending and moving forward in federal court, I want to respect that and not engage in more discussion beyond. But here's, other to refer you the to the filing, which lays I, out in great detail, I think, the, the answers to that your I questions. See, Director. That the Durham report laid out very clearly that in cases, just in general, that you cross every T and dot every I, that that was not done here. You didn't run it out of the field office. You didn't have a U.S. attorney assigned to the case. Senior officials did not listen to people on the ground, as the testimony of, of Mr. Dan Tuono talked about. You didn't ask for consent from their attorney. You didn't uh, ask for a consent search, despite the president having cooperated and handed over documents for a long period of time. And re you refused to wait for President Trump's own attorney to get to Mar-a-Lago to, to do this with you. And so what has changed since Durham? You've acknowledged this in 2023, that, that, that things should be run out of the field, that you've made internal process changes, but nothing has really changed since 2016, and that's my big concern. With that, I, I, yield back. I could not disagree more, but we'll just have to disagree on that one. Well, here's what he said. Can you, this is questions from the Democrat lawyer in the depositions to Mr., in the deposition of Mr. D'Antuano. Can you explain to the attendees here why the case was not assigned to, for example, the Miami field office? And Mr. D'Antuano's answer was, I have absolutely no idea. And then they said the investigation was handled differently. And he said, his answer was, it was handled differently than I would have expected to be than any other case is handled. So I think that was the, 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 the member's point, And that's the concern that we have in spite of the letter we got from your general counsel. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas for five minutes, and then we'll go to Wisconsin. A recent poll found that 37% of Americans have a positive view of the FBI. And that's from an NBC poll. I wouldn't exactly call that uh, right media propaganda, and I think I know why. Here's what the American people know and believe about the FBI today, sir. If you are a Trump, you'll be prosecuted. If you are a Biden, you'll be protected. And the American people that I represent are sick and tired of this double standard. It seems like every single hearing that we have in this room, we talk about the two-tiered justice system of Biden DO, uh, Biden's DOJ and the FBI, and as we were talking earlier, here we are again. President Trump endured an unprecedented raid at his home in Mar-a-Lago. President Biden's home, however, was respectfully browsed. 
President Trump is facing up to 400 years in federal prison for allegedly being in possession of classified documents he obtained as the commander in chief of these United States of America. And meanwhile, President Biden is facing no charges for the classified documents he had held at his time as a senator and a vice president, not the president of these United States of America. And last I checked, he had no legal authority to declassify those documents. Assuming President Trump was in possession of said classified documents, would those documents be more secure, surrounded by Secret Service at Mar-a-Lago, or in a box, in a garage, behind your Corvette? You know the answer to that question. Question for you, sir. What can you tell us about the status of the FBI's investigation of President Biden's classified documents found next to his Corvette in Delaware and those found at the Penn Biden Center? Do we have an update on that, sir? What I can tell you is that there is an ongoing special counsel investigation led by Mr. Robert Herr, uh, and we have FBI agents uh, affiliated with it, working on it, working very actively and aggressively with him on that case. Um, I obviously disagree with your description of the two standards. In my view, we, at least under my watch, we have one standard. Okay. Uh, and that is we're going to pursue the facts wherever they lead, no matter who likes it. And I add that last part because especially in sensitive investigations, mm -hmm. almost by definition, somebody's not going to like it. So I, I understand, and that's actually why I live with the sentiment of the American people. I understand that, and, that, that's your so, sentiment. So let me, to, I, I do want to finish this. So, so I want everybody to talk about this dichotomy that we have seen. I, and I, I get your point, sir, but that's just not what we see as the public, as we the people. We see one case being fa fast-tracked and one case being slow-walked. We see one president's home being raided, the other president's home being kindly searched. You have one government agency, the Secret Service, protecting the former president and his home, and another government agency, the FBI, raiding the same home. Now, to me, sir, that's tragically ironic, and we expect more from a functional constitutional republic, and these things shouldn't be happening. Now, it's my opinion that Joe Biden is the most unpopular president we have seen in a century, and that's why he knows the only way to stop President Trump from beating him in November is by putting him in jail. You talked about this, Mr. Fry. In the 247 years of this existence of this great nation, only one president has ever been indicted by the DOJ and has home raided by the FBI. Now, some have said that President Trump's indictment means that no one is above the law. Okay, all right, I would love to see that. But what about Hillary Clinton? And what about Joe Biden? And what about Hunter Biden, who is America's favorite son? And let me tell you something, I got a four-year-old daughter and a two-year-old daughter at my house. Hunter Biden to me is like glitter. He is on everything and you cannot get rid of him. And yet nothing is going to be done about this. We're sick of it. James Comey decided not to prosecute Hillary Clinton despite overwhelming evidence that she committed crimes. And as I recall, it was the position of the FBI to not prosecute because they didn't want to interfere with the presidential election. What do you call this? The Iowa caucuses are in six months. Six months. I think the American public would expect to see this from Cuba and from Venezuela and from Russia and from China, but not here. The people expect us to have blind justice. They expect equal justice under the law. It is not the job of the DOJ or the FBI to prosecute Joe Biden's top political opponent who was leading in every single primary poll, and the Iowa caucuses are in six months. Let the people decide. It's our job to uphold the Constitution. As a West Point grad and military veteran, this is the Constitution I give my life to protect, and I expect us all to uphold it Likewise, thank you so much for being here. Mr. Chairman, may I briefly respond? Sure. Uh, so number one, as to the investigations related to Mrs. Clinton, as you noted, that happened under my predecessor, and I'm not going to speak that. for or defend that decision. I recognize that. Second, uh, as to your descriptions of the investigations uh, related to uh, Hunter Biden, uh, as you know, there is an ongoing investigation being led by the Delaware U.S. Attorney appointed by President Trump, and we are actively working on that investigation with him. 
We third look, we look, and we third. Look, we look forward to seeing the results of this quickly and swiftly. And, and third and finally, uh, to your point about the American people mm -hmm. and their views, uh, I worry less about NBC polls or polls by any other news outlet. Uh, but I will tell you that it, the number of people in Texas applying to work for us since I've been in this job has gone up 93%. And in fact, I'm not going to quote Matt Gates. I, 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 heard, I, heard, I heard his response to this earlier. In fact, <laughs> we have That's great. more applicants, more applicants from the state of Texas annually in the last several years than any other state in the country. And that makes sense because Texas is the greatest state in the country. Then I think that speaks very well of the view of Texans yeah. about the FBI. Director, any oh. agents who served on the Crossfire Hurricane investigation or the Mueller investigation, are any of those agents on Mr. Hur or Mr. Smith's special counsel team? I don't believe so, but I can't, on the top of my head, go through the list of There's a lot of agents involved in the two investigations, and so um, let me check into that and see if there's any way we can get back to on that, because I don't want to get out over my skis. Thank you. Gentleman uh, from uh, Wisconsin is recognized for five minutes. Director Ray, thanks for being here today. Um, on June 21st, the committee heard testimony from Special Counsel John Durham. Uh, have you reviewed uh, his findings, and did you dispute any of those? Uh, I have reviewed them. Uh, it's, a, it's a big multi-hundred page binder of it sitting right to my right on my desk, uh, and I refer to it frequently. Uh, I can't say that I'm aware of anything specific that I would dispute in it. I would, certainly, as you may know, uh, not only did we fully cooperate with him in the investigation, as he noted uh, in his report, but I actually assigned a bunch of agents and FBI personnel to work on it with him to help him. Uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that the reforms that we've put in place in response to the Inspector General's investigation, and also in the Crossfire Hurricane, as well as some other changes that we made working closely with Attorney General Barr, if those reforms had been in place back at the time that all of this stuff that uh, Special Counsel Durham found, I don't think any of this would have happened. So the confirmation bias, which was brought up time and time again when Durham was here before the committee, you, you feel those have been addressed. I think uh, Jason Jones says he put together a letter and that includes a lot of that information. Do you feel it's adequate or? Well, I, I'm ambitious by nature for us as an organization, so we're constantly looking for more things we can do. But I'll give you an example because on this issue of bias because I think it's so important. One of the things that I did as FBI director, and I did this a couple of years ago, um, was in order, and this frankly it was in reaction in many ways more to both the, the Hillary Clinton investigation as well as the Crossfire Hurricane investigation, was that I uh, put in place training for the entire workforce that focused specifically not just on the importance of avoiding bias, but the importance of avoiding even the appearance of bias. And one of the things that I did to make sure that I was sending that message was that rather than like the way it normally happens in a bureaucracy where all the training gets saddled on all the folks on the front lines right out of the gates. I started with the top 200, 300 or so people in the organization, brought them all to Quantico for an entire day stand down. We heard from the federal judiciary, the inspector general, the Hatch Act Office of Special Counsel, and the whole point of it was the importance of not just objectivity, but making sure that we are faithful to the appearance of objectivity as well. And then we had a smaller version of that that went out to the whole workforce. But the idea was to send the message that everybody at the top has to take the, the medicine first. So there's two, there's two other things that were in there. Serious lack of analytical rigor was one of the other things that Durham brought up numerous times. And then I'll just, uh, there was a noticeable departure from how it approached, how the FBI approached matters involving possible attempted foreign election interference plans amid, as you just brought up, at the Clinton campaign. So it, it, the question would be, uh, has, has the FBI protocol surrounding investigations, I, I want to know specifically in the presidential campaigns, what, what's the policy now? We're on the verge of another nationwide election, and I'm wondering, is there anything specific in writing that you could uh, inform the committee of this afternoon? Well, we put in place a whole slew of reforms that helped to try to mitigate against the kind of concerns you're raising. Um, 
whether there's a specific one that I would think is kind of, I don't think there's any one that's a single silver bullet. I know that Attorney General Barr and I put in place certain reforms that dealt with particularly sensitive investigations and approvals that would have to be required before anything like that could happen. I know that was very important to him, and we worked together on that. Um, but we have a whole slew of additional uh, approvals, sign-offs, triple checks, safeguards, uh, et cetera, that go into uh, a lot of these kinds of issues. Uh, when you raise the issue of analytical rigor, obviously that's, I talk about rigor. I bet my folks would tell you they hear the word rigor coming out of my mouth probably every single day. Uh, and that is something that we're always aspiring to get better at. So if you had somebody within the FBI that you found out was involved in trying to manipulate or uh, rig an election, especially at the national level, I mean, how would that be handled by the FBI? How would you handle it as a director? Well, I, you know, obviously it would depend on the specific facts as to exactly what it is the person was doing, but as accepting your premise, you know, that's the kind of thing that would have the person referred to our disciplinary process. To be fired or terminated. And, and the process would play itself out. I mean, I, we have a whole offense code that goes into, you know, uh, what different rules we have and, and different punishments, and there's a whole complicated system that goes into the disciplinary process. Our disciplinary process is, for the most part, I think one of the better ones in federal law enforcement, but there is a process that we have to follow. Has anybody that was involved in that type of action in the past been disciplined for that at the FBI? Well, let me answer that this way. Um, obviously, former employees, you know, the, the important point here is that the, um, all the senior managers in any way involved in the Crossfire Hurricane investigation are all gone from the FBI for a variety of reasons in a variety of ways. Uh, to the extent that there's anybody left, you're talking about a small handful of currently line level employees, all of whom have been referred to this disciplinary process. That process, as you may have heard me uh, say in response to an earlier exchange, uh, as is typical, working with Special Counsel Durham, we had to put that kind of on hold until he could finish his case, because the criminal case had to come first. Um, and that process is now fully underway, but again, you're talking about a few relatively line-level people where we, on the, uh, we erred on the side of inclusion. So anybody who touched it, we sent them to the process, and we'll, we'll see where that plays itself out. But the key point is that all the, the main players, if you will, the senior people, are all, all gone. I put in place an entirely new leadership team. Very good. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Oregon is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Director, for uh, your patience. Um, so, you're very, very good at your job, and um, as, il as illustrated by the last four hours, uh, and uh, I just want to say that you're way better at defending than you are at explaining what you're going to do about the problems that have led to your dismal public uh, profile. And, and I, I wish it was better, but I have, a, I have the most recent uh, poll here from uh, I think it's from Harris. Yes, it is. The, the Harvard Caps Harris poll. 70% of respondents said that they were either very or somewhat concerned about interference by the FBI and other intelligence agencies in elections. 71% agreed that changes post-2016 had not done enough to prevent further interference and that wide-ranging reform still required. Now, uh, I, I also, uh, pretty interesting you know, article in the Enquirer, see, damning Durham report, and I'll just read from you this quote from Mr. Durham. The promulgation of additional rules and regulations to be learned in yet more training sessions would likely prove to be a fruitless exercise. So um, you must have done something more than promulgating additional rules and regulations, because to me, that doesn't do much at all when, it's, when we're going to an issue that probably is uh, cultural. And to, to that end, I just want to share with you some of the things I hear from my sheriffs across my 20 counties. So I have 20 county sheriffs. In fact, one of my brothers used to be one for 15 years. And uh, so I called him, my brother, and I said, hey, uh, what, what was your experience with the FBI? And he said, they're very qualified. But when they appear, you know you have to be aware that part of their job is to enforce Section 1983. And he pointed that out just because there's a constant tension between FBI and local law enforcement, would you agree? And by the way, when you go out and you talk to sheriffs, nobody's gonna say to the director of the FBI, we don't like you. Why would they do such a crazy thing 
They want your help. And by the way, I asked for your help. I'm down in Southern Oregon against all the drug cartels. And to your credit, and your office out of Portland's credit, you did your best to help. You don't have very many people, people there, but you did your best to help. But to, for you to come in here and say, I've never heard from a sheriff that we're doing a bad job. Well, no, you haven't. But now tell me, am I wrong? Am I, am I, over, am I saying that sheriffs would just walk right up to you and say, you know, you're doing a bad job? I mean, how many have said that to you? Well, my experience with sheriffs actually has been that they are um, often very colorful uh, and very blunt in their communications. Um, but you didn't mention. So the, I feel but, that but, they. But, but, but let me forgive me for interrupting. Mm -hmm. uh, but earlier today, you didn't say anything about them being negative. And what I'm trying to get at right. here is, you've done your job today to defend your agency, and good for you. But but it's not what we're here today. I want to go to uh, Durham's uh, page 288 of his report. And this is, this is going to the heart, I think, of what your problem, part of your problem may be. And he's making his observations. He's very careful to, to protect you. Uh, he says, in making observations, we're mindful of the benefit of hindsight. And then he says this, some employee, FBI employees were, who were interviewed by our investigators advised they had significant reservations about aspects of Crossfire Hurricane and tried to convey their misgivings. Others had doubts about the investigation, did not voice their concerns. In some cases, nothing was said because of a sense there had to be more compelling information in possession of those closest to the, and still other and current former employees who maintain they did their best they, to take reasonable investigative steps and acted within your procedure and guideline. Here's what, I, what I'm getting at here is, I don't think people within your organization are comfortable calling out negative things. I don't think they are. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be either. I'd be worried, because I look at what happens to whistleblowers and others, I'd go, oh man, this is not a, not a safe place to be. I'm gonna keep my mouth shut. And I think that is not a good thing for your agency. But you know where it starts? It starts with actually admitting that you got a problem. And I don't think you're very good at that either. I'm going to your testimony, page 13. You might want to look at it. I'm sure you wrote it, so you probably don't have to. But on page 13, last paragraph, you write, to be sure, nobody more deeply shares members' concerns regarding past FBI, and here's the words, compliance violations. Compliance, viol compliance is that all they did? That's, aren't there a whole bunch of better terms? I went to chat GPT to find out. Uh, and uh, I, I found these, these words that might have been better. But I'm really asking you, is that all they did? Is that, didn't, didn't they break a law? Didn't they do something more than fail to comply? Well, I'm asking I, you. It, if, the, if the culture is the issue, doesn't the leader have to at least call out bad acts a little more aggressively? That's my question. Uh, Number one, depending on what the violation is, that may or may not be the right description. Some of the things that have happened in the past are things that I have deplored in the strongest possible terms. Some of the things that have happened in the past, I think are described as compliance violations. So there's no one description that fits everything that has gone wrong at the FBI over the last five or 10 years. Uh, my language in general, uh, tends to be fairly measured. I think that's a fair statement about me. Uh, some people refer to me as low key, but no one should ever mistake my demeanor for what my spine is made out of. And I have made it very clear to our people over and over and over again that I expect them to do their work in the right way with rigor and objectivity. And as to FBI employees' willingness to speak freely and to complain, much like our exchange about sheriffs, I will tell you, uh, your description of our employees doesn't fit with my experience. When I get out to all 56 field offices, one of the things that I do, especially on this last round, my second round, was to meet with employees without their executive management present, just me and them, including people who are retirement eligible. And we have a term, an affectionate slang term for people who are retirement eligible. It's called KMA. You can guess what KMA stands for, and it reflects their ability, because they're retirement eligible, eligible, to be able to speak freely. And they complain to me about all kinds of things, and we have a very lively conversation. So I'm quite confident that my employees feel comfortable talking to me about problems and things that we need to fix. Um, but Excuse my demeanor is Excuse part of what you're reacting yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, forgive me for interrupting, but my time is is over. I, I want to th thank you for your candor, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Van Drew, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Director Ray. Thank you for being here. You know, 
believe it or not, I'm basically just a simple country dentist, but I do know my dentistry. And one thing I know about are abscesses. If you have an abscess, you can have a mild or moderate one and you treat it with antibiotics and warm salt rinses and in a week to 10 days, it'll be better. If you have a severe one, you've got to take a scalpel to that abscess. You've got to cut it open and you've got to let the pus and the blood and the gas drain out. If you don't, that abscess will travel. It'll travel to the patient's brain possibly or to their heart and it definitely can kill them. That's the type of infection that I feel is within the FBI today. It has gotten so deep that we need to get in there with a metaphorical scalpel before it kills our nation. We need real structural change, and this committee is that metaphorical scalpel. A clear sign of the rot is a memo where your agents, and I know you say you feel bad about this too, but nevertheless, and I don't think you like to talk about it, but your agents in a field office attempted to spy on Catholic churches and their congregations and frame them as extremists. This is unbelievable. How do we get there? Who exactly are the Catholics you're gonna go after here, or they were gonna go after? The charitable men of the Knights of Columbus that help their communities, that help charities, that help people in every way they can? Or maybe we met the folks that are fighting for the sanctity of life? Or are you talking about those who hold true to their beliefs rooted in the traditional values and teachings of the Catholic faith. As a Roman Catholic myself, and I believe you are as well, I was deeply, deeply disturbed by this memo. And it's shameful, it was only rescinded after basically it got leaked to the public. That should scare each and every American, from parents at school board meetings to grandmas clutching their rosary beads. The misguided priorities of our intelligent community, intelligence community put every American at risk, and it is wrong. It is un-American, and it undermines two of our most important tenets, freedom of speech and freedom of religion. It's what our nation is built upon. Director Ray, you work for the American people. They pay your salary. They pay all of our salaries. They don't work for us. They work, you work for them. You are supposed to protect them from the bad guys, and now, many feel that they need protection from the FBI. I have a few questions here. Despite multiple requests, why hasn't the FBI produced, produced an unredacted copy of this memo that really outlines this? It isn't public security, it isn't national security, it isn't public safety. This is an internal thing that you all did that was wrong, and we as a committee, this committee, have the right to look at it. When are we gonna get it? Why haven't we gotten it already? Unredacted. We redact information for a variety of reasons that cover various rules that apply to us. So I wanna know why this one. So, so I, I, I don't know about the rules. All I know, I told you, man, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, all right? But you know what I wanna know? I wanna know why we don't know what happened here, that people in their churches had to worry, and it isn't something that's gonna affect national security. So whatever damn rule it is you have, we should change that rule. Because when something like this happens, and it isn't a matter of, a matter of national security, then we should know. So I'd like to know when we're gonna get it. I'd like a date short, certain. What I can tell you is that we are almost done with our internal review, and as I said to the chairman, we're gonna be providing a briefing to the committee on what the internal review found. When? It should be later this summer. And, and why do we need your internal review? For good you're doing an internal review. You should do a lot internally. But why don't we get the information when we ask for it, when we subpoena for it? We clearly are not creating any risk to our nation or national security. You could give us that tomorrow. Why don't we get that part tomorrow? And then you can give us the briefing and the internal review. As I said, we're going to give you a briefing on the internal review, and then we can discuss additional information that may Because you're going to try to shape it differently and make, make it out that it was kind of okay. The, uh, no, the, I, on that, no. I will tell you that I am not going to defend or excuse that memo or that product. I understand you said that. I have simple yes or no. These are real easy questions. Has the FBI created or maintained any list of Roman Catholic churches, yes or no? Any list of Roman Catholic the churches? churches? Correct. We're, we're certainly not targeting any Roman Catholic churches. Well, they that were. They you. were. The field office was no, until we no, found out. But do you, as a yes or no, do you have a list? If, it's, if you don't have a list, it's easy to say no. Well, 
We have 38,000 employees. We engage with churches of all kinds. So you may have them. a list of churches that you're looking at for no. possible No, 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 not for possible investigation. How about Russian Orthodox churches? Same answer. Greek Orthodox churches? Okay. Tell me, <laughs> yes or no? Evangelical churches? Tell me we yes or not, no? We do not maintain Yes or no? Excuse me? Please answer yes or no. It's not a yes or no question. It is a yes or no. If you've got a list of churches that you're targeting and looking at, the answer is yes. If, if you don't, the answer is no. If your question is, do we have a list of churches that we are targeting, then the answer is no. We do not have. How about Jewish list. synagogues? Yes or no? Same question. We do not maintain any kind of list of, of religious institutions that we're targeting because we are not targeting religious institutions. Let me tell you, it's a sorry state of affairs that, either, that these questions are questions I have to ask, and it's a damn shame to see what's become of our once universally respected FBI. We need structural change, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Director, the, the five individuals who, who signed off on that memo, have any of them lost their security clearance? during this, this internal investigation? Uh, I don't believe anybody has lost a security clearance, but again, we have an internal review pending, and that, and that I'll let that finish to it, come to its conclusion. How did you become aware of the Catholic memo that the I gentleman just referenced? How did I become aware of it? Point of order, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman may state his point of order. Uh, whose time is the chairman uh, consuming with uh, I his- I thought for the uh, committee- not a point of order. The chair now recognizes the gentleman for Texas for five minutes. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I, I will say this, Mr. Ray. I, I am one of those sheriffs that will, will be very blunt with you today. That's right here. I, I've had an opportunity to look at your testimony, lots of stuff, and hear about numerous task forces, crimes being committed against children, including even infants and to toddlers. MS-13 gang members coming across the open southern border, the poisoning and killing of the American people with fentanyl, the, the sex trafficking, the human trafficking. It, it's quite clear, it is clear that you guys are dealing with some of the sickest bastards in our society. I have an article here from CNN in January 2022 calling the January 6th investigation the biggest investigation in FBI history. And what shocks me about this, quite honestly, is that you don't mention January 6th. Again, the biggest investigation, not one time in your 14-page testimony. You don't mention it one time. And that makes me ask myself the question, what the hell are you hiding? Sir, you mentioned 38,000 agents and support personnel in your agency. How many FBI agents and support personnel have you assigned to the January 6th investigation? I don't know that I know the number. I know we have a lot of people working okay, on it in multiple lots then. fair enough, lots. Yeah. Knowing that you are dealing with some of the sickest people in our society with investigations related to child sex trafficking, have you reassigned any of these agents or personnel to investigate January 6th, yes or no? I, I don't believe we have reassigned people away from uh, child exploitation okay. to January I, 6th. Now, but now, let me just say this, Director. I, I find that answer knowledge. disturbing because last month, Steve Friend, he testified before the Weaponization Committee. Mr. Friend was a domestic terrorism investigator for you, and he was told by one of his superiors that January 6th was, I quote, a higher priority than pursuing child pornography cases, end quote. And for those of you watching in America, understand today's FBI is more concerned about searching for and arresting grandma and grandpa for entering the Capitol building that day than pursuing the sick individuals in our society who prey on our children. And Mr. Ray, your priorities are flawed. But let's rehash what we know so far. All right, it's the largest investigation in FBI history, and you don't mention it in your testimony. Agents have been reassigned from child exploitation cases and so on. So now let's get into the money, Mr. Ray. How much taxpayer money has been spent on January 6th? I don't know that I have the figure oh, you don't have in my okay, head, fine. but. Mr. Ray, I got an article here, uh, December 22, uh, 2022, two years after the events of January 6th, and it says the Justice Department has requested another $34 million from Congress. And uh, number one, you shouldn't get another dime. The FBI shouldn't get another dime for this political witch hunt against the greatest president in my lifetime, Donald J. Trump. 
I, I want to turn my attention now to this fella, this character, Mr. Ray Epps. We've all heard of him. We've heard of Mr. Ray Epps. He was number 16 on your FBI Most Wanted list. He was encouraging people the night prior and the day of to go into the Capitol. And Mr. Ray Epps can be seen at the first breach of Capitol grounds at approximately 12.50 p.m. Play the clip, please. We need to go into the Capitol. Into the Capitol. Into the Capitol. Hey, what? All right, no, Dave, but one more thing. Yes, yeah, so can we go up there? No? When we go in. Are we going to get arrested if we go up there? Yeah. You don't need to get Just shot. Get Breaching the line, going in at the first breach into the Capitol, into the Capitol grounds, a restricted area. Mr. Ray, you have arrested hundreds of people related to January 6th. And there have been people arrested for breaching Capitol grounds. Cooey Griffin is an example. Rachel Genko is an example. And then we go to Mr. Brandon Strecka. Brandon was arrested for disorderly and disruptive conduct, which included yelling, I quote, go, 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 as rioters tried to empty the Capitol. These three never went into the Capitol. They never assaulted anyone. So let's be honest with each other. There is very little difference between the actions of Ray Epps and Brandon Stricka that day, but yet Stricka was arrested and Epps wasn't. Epps also testified to the January 6th committee. He was back at his hotel when video evidence showed that he wasn't. He lied. He was on the Capitol grounds just as Brandon Strecker was. Epps even texted his nephew at 2.12 p.m. and said, I quote, I was in the front with a few others. It was on the video. I also orchestrated it. Now look into the camera, sir, when you answer my next question. Are you going to arrest Mr. Epps, yes or no? I'm not going to engage here in a discussion about individual people who are okay, or are not going to be prosecuted. Can I get a commitment? You just watched the video. I'm an old law dog. I understand a little bit about probable cause. He did very little. There was very little difference what he did. And Mr. Strecker, you can see him. He's encouraging. I almost think he's inciting a riot. He's encouraging people the night prior to go into the Capitol, the day of, go into the Capitol. And he was at the first breach and he breached the restricted area. Everybody, a lot of people getting arrested for not going into the Capitol, but they're in the restricted area. But yet, Ray Epps, who many people feel, fed, 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 right? And there's a lot of cloud over this. So I, I, my point is this. You arrested a lot of folks for unlawful activity. You just saw the video. And I will tell I you, Mr. Ray, Mr. Uh, if you don't yeah. arrest Mr. Epps, the there's gentleman. a reason behind it. I believe you know what it is. And it appears to me you are protecting this guy. I strongly recommend you get your house back in order. With that, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, if I might briefly. Gentlemen, we respond, then we've got a couple point of orders. Uh, it is not. Your name is consent. Excuse me. Go ahead. It, it has never been appropriate for an FBI director in congressional testimony to be weighing in on who is or isn't going to be arrested and what, who is or isn't going to get charged, which is a prosecutor's decision. If you are suggesting that the violence that at, Cap at the Capitol on January 6th was part of some operation orchestrated by FBI sources or FBI agents, the answer is no, it was not. And to suggest otherwise is a disservice to our hardworking, dedicated law enforcement profession. Can I respond to that now that uh, the, the point is he was number 16 on your list. Yeah, the, the, he was 16 on your list. You never arrested the him. Gentleman like hundreds of Americans were gentleman arrested. Has Shame on you. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida for unanimous consent. Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent for all members have five legislative days to submit any additional materials as well as any questions for the record for the director. And I would hope that those questions for the record we would submit would receive more timely responses than some of our letters have. I would further seek unanimous consent that the text that the WhatsApp message from Hunter Biden I used earlier in the hearing be submitted for the record. Uh, with, without objection, gentleman Mr. from Georgia is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a unanimous consent request that a article uh, from the Daily Mail, Daily Mail. Daily Mail dated uh, today with the headline, January 6th protester 
Ray Epps reveals he's forced to live in an RV in hiding after death threats over FBI con informant conspiracy. Feds confirm he's never worked for them as he slams right-wing theorists using him as a scapegoat. I'd like to offer this into the record. Without objection. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, thank you for your time today. Uh, you said earlier in response to Representative Issa's questions that the job of the FBI is to, one, undertake criminal investigations, and two, protect the U.S. from national security threats. Would you agree with me that in doing those activities, it, the FBI has to do a lot of that in what are effectively confidential um, conditions? Is that correct? Uh, yes. And when you're undertaking those activities in those confiden confidential conditions, you're going you're gonna to require tools that have been appropriated by Congress in the past, tools that say to you, we're going to trust you to use those tools correctly, and in return, the FBI then is expected to not abuse the trust of those tools that are provided to the FBI to undertake its activities. Is that a correct statement as well? Yes, I would agree with that. So trust is a very important thing, both the, the giving of trust when you give those, get those tools and then making sure that you do not abuse those, uh, that, that trust once those tools have been given to you. Were you aware that, uh, according to a recent poll by Harvard Caps, Harris, 70% of respondents in the United States said that they were either very or somewhat concerned about interference by the FBI and other intelligence agencies in the elections? Were you aware of that? I'm not aware of the particular survey or, or poll or study or whatever it is. In that same poll, 71% uh, of Americans, which is certainly a bipartisan group, agreed that internal FBI changes post-2016 had not done enough to prevent further interference in elections and that, quote, wide-ranging reform, reform was still required. And again, you're not aware of those numbers? Uh, no. D does any of that shock you? You know, I don't spend a lot of time as FBI director worrying about polls. What I do look at is whether people want to work with us, whether people want to work for us. Uh, and on both of those metrics, uh, we're actually going up quite significantly. In fact, in your home state of Texas, we've got a 93% increase in the number of Texans applying to work for the FBI well, since I've been in this job. And in even... fact, it's the highest... Texas has more people applying to work for the FBI than any other state in the union. Even if you do not watch polls, certainly you appreciate the fact that you want the trust of the American people. Would you, would you agree with that? Absolutely. All right. Does it bother you that so many Americans do not trust the FBI presently? Well, again, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about polls. I do care about what I, I hear I'm from American the people trust. otherwise. But it bothers me anytime any American has lost trust in the FBI, of course that concerns me. Earlier, you are talking to a Representative Hageman and, and, and you said where we can take action where possible to remove them from the chain of command, and then you, got, you ended your time, you got cut off because we had to get some votes. You were going to say something further on that. Do you have any plans to remove anybody from the chain of command or go through a process to determine who should be removed from the chain of command? Well, we ha I have already removed any number of people from at different stages of my tenure from the chain of command. Uh, I have also referred people to our disciplinary arm, uh, which has resulted in some cases in termination. Do you have, have any plans people, to, to do any more of that? If somebody has violated a rule, absolutely. When we talk about uh, a good faith basis for trust of Americans, both Republicans and Democrats, uh, does it bother you that these illegal FISA qu queries have continued even with efforts of the FBI to try to reduce them, that we now have somewhere between a couple hundred thousand and at least a million of illegal FISA queries? Well, there are two things going on there. One, I think your numbers of, of what are actually illegal are, are off. Uh, but second, and more importantly to me, all of the changes that we have put in place to address compliance failures that I consider unacceptable have pointed to the effectiveness of the reforms that we put in place. So that what, I'm talking what, about... What number of illegal FISA queries would you put on the table as, as those that you know of? Well, what, here's what I can tell you. The most recent FISA court opinion found, I think it's a like 98% compliance rate. The most recent uh, DOJ audit found a 99 or 98% compliance rate. Is that acceptable they, to you? Is that 1% or 2%? We, we, uh, we strive, no, we strive for 100%. But, but all of those things, all of those things, all, but it's the, uh, the FISC, the, the FISA court, 
whether it's ODNI, the Office of, of the Director of National Intelligence, whether it's DOJ, whether it's our own Office of Internal Audit, which I created, by the way, all four of those things have shown that the reforms that we've been putting in place have already had dramatic positive impact. Am I satisfied with that? No. Has anybody been fired or removed as a result of their inappropriate use of FISA? Well, the last time somebody has had truly abusive uh, behavior with respect to FISA, it goes back a ways, but those people have been uh, gone from the organization. Are you making a distinction between truly abusive and just abusive? What's the, what's the distinction? There? Well, the distinction I would draw is between intentional or reckless conduct versus somebody who makes a good faith mistake. To me, a good faith mistake is still a compliance violation and still somebody needs to be counseled and trained and coached and taught to do it right, but that's different from somebody who intentionally or recklessly breaks the rules. Director Ray, uh, I'm gonna go back where I started and that is with trust. Uh, we trust you uh, when we give the FBI tools. We trust that th those tools would not be abused. I think in the last uh, six years, uh, certainly we've seen a number of abuses of the tools given. And I think as a result of that, you're gonna see a cur curtailment of some of the tools that are provided to the FBI. That's not a choice that we're in a position that we wanna make, but we have to make as a result of the abuses of the trust of the American people. Thank you for your time today. Gentleman yields back, Director. We, I have just a couple extra questions, but in fairness to the minority, I'll recognize Mr. Johnson, so he'll go for a few questions. I'll have a few, and then, then we appreciate you being here for this length of time, uh, and then we'll be able to adjourn the hearing. But uh, the, the gentleman from George is recognized. Thank you, uh, Director Ray. Uh, you have uh, acquitted yourself admirably today under uh, severe and constant uh, uh, fire. Um, and so your day is about to come to a close uh, with your head still standing, your, your head still held high, and um, your um, um, soul, I'm sure, further empowered to continue doing the right thing uh, on behalf of the American people through your service uh, as director of the FBI, and I thank you for that. Uh, you were asked multiple times about the Missouri versus Biden injunction. This is a preliminary injunction issued on a holiday, July uh, 4th, Independence Day. Um, and it makes various allegations that thus far have been totally unproven, but relied upon as true here uh, by members of this committee. What is your response to the allegations that the FBI has been engaged in censoring uh, social media platforms or anyone else? Well, while I respect the court's decision, I think there are a number of factual findings that we don't agree with. Uh, and certainly the FBI is not engaged, in my view, in censorship uh, or content suppression. My Republican colleagues also seem to think that the FBI is being weaponized against the American people. What is your response to that allegation? And that will be my final question uh, for today to you. The FBI that I see every day, uh, and again, when I see the FBI, nobody gets to see it the way I do. I've been to all 56 of our field offices at least twice I've spoken with partners, law enforcement partners in all 50 states multiple times with federal judges all over the country, with business leaders, community leaders, prosecutors, victims, more importantly, and their families. The FBI that I see every day is working their tails off to protect the American people from a really staggering array of threats. Uh, they are an inspiring, incredibly dedicated group of people. Uh, and the FBI I see uh, is best captured by the Chicago agent who had his arm shot up by an AR-15 chasing a fugitive and retrained himself to shoot left-handed and then requalified for SWAT left-handed by the Atlanta agent who unexpectedly came across uh, a fugitive, a gang fugitive, chased the guy into a car, got caught in the car door. The guy drove off with the, the Atlanta agent stuck in the door. The guy headed out onto the freeway Poor agent, you know, broke his pelvis and Lord knows how many other things, and yet he still managed to apprehend the subject. 
the FBI that I see is captured by the Portland agent who out for a run comes across a mentally ill woman down in the train tracks and climbs down in the train tracks to try to wrestle her out of the, the way of the oncoming train while she's trying to bite him and everything else and gets her to safety. Or the bomb tech who comes across a booby trap, blows up on him, and the next business day he's back at work. That's the FBI that I see. I could give you countless examples. That is the real FBI. Well, I thank you uh, again for your service, and I appreciate the fact that uh, you have allowed your somewhat loquaciousness to emerge uh, during this hearing with that final response. Thank you. Uh, I, I think the gentleman, gentleman yields back. Uh, Director, we appreciate, we appreciate those agents. The whole country does. In fact, I said this in an interview this morning, a TV interview this morning, uh, two of those agents who served for years in the FBI did great work, now work for the Committee on the Republican Staff. And we appreciate the work they did then, the work they're doing now. But they share the same concerns raised by members of the committee. That's why they came to work for us. So I just got a couple other questions. Any of the FBI personnel who did improper, improper queries of the 702 database, have any of those individuals lost their clearance? Um, well, we had, depends on how far back you want to go in time. We've had individuals, if you go back to say like 2018, I think was the last I remember where you had somebody who engaged in intentional conduct and the person uh, for example, is gone. I think there were security clearances revoked for people back in that time period, but I don't know that we've had somebody who's engaged in, um, uh, you know, intentional or reckless conduct uh, more recently than that. We have, as you may know, Mr. Chairman, and we, this actually didn't come up today, uh, but it's important for people to know. Uh, we recently uh, put in place a whole new set of accountability policies specifically focused on 702. Uh, they go through cascading consequences. Yep. Um, and it's, so that's an important It's been piece. reported that donors of a congressional uh, member of Congress uh, have, have, were, were illegally searched. Has that individual lost their clearance? Uh, I'm not sure I'm familiar with the specific example, so. Well, it's been, it's been widely reported that uh, the donor base for a member of Congress uh, has been, been searched, and I just wonder if, if that has, if the person responsible for that has had any consequences like a loss of security clearance. I, I don't know the answer. Okay, is the FBI assisting the Secret Service in the uh, investigation as to how cocaine wound up at the White House? Uh, Yes, I want to be a little bit careful about what I can say here because the Secret Service is leading the investigation, but uh, as is standard in an investigation uh, where white powder is found, uh, the FBI's lab uh, personnel did an evaluation to determine whether or not there was a, you know, sort of biological... Is that the only assistance? We have, that's the only assistance we've done so far. We have offered the full range of our assistance uh, to the Secret Service uh, if they want to use us for that purpose, uh, but beyond that, that purpose I would refer or, you to the Secret Service. Is that th that offer has been denied? Is that what you're saying? I, I no, guess I didn't. I didn't say that. I just okay. we've offered it to the Secret Service, okay. but beyond that, I would refer to them. In October of 2020, when Facebook asked the FBI, "Is the Biden laptop story Russian disinformation?" The FBI's answer was no comment. Who gave that answer? And before you answer, sir, if I might just interject the fact that we agreed that I would have two questions and you would have two questions. I think I said a couple questions. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you've asked a couple. In fact, I don't think, I know I said a couple questions, but I gave you five minutes, but, so. But I'll, I'll. Do you want another question? No, I, okay. I want us to uh, conclude this hearing, and, and I, I and respect your We will be done in two minutes and chair. 10 seconds. Thank you. We, and we appreciate that. And we obviously appreciate the, the uh, director being here. In October 2020, when Facebook asked the FBI, is the Biden laptop story Russian disinformation, the FBI's response was no comment. Do you know who gave that response? I do not. The court knew, and the court said it was Laura Demlo. Do you know who Laura Demlo is? Uh, I do know who Laura Demlo is. And what does she do? Uh, Laura Demlo uh, is an agent in our uh, counterintelligence division, and she currently works with the Foreign Influence Task Force. Doesn't she head the Foreign Influence Task Force? Uh, I think she leads it, yeah. She leads the Foreign Influence Task Force. Did you tell her to give that comment? Did I what, no? Did you instruct anyone when Facebook asked, did you instruct them to give the no comment? 
Uh, I didn't, don't remember giving any instruction along those lines, although I should say I'm not sure whether Laura Demlo was in that role at the time frame that you described, but I... I Again, the right court now, in Louisiana know. said she was and said when Facebook asked her specifically, she said no comment. And this is the Foreign Influence Task Force leader, Foreign Influence Task Force that you created as, as director of the FBI, correct? Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's correct. You created the Foreign Influence I Task Force. I did create the Foreign Influence Task Force. Yeah, you put Force. that together and she, she heads it up. Okay. Um, when did you become, how did you become aware of the Catholic memo? The one in Richmond that we talked about a couple times a day. Um, as I recall, uh, I, in one of my regular morning meetings, uh, I learned that there was this product and that was the same day that I ordered that it uh, be removed. Was that before or was that before or after it was already in the press? That I can't. I, that I can't tell you. My guess is it was probably around the same time, but I don't know. Did you learn about it? Did the people, did the people who who brought it up to you, did they learn about it from the press, or was it some internal communication? I, I can't speak to how they learned about it. Um, I just know that I was told about it by them, and we had a conversation about immediately taking steps that we then did. We appreciate, uh, and we appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, Director, we we appreciate your time today. I know it's been a long day. Um, the um, we already had the unanimous consent from Mr. Gates, so the committee is adjourned.